During personal interactions with our founder, Mr. P. S. Surana, in the early 1990s, Honorable Justice Krishna Iyer would often mention about the need for bright, talented, skilled law graduates to join the bar rather than joining the corporate world. These interactions prompted us to do our bit. To do our bit in developing capacities and capabilities of not only the law schools but also the law students. I have fond memories from 1995 January when we first sponsored and administered a moot court competition which was the Jessup moot court competition at the Department of Legal Studies under the administration of my teacher and guide, Dr. Balu. I will give you some brief highlights about the journey over the last 25 years. We started with two key objectives. One, to develop oral and advocacy skills, written advocacy skills among law students. The second objective was to develop the administrative capabilities of Indian law schools to organize moot court competitions. When we started getting involved in moot courts in 1995, India had not won any of the international moot court competitions. As we started doing more and more moot courts, more and more children got trained and India won the first major international competition which was the Jessup in 1999. Since then, not only the top ranked law schools of India, but also law schools from the tier 1 and tier 2 bands have gone on to win every moot court competition in the world, not once but several times. When we started this journey, there were three major moot court competitions in the world, in, in the country. The Bar Council moot, the Jessup moot, and the Kerala Law Academy moot. Today, we have more than 160 moot court competitions being conducted in India every year. The Bar and the Bench unanimously believe and endorse that Surana and Surana has made substantial progress towards both our objectives. During this journey, we made it a point to rotate organizing moots among various law colleges, law universities in every part of the country. The object was to help law schools develop the administrative capabilities to organize moots. I am delighted that today dozens and dozens of Indian law schools have started organizing their own moots after getting in touch with us. One of the most significant things we did, my lord, is in 2012, we organized India's first All India Moot Conveners Conference in National Law Institute, Bhopal. We brought conveners of moot courts from 20 different law colleges and law universities to develop what is now known as GUMP, Guidelines for Uniform Moot Practices. We brought in most of the global best practices in organizing moot court competitions. This move of formulating GUMP brought about standardization of process for conducting moots and helped quickly grow the number of moots in the last 10 years in India. In 2005, we created the first software to administer moots. And in this software, we included all the best practices in the world in the area of conducting moots. And in 2014-15, we took this software online so that anyone from anywhere in the world can organize a moot 
at the drop of a button following all the steps while also maintaining speed, standardization, transparency and systematic working. One of the most satisfying things which we did in our academic initiatives was in 2012, we conceptualized and launched the world's first trial advocacy MOOC. We wanted to make a contribution to develop cross-examination skills. And I am glad today to report that in the last 10, 11 years, not only three trial advocacy moods of ours, but there are eight more trial advocacy moods by different law schools based on our format and our goals. Simultaneously, we did something, another unique step. We brought out the world's first judgment writing competition. We wanted to encourage the participating students to dispassionately look at both sides of the case and to come up with a judgment which according to their experience and their interpretation would be fair to both parties. A lot more has been accomplished in these 25 years. And I am grateful to the guidance and mentorship which I have received from the esteemed members of the Surana and Surana Moot Advisory Board, which is headed by Sri Fali Nariman. He is a Padma Bhushan Awardee, he is a senior advocate, but I will not highlight that. The love and affection we have got from him, the encouragement we have got from him is worthy of being noted. Today, as we celebrate this milestone of 25 years, we also look at the future with great hope and expectation. While moots have served their purpose, the needs of the society has also evolved. There is a growing realization that India needs to more seriously look at its original form of dispute resolution, which is mediation. Skills of conflict management, skills of conflict resolution have to be developed to serve the needs of our people. And therefore, in the coming years, we are going to concentrate more and more on training in the implementation and use of technology in legal practice and legal education, usage of simple language in drafting laws and in drafting legal submissions. Today we have on stage, and I am very proud of this, we have on stage people who every aspiring law student must try to emulate. Each of them has very unique traits. Of course, the common thread which binds all of them is hard work, humility and scholarship. But there are some traits which stand out in each of them. Honorable Justice Sundaresh, he is a symbol of humility, hard work. He is able to easily grasp very complex laws and complex facts and present them in a very simple manner in his judgment, which is always having a foundation of righteousness of humanity. Our Honorable Senior Advocate and Member of Parliament, Dr. Shri Abhishek Manu Singhvi. The arguments which he puts forward in court <coughs> display his depth of understanding legal concepts, display his ability to articulate the most complex issues in a manner which appeals to everybody. Dr. Rajkumar, 
the young dynamic visionary vice chancellor of the jindal university <laughs> hard work scholarship all that is there but his unique traits are his ability to convert every no <laughs> into a yes his unique ability to attract and retain and lead the most brilliant minds to build an institution of international eminence what he has achieved in 13 years is remarkable <laughs> normally they say respected professor but for dr shrijit i will say learned professor and underline it whenever i have interacted with professor shrijit every second sentence he says will be a quote from some judgment some article some book it is amazing you spend 10 minutes with him and you will be floored he has an elephant time memory and a real child like enthusiasm to learn new things and do new projects he is by general consensus one of the key pillars of this institution our founder mr p s surana also a visionary extremely hard working he is a symbol of social service self sacrifice institution building and humility and i don't say this because he is my respected father he has lived what he has preached and we are very proud of him sir mrs leela surana self sacrifice hard work institution building a behind the scenes one person army <laughs> incidentally it is also her birthday embarrass my mother <laughs> but today i know i am not alone and in this crowd i find confidence and strength so without without the moral support the material support the hundreds of hours of personal involvement by both of them this journey would not have been possible of course this journey would not have been possible without the involvement of so many law faculty members from all over the country so many lawyers from all over the country the behind the scenes extremely hard work of my entire firm all my practice heads i am here able to do these things because they are able to take care of the day to day practice of course this is a welcome address so i will reserve my thanks for the evening and the vote of thanks So, with those few opening remarks, I once again extend a very warm welcome to each one of you, and look forward to a day of great learning, great deliberations, fruitful interactions. Thank you very much. Sri P S Surana, Dr Vinod Surana. डॉक्टर अभिषेक मनु सिंह भी आर यू बिलीव यू वन ऑफ द बेस्ट लीगल ब्राइंस ऑफ द कंट्री यू वाइस चांसलर ऑफ जिंदा लॉ ग्लोबल लॉ स्कूल डॉक्टर राजकुमार उस 
as rightly said by Dr. Vinod Surana. He is one of the best academicians of the country. <laughs> Professor Srijit, who has been held in very high esteem by all his students, including my son, to the extent that he sufficiently warned me when I was addressing a conference along with him, asking me to prepare well so that I would get exposed. <laughs> and then finally, Madam Sarana, the birthday baby, once again my party congratulations to you, Madam. Dr. Singhvi, the Addition of the of the Rajasthan State, Rajasthan State, Senior Advocates, Members of the Faculty, Young Lawyers, Students, very, a very good morning to all of you. To begin with, I was sectioned by congratulations to Mrs. Surana and Surana for successfully conducting 25 years of the work court. Conducting a moot court for 25 years by itself is an indicative of the fact that a lot of hard work determination and will which has been put in over the years. Knowledge is power. Those who possess the knowledge will have to share the power. The effort made by everyone in this process has to be appreciated. Therefore, once again, my appreciation to you, sir. Jindal Local Law School has been performing remarkably well. Under the able leadership of Dr. Rajkumar, I wish that they should, they should, they would carry it forward, bringing in more lawyers. There are three topics for discussion today, which I went through yesterday. All these three topics are of similar importance. A lawyer is called a social engineer. Why is it so? Law and society are intrinsically connected with each other. Law has to change according to the needs of the society and law would in turn facilitate a change in the society. When we speak of society, we have to think of the units attached to it. Art, belief, culture, custom, tradition, language, caste, community, economy, polity. Everything comes within the larger definition of society. As a student of law, the primary object is to understand the functioning of the society. 
In my view, this is the most important aspect. It might look theoretical, but it is not. Let us take the family as a unit. Any institution, we can look at it from the point of view of a conflict or helping each other. Within the family, the state of the husband and wife will be different. Siblings will be different. Of them, brother and sister will be different. I will give an example when an amendment was, uh, has been brought forth under Section 6 of the Intersections Act. Changes did take place. The difference between a daughter and son has been removed now. Now this increased spate of litigation. I am only trying to say from the point of a view of a, an angry lawyer, aspiring lawyer. The change in law brings about litigation. And it in, in turn it brings about change in the society. When a woman thinks that he is on par with a man, starting with, with the primary unit of a family, she starts asserting her right. It may not happen overnight, but it law facilitates. Every unit undergoes change. We know there are two things which are permanent. One is change, another is continuity. Unless we understand the need of the society and the changes that where they occur. Yesterday there is a newspaper report stating that in future about 60 to 70 to 80 percent of the crimes will be cyber crime uh, cyber crimes. Now why does it happen? It's the introduction to technology, education, and change in the value system. Now which means the conventional offenses would go. Now hitherto what is happening, I as, as a judge I am seeing the change. If, if you could see in the 70s, 80s, even in the 90s, the nature of murders that take place, which I don't even call as murders, which again is a fallacy, including the cause along with the overt act be different. It might change from place to place. As a student of law, we need to understand the actual cause behind it. Why does it happen from place to place differently? Why does it happen from state to state, from community to community? There may be cases where women will be involved. What would be the reason? Is it because of a lack of empowerment of women? Is it because you make them to make her to undergo and accept a marriage which she did not she did not voluntarily do so? Is it because of the constraints she is facing? We need to think beyond. We need to think beyond. Why does a murder take place? Could it be called as a murder? What is the court says on that, could it be a homicide, not, am not amounting to murder, despite being culpable? Many questions are raised. How, how do you apply the concept of penology to a to different set of people? Somebody who hails from the village, having a different 
value system with somebody who is born and brought up in a, in a city like uh, in a cosmopolitan place like Delhi. Do you apply the same ratio? Do you apply the, the value system of the judge or, 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 or the, the prosecutor with that person? There are many areas where we can think about it. It is if you if you really expand it to the international arena, the same concept will apply. Today morning, after I finish my work, one of my classmates sent a, a, a video clipping through WhatsApp about a book by name. Changing World Order. I have not read it. Probably some of you are ready. That half an hour clip is an audio clip where the author speaks about his perspective. His name is Ray Dalio. He speaks about his perspective about the old world order which exists as of now and the change that is likely to take place. An interesting thought process. He made an assessment of the world event, the history of the world for the past five years, starting with the Dutch East India Company, followed by East India Company and then how the change has taken place, the impact of economy on the world order and he brings and compares it with the changes that have happened, play, have happened over the years with the economical impact which brought about the change and takes us to the present scenario. Therefore, in his conclusion, that a country which is at the bottom starts moving forward with the efforts of the people who join together, followed by a strong leadership which continues over the years and with an excellent structure for development. To the direction is fine. When that country reaches a stage, when poverty moves out, when the country moves on, it started to exert its power. So it started investing. So it, investment means higher borrowing and higher spending. An interesting fact the author says is that. The richest countries are the largest borrowers. So when economic bubble happens, the people who are in the comfort zone lose their comforts as the government naturally try to strangulate them by imposing restrictions. That causes unrest. Human nature is that a poor a poor man would not ask for more. But when you are used to the comfort. For example, if we don't have an air condition now, we'll make a big issue. 25 years before, we used to do, do, do it uh, with, with, uh, with the uh, uh, natural air conditioners. Whatever you have, then just create some air. That will be luxury. Even if you don't have it, we'll, we'll just take rest in the evening time uh, beneath the tree. Now, when the comforts are more, it creates more restlessness. Now, as a student of law, we need to think out of box. I do not wish to hold you for long, but except a saying that the projection of the legal litiga litigation would obviously would change. As I said, when there is an economic there was an economic boom in the 90s. Then many of the, uh, uh, the senior lawyers and other lawyers who have, uh, uh, would, would, would talk knowledge. The maximum number of cases 
or pertaining to specific performance because there is a real estate boom and then followed by negotiation instrument cases cases because the money transactions are there because business was picking up so when this the, when the society changes it transforms a natural mitigation now today we will find the conventional cases are a very low at low end because we have moved on from the agrarian economy so when when i enter into the profession you would find you will find cases pertaining to easement declaration regard to the pathways boundaries now today the generation has moved out so they have all settled in, in towns and cities the whole over the land has lost its significance so now we are more concerned with the commercial litigation now the other topic is with respect to future of the legal education then technology and access to justice legal education will have to address these issues and one one issue which is bothering me which i should honestly put it before this uh, this august gathering is the mushroom growth of the law colleges certainly it is not helping the institution though though on the other side, the judicial side or when we are dealing with it, i don't want to i don't wish to say anything on that but certainly this is an area of concern the quality quality indeed is being compromised this is despite the fact that the quality of the young lawyers including the students is comparatively very high than what we witnessed earlier now technology and the access to justice access to justice obviously has been recognized repeatedly by the supreme court including including uh, in a letter spoken by roger matthews now te technology in my view has to stay and to play a more proactive role not only in this pandemic but henceforth in my experience i have seen that in some of the uh, cases before the trial courts even witnesses are being examined through video conference which is a good sign apart other than dealing with the pendency of the cases recording of evidence housekeeping and then usage of artificial intelligence obviously then we are going to talk about it we need to have yes uh, we need to be ready for a structural change what is what is lacking is the quality i don't i am for the one who doesn't believe in having uh, uh, this many hierarchies on the reason that the judge at the first instance or second instance might be wrong which means the system is not working well obviously in a good democracy we need to create more civil cases which which is a which is a fair indicator of the confidence in the system i don't wish to say anything more except thanking the organizers for giving this opportunity thank you very much
very good morning to all of you. Uh, we are, of course, on schedule. It's around 10.15 now. And I see that the program will end at 10.45. Abhishek is going to be speaking for 15 minutes. So I'll keep it short. Um, it's a very special moment today for a number of reasons. Uh, rarely ever in the history of India, a corporate law firm uh, has taken this extraordinary responsibility to uh, really develop a culture of mooting and advocacy in India. 25 years is a very long time to mark this milestone, so I am really grateful to uh, Honorable uh, Justice uh, uh, Sundaresh, uh, Dr. Abhishek Manu Singhvi, and of course the Surana and Surana family, uh, for all of them to be present here, not just because of the fact that we are celebrating a particular law firm, but we are actually celebrating what the legal profession can stand for if committed uh, individuals through concerted efforts can actually make a huge difference to the future of legal education and legal profession. Um, I also want to say that uh, I'm deeply grateful uh, to Honorable Mr. Justice Sundaresh, uh, Distinguished Judge of the Supreme Court of India. Uh, we know beautifully summarized him, but uh, his, uh, his simplicity and self-effacing nature has inspired so many of us and we've known him for a very long time. And I think the typical uh, pompous approach of many individuals in power, he is anathema of that and he is so accessible and that makes him a very special judge and I'm really grateful to, for him to, for his presence here. Uh, of course, Dr. Singhvi does not need any introduction here, not only because of his uh, erudition as a judge, as a, as a lawyer, but more importantly, Dr. Singhvi is also an academic. Uh, I've had the privilege to work with him very closely on a number of projects and I can see his uh, uh, deep sense of understanding of law and jurisprudence in all his forms and manifestations, having studied in some of the premier institutions around the world. But more importantly, Dr. Singhvi has always, always stood for strengthening the legal profession uh, in various matters, including more recently, when he stood up for ensuring that the postgraduate law program uh, stands as it is, as a part of the efforts to improve the quality of legal education is another example of what Dr. Singhvi has never hesitated to stand up for improving the quality of legal education. I'm grateful to him. Uh, words can't express my deep sense of gratitude to the uh, senior legal statesman, uh, Mr. P. S. Surana, for founding the law firm and also uh, for, in many ways, inspiring generation of lawyers, including uh, Vinod himself, but also uh, his distinguished uh, wife and the next generation of uh, law students uh, who are going to be immensely benefited by what the Surana and Surana International Tronies have done. All right, since the time is short, I'm going to be uh, more telegraphic in the next seven, eight minutes. Uh, so I would say that um, there are five things that has made a very important impact on the work of what Surana and Surana attorneys have done as we celebrate 25 years of Muti, and I want to emphasize this. Uh, these are first, uh, the, their contribution helped in bridging the gap between the theory and practice of law. As all of us who are part of law schools, uh, we strongly emphasize the theoretical understanding and study of law in our classrooms. But one of the things that uh, Surana and Surana has done through promoting the Muti culture is to bridge this gap between the theory and practice of law. Second, uh, it, uh, you know, something that law firms don't do at all, which is to build organizational capacities within law schools and promoting advocacy in the form of Muti. Uh, you know, law firms are inherently governed on the basis of billable hours and their own approach towards clients and how much revenues get generated and the entire governance model of law firms in India and around the world is based upon a simple approach towards revenue generation. On the other hand, Surana and Surana took a different path. They recognized early on that they need to give it back to the legal profession. They owe it to those new law students who are studying in law schools and created this culture of voting and it has sustained over the last uh, you know, quarter century. The third is that Surana and Surana International Tronbies contributed to the mentoring of students, something that never happened in law schools outside the law school ecosystem. And this I've talked about over 25 years. I remember very vividly when um, uh, almost, I think, uh, 
two decades ago, uh, I had the privilege to be part of Vinod's effort uh, at the uh, ILS College Pune. And at that time, uh, ILS College was in a, uh, we had some very distinguished professors and I remember having this conversation with him and the vision at that time was very clearly that there is something to be said about making an impact in the law schools by giving time of the lawyers who are otherwise uh, used to doing billable work. This has provided enormous opportunities to students of uh, multiple generations now. And once again, congratulations to Surana Surana. The fourth, something very dear to me, which is democratization of legal education. You know, in India, we have a caste system for all kinds of activities. In, in legal education also, there is unfortunately a caste system. When most of the thinking was confined towards national law schools and national law schools only, Surana and Surana went beyond the framework of national law schools and involved other institutions such as ILS College Pune, Symbiosis, uh, KLE College and Lloyd's College and so many other law schools. In fact, if there is one law firm even beyond the legal profession which has contributed to the democratization of legal education by by challenging the status quo of hierarchy of law schools in India, it is Surana and Surana. And once again, I want to congratulate. Uh, and this is important because of the fact that, you know, we have um, 1,600 law schools in India, uh, and there are very bright students who are studying in all of these law schools. And why should those students feel that they are somehow uh, inferiorly situated when it comes to their legal education? The larger system in India, unfortunately, has discriminated and in many ways denied the opportunity to be part of a, a good experiences when it comes to promoting excellence in education. Surana and Surana challenged the status quo and did not confine his uh, and the firm's interaction only to a few select law schools, but actually expanded their entire presence across law schools and students from relatively new and ordinary law schools in different parts of rural and urban India were able to part, become part of the Muti culture. And this is one of the singularly significant contribution that Surana and Surana has done. And the last one is the social responsibility of law firm that what Surana and Surana has done. Now, of course, I have two more things to talk about it, but I want to say that uh, we are obviously in a, a, a in a crisis when it comes to both legal education and legal profession the fact is with 1600 plus law schools in india uh, our honorable judge uh, briefly talked about the mushrooming of law schools there is a clear crisis when it comes to institutionalization of mediocrity in law schools across india we simply don't have the wherewithal the faculty, the research agendas, the infrastructure, and indeed the ability to manage such a large set of law schools, and that process is on. So there is a huge crisis in legal education. But this crisis is not only confined to legal education. I dare say the crisis is even more significant in the legal profession. India is graduating approximately 75,000 to 80,000 lawyers every year, and they are joining the 1.5 million plus lawyers who are out there doing very many things. The Dr. Singhvis of the world are rare exception to the larger mediocrity that is embedded across the legal profession. So the question is, what do we do? Well, I can go on and on about how uh, things are bad and and we can lament about it. But then I was, um, I was reminded of uh, an extraordinary speech by uh, Dan Adelaide, Dr. Martin Luther King in 1963, um, August, when he talked about slavery and discrimination. And that speech went on to become one of the greatest speeches of that of 20th century. And he says, and I quote, let us not wallow in the valley of despair. I say to you today, my friends, so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live on to the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners 
will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but the content of the character, I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day down in Alabama with its vicious racist, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification, one day right down in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted, every hill and mountain shall be made low, the rough places will be made plain, the crooked places will be made straight, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. Now the speech is important because he, was, he didn't plan this speech. Towards the end of the speech, his uh, wife had prompted, tell about the dream Martin, and that's how he said. So I'm going to talk about my dream for the legal education and legal profession. So I have five big ideas I want to quickly share with you. I'm conscious of time, so I will uh, leave in five minutes when we'll have Abhishek to speak uh, for 15 minutes. Uh, first, the future of legal education. I have a dream that the future of legal education is going to have a strong and substantive impact on promoting research knowledge creation and sharing big ideas that can help us address the significant problems of law in our society. I'm not, I'm not, not going to elaborate it. Second, I have a dream that the emphasis in the future will be in law schools on speaking truth to power and law schools will be able to strengthen democratic institutions and create independent thinking so that they can influence society. Third. I have a dream that the law schools of the future in India will not be confined to the narrow proposition of studying law, but will also foster on stronger interdisciplinarity with strong emphasis on liberal arts, humanities, and social sciences. No serious law student can aspire to become an outstanding lawyer or a judge without having strong grounding in sociology, political science, history, anthropology, philosophy, literature, economics, and many other disciplines. Fourth, I have a dream that the law schools of the future will embrace technology, but will not be reluctant to challenge the use of technology, recognizing issues relating to ethics and privacy, which are going to shape the future use of technology in society. I have a dream that the future law schools will emphasize more strongly on experiential learning and also working towards addressing the gap between what the legal profession does and what the law schools do. That's as far as five propositions as far as the future of legal education is concerned. Lastly, I have five ideas for the future of legal profession too. I hope that the mediocrity in legal profession is challenged and we are prepared to talk more about it in a more candid and fearless manner. Second, I hope and I have a dream that senior lawyers, especially in litigation, are ready to take greater responsibility towards improving the quality of the legal profession. Far too many decades have been lost by being myopic and narrow when it comes to their work in the legal profession. This is the time when they ought to take greater responsibility. Third, I have a dream that the role of judges in advancing the cause of legal profession need to be stronger. New reforms and initiatives need to strengthen the justice delivery mechanism and address, access to justice cannot be a distant reality. Technology, <coughs> ethics, and issues like the privacy will form the heart and center of that future and judges need to be trained for it. Fourth, continuing legal education need to become an absolutely critical component for both lawyers and judges and training and capacity building in this regard needs to be broad-based, inclusive, democratic and accessible. And the last, which is the legal profession need to be far more collaborative, collaborative across all aspects. The lawyers need to be working more closely in law schools. The judges need to be working more closely with law professors 
the corporate law firms, the litigating law firms, the in-house counsel, and all others, this fragmentation of legal profession needs to be challenged if we were to address the future of legal profession. As I end, I want to share something that um, is very special for us at Jindal. Um, we now talked about how um, Surana and Surana was influenced by Justice V.R. Krishna here. Um, I have had the privilege of uh, uh, being mentored by Justice Krishnaya for so long as a very young student in law faculty. I see Dr. Vedh Kumari here uh, and um, Dr. Krish Justice Krishnaya had visited law faculty uh, when I was a student in 1994. And since then, I have been, uh, you know, I had the privilege of engaging with him a lot. And believe it or not, uh, and over the years, I've kept in touch with him. I invited him to Harvard where I was a student and he gave a beautiful lecture. And then, uh, Sometime around um, uh, early 2008, when I returned to India to set up the university, um, I met him and I told about the, the plans of setting up Jindal. And uh, then I wrote an email to him. And this is typical Justice Krishna. Now, 2008 it was. Uh, he was already 95 plus, and he was he had his office to check emails. So I sent an email at around um, two o'clock in the afternoon, asking for a message from Justice Vyar Krishna which will be published in a brochure of the non-existent law school and the non-existent university. March 2008, we were acquiring land in uh, Sodipa. Nothing was there. Just, we were acquiring land. And I sent this email to him. And uh, within half an hour, I got a call from him. Rajkumar, did you see my email? So I said, well, I just sent it, so then I'm doing other things. I haven't, uh, I'm pretty fast in checking and responding. So I was, I didn't, uh, so I, went and checked the email. And this is the message that he wrote in March 2008 when we were acquiring land. No buildings, no faculty, no students, no staff. And I want to read this message. This is Justice V.R. Krishnaya writing in March 2008. The OP Jindal Global University and the Jindal Global Law School are an institutional twin of terrestrial glory, sky high and sea deep in jurisdiction and jurisprudence. A cosmic wonder of learning and wisdom in every dimension and an expanding universe of erudition embracing in its rich plurality the art of living and the science of being. Entire humanity is its comprehensive constituency, search for truth in its limitless infinity and exalted excellence are its supreme ambition. May this tryst with divine noises be fulfilled in the sublime century of ever escalating achievements. Law and life will reach their finest art when this great goal gains profound locomotion through this unique university, unquote, Honorable Mr. Justice Krishnaya, former President of India. Thank you very much. Honorable Justice Sundaresh, before whom I had the pleasure of appearing much before he came to the Supreme Court. But when I came back to Delhi after appearing in Chennai, he was already a marked man for elevation in the talk amongst the bar. Professor Rajkumar, and I was just telling Justice Sundaresh, although it should not be said in public, uh, the real worry should be if, and I hope it's when, or if rather than when, Professor Rajkumar decides to seek other pastures elsewhere. <laughs> because he's the most dynamic dynamo I have seen in law in general, not only in academic law, but generally. And I think people should be a worried, pe worried set of people if he decides to move on. Um, the three Suranas on the dais for a sterling achievement, a very special occasion with two birthdays. Of course, 25th institutional birthday is very important. But the birthday of Mrs. Surana and the two are twinned and intertwined. <laughs> One is not possible without the other. And I think all the three Suranas have put in their blood, sweat and tears endlessly. And they deserve very, very special congratulations. Because after all, to be able to make a claim on the invitation card as the world's longest moot court, pro largest moot court program is an amazing fact. And uh, it has been, of course, a great journey for them of training impressionable young minds in diverse facets 
of the art of advocacy. Professor Srijit, honorable vice chancellors in the audience, learned senior advocates, ladies and gentlemen, but above all, the students here, <coughs> particularly because I was asked to address on what has been the forte of the Surana Foundation, mooting, which I prefer to call the art of advocacy. And to hone your skills in the art of advocacy, the best and the most important vehicle which the Suranas have honed to perfection is mooting. In our times, these opportunities were very limited. Exposure, a competitive platform, these were very, very much more limited. And the mooting process has not only evolved tremendously from our times, but is also a very interesting reflection of what people take as interchangeable terms. A good lawyer and a good advocate, whereas the two are actually different. To be one is not necessarily to be the other. To be a good advocate is not necessarily to be a good lawyer and vice versa. Historically, two plus one, three examples come to mind. All three great, all-time greats, but they illustrate and vivify the point I'm making. Settlewar Jr., or for that matter his father, Sir Chivanla, both great lawyers, they would be perfect in the precision and the diligence and the depth of each point, but not necessarily very great advocates. The second Settlewar's junior, C.K. Daftri was the exact opposite. Not necessarily a great lawyer in terms of erudition and wisdom, but a remarkable advocate. Maximum output with minimum work was his credo. <laughs> he is the one, the two very, I mean, these are all, must be known to many of you, these are all famous. He is the one who argued before the Sayyidatullah on a gambling act matter. Was asked by Mr. Zayatullah, but Mr. Set, uh, Mr. Daftari, what do you exactly mean by gambling? There is no proper definition in this act. Without a wink, he said, well, it's, it's very difficult, but it's uh, possibly either like the elephant whom you cannot see but you recognize and feel. But more appropriately, my lords, it is perhaps what we do on Mondays and Fridays. Those days only Mondays and Fridays are miscellaneous matters. <laughs> Before your lordship benches. <laughs> He's also the person who said, are you in the liquor matter? My lords, what is a republic without a pub? It's only a relic. <laughs> That's advocacy for you. A remarkable amalgamation of the Settlewad and the Daftari was Nani Palkiwana. One of the rare amalgams, very deep knowledge of law, but remarkable advocacy. How he fashioned the basic structure doctrine, not the doctrine itself, but how he explained it, how he argued it. I had not joined the profession then, so I was bereft of the pleasure of being in court. So there are things written about how he developed the questions he faced from 13 judges. And the simplest, simplest examples with which he made the most enviable doctrine of the world, where, which is the pride of India and the envy of many countries and innumerable countries across the world have copied it, the basic structure doctrine. So friends, what is this art of advocacy? Of course, the assumption is that many of the students at the back of this hall intend to be advocates. That itself may not be a correct assumption, but it is the assumption on which mooting programs are based. It is also a very optimistic and a nice assumption. But before I tell you the jibes which lawyers have to face, and nevertheless, all of you are still interested in becoming lawyers and advocates. I must tell you the three major changes which have happened, all for the betterment of the profession since I joined, and possibly since Justice Sundaresh joined. We are not that many years apart, I think. The first is that from being a refuge of last resort, law has become an option of first choice. It was common in our times to try our luck at the civil service exams, 
and then possibly in a few other jobs and when you either were or perceived to be unsuccessful in all of them, you would go to law. <laughs> Refuge of last resort is an option of first choice now. That's no small achievement. The second, and these are all relevant for mooting, the second great change is that people unconnected with law are now entering in very, very large numbers this profession, especially advocacy. Not only is some of the top doctors' children today lawyers, at the very top, some who were even pushed relentlessly by their parents to go into medicine but chose law. I won't take names. But I will tell you an anecdote of about three years ago when a top industrialist in this country came with his son to my house and said, Bhai, iske dimag mein kuch akal daliye. Ye industry chhodkar law karna chahta. <laughs> Again, I will not take names. He brought his son along. The son talked to me. And I told him, your father is wrong. You are right. <laughs> and I told his father that he will spend his entire rat race, his life in the rat race. Please allow him to pursue his dreams now. And today he is studying at top US universities and he is studying law. His father is wondering what he will do in his big industry. The third, very important, is that when we entered, there were very few ladies in the profession. And even fewer doing well. There is an explosion today. And except the very, very top, take some time to gravitate there. Leaving aside that one slot, ladies are everywhere and doing remarkably well. Any lady who has hesitation about the profession in any form should dispel any doubts because they are doing superbly well at every level, in every form, in every varied methodology of practice. So these are three very, very creditable achievements for the profession, which attract young minds today. Of course, as I said, the very fact that you are wanting to do this must be a reflection of the improvement in the profession. Because in our times, and even today there are so many jibes, for example, the fact that Lawyers are those who must learn to get on, then get honor, and then get honest in that sequence. <laughs> or that they are the only breed or species in the world who draft 10,000 word documents and call them a brief. <laughs> and so on and so forth. I have a whole honorary list of such chives, but it is heartening to know that doctors, children, industrialists, children still want to come into this profession. It can't be that dishonorable. So let me turn to this phrase, art of advocacy. Advocacy, loosely defined, is the ability to communicate by speech. Something which sounds very simple, but it encompasses a lot of other elements. So the uh, art of advocacy, as I said, at one level is the simple ability, supposedly, to communicate by speech. And of course, it therefore encompasses a lot of other elements. It involves putting across a point in a pithy, a succinct, a relevant, neat, and in a generally overall pleasing manner. As the French philosopher Montesquieu said, and I quote, every man may speak truly, but to speak methodically, prudently, and fully is a talent which few can have. And that is the heart of the art of, art of advocacy. Which brings us to the second set of elements, which have to do with time and language. Two concepts of time and language. As far as time is concerned, the fact that brevity is the soul of wit is unfortunately remembered only outside the courtroom. And I'm sure one voter who would strongly wave his hands has just left the room. Justice Sundaresh. You know, I never hesitate and fail to uh, quote that famous sentence of Dr. Johnson to Boswell. He wrote a letter started by saying, Dear Boswell, I'm extremely sorry to have to write a long letter to you because I do not have the time to write a short one. <laughs> Behind that simple statement hides a basic truth. It is much more difficult to be brief because it requires you to be precise. It requires you to have your thought process arranged. 
and it requires you to deliver in an organized fashion. It is much easier to filibuster, ramble and go on. And that is the meaning behind Dr. Johnson's letter. This is something which again is at the heart of advocacy of those students who wish to practice it. Of course, there is the story of a judge who was made to endlessly hear a counsel who went on and on and the judge did not think it fit to interrupt him. So that at the end when the judge said, if your lordship doesn't mind, I'm just about to finish a little more time, the judge could not contain himself at this sentence. So he said, Mr. Counsel, did you say time? <laughs> you have no danger of encroaching upon time. You have already encroached upon eternity. <laughs> The third element of our advocacy is language. The most important part in that sense is language because that is the vehicle, the tool of trade. And whether you like it or not, for the superior judiciary in this country, English remains the bastion. As they say, the greatest bastion of the English language remaining in this country is the judiciary, and especially the superior judiciary, with some few exceptions in some high courts. So whether you like it or not, you have to work on that. The tool of trade, the vehicle of expre expressing yourself. You cannot be allowed to take too many liberties with the Queen's English. There is a very interesting uh, story about how when the Europeans merged into the European Union and um, it was important to understand one another's language and ultimately the common language was English. So the European Council issued a booklet to try and prevent abuses and distortions of the English language, which some of us in our early days of advocacy should carry with us. There are some risk examples in that booklet of how not to use the English language. But I'll give you the more decent examples. One of them is, in a Budapest zoo, there is a notice which says, do not feed animals semicolon, if you have some suitable food, give it to the guard on duty. <laughs> in a Greek, I, these are all people who don't speak English, so you can forgive them. Greeks speak Greek. So a tailor on a Greek island of Rhodes who could not finish his summer suits in time as ordered by the tourists put up a notice outside because all the tourists are English speaking. He said, quote, in such a rush, we will execute customers in strict rotation. <laughs> so obviously you have to work on language, you have to work on this vehicle. The fourth is quickness of thought, especially when one is on his feet. Because dealing with the interruptions, the queries from the bench falling thick and fast is a very important part of advocacy and you'll be surprised that although you have one, two, three, five cases, judges who have 50, 60, 30, 40 cases still come up with very, very piercing analytical queries. So a certain amount of quickness of thought in dealing with that is important. And that includes and subsumes the ability of a good advocate, which is to imbibe the query, to then assimilate it, then harmonize it promptly, and consistently with the overall framework which he is presenting, so that it does not seem out of sync with that, and then represent it to the judge, simply as an alternative formulation. And all this in about a split second or two. And this includes the vital importance of a rejoinder, which is frequently forgotten by advocates young and old. More cases are won or lost by rejoinders, effective rejoinders or non-effective rejoinders as the case may be, than by the opening. It is of course important to remember that law as in life is fortunately large shades of grey. It is not black and white. If it was black and white, lawyers and indeed judges would be superfluous. It is because it is not capable of a mere binary black and white solution that creative interpretation in grey areas is what lawyers should search for and what lawyers are existing for. The fifth is of course 
your ability to be able to assimilate a very large quantum of irrelevant facts at short notice and then pinpoint the hardly 10 to 15 relevant facts in briefs which could be 1000 2000 pages you'll be surprised how much of relevance is in inverse proportion to the size of the brief you are given and i think that for that it is not anything else except an essential self preservation mechanism to be able to do some speed reading and over time with experience speed reading accompanied by selectivity and selection of the relevant issues and then the two other qualities if they are there it helps a lot one can be worked upon one is largely not acquirable above all of these is that quality which can be worked upon above all all the ones i have said till now as they say there is a substitute for harvard there is no substitute for hard work <laughs> above all law remains 99% perspiration and less than 1% inspiration never make the mistake of thinking otherwise or in vice versa form i think hard work is there the mage and this is something which is acquirable achievable by anyone the other one may not be there are friends of mine at the bar who have what i call iadetic memory iadetic is a word which means photographic so they remember the text on the top of page 591 right side top left side bottom well if you are blessed you are blessed that's a great blessing for a lawyer but i think generally working on memory uh, exercises is a great help to persons who are in advocacy let me now end by coming to something which overrides all this and now of course this whole address is more focused on students but it's something so obvious but needs repetition as somebody said it is sometimes necessary to repeat the obvious because the obvious is the one which is forgotten the most and that is all of these qualities all of this art of advocacy functions within a construct called the legal profession and do we understand the legal profession for that matter the fundamental question to ask and i asked this question when i entered and i was surprised by the answers which i looked into then which is why i brought them into this lecture which i delivered earlier also what is the difference between a profession and a business unless you realize that you are called a member of a profession a medical one or a legal one whereas he is called a businessman unless you realize that difference you won't be able to fit in these qualities of art of advocacy and the best description of the definition of this distinction is found by the great jurisprudence expert the famous harvard professor dean rosco pound who headed the as the dean the law faculty of harvard rosco pound said that there are three distinctions between a business and a profession and each of them is important to set your uh, various traits of art of advocacy one he said there are three ideas involved in a profession which are not intrinsic or essential to a business the first he said is the idea of organization organization means that profession of course it may not be true in a literal sense now but professions are supposed to emerge out of an organized guild a community how 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 true that is is clear that when you think of something as far apart as the inns of court of england they were guilds they were a master with disciples around them that's how the inns arose in the 12th 13th and even earlier centuries the gurukul was not much different they were guilds they're not business this is a teaching of a craft that's the same with medicine it's the same with law in a sense it's the same with architecture and so many more so uh, a community surrounded by common ideas learning at the feet of a master so it's an organized a business is not necessarily an organized community everybody and anybody can be in business it is not limited by boundaries by ideas by ethics by rules the second rasco pound said was learning you cannot be a lawyer without a degree and you cannot be a doctor without a much longer degree 
you can certainly, and this is not to belittle business or other, other forms of activity, by your sheer entrepreneurial skills without any learning, you can be a businessman. So the idea of learning is behind a profession, which a young student should never forget. But he said, Roscoe Pound himself said that above all these two, the third is the most important. And that he said is a spirit of public service. Now this might sound very, very cynical, may sound very, very academic and artificial, but it's true. A spirit of public service is what underlies a profession as opposed to a business or for that matter other activities. A spirit of public service means that all professions, if you look very closely in the historical origins, came about because they were supposed to do a particular kind of service to humanity. And that is why the saying grew that a lawyer or a doctor does not serve to earn. He is paid so that he may serve. Because you would not have dispute resolution in society without lawyers, just like you would not have ailment resolution in society, a sick society without doctors. At the base of these activities, and in other professions also, not only these two, there is an element of public service. Now it is true that, I mean, these are large businesses also now and certain structures within law are very business-like and commercial as it is within medicine. It is not to decry them or diminish or belittle them, but it is to say that the idea at the base should not be forgotten, namely the idea that you are ultimately doing something of a public service to society even though you have been paid for that. And I think it applies more than any subcategory of law to the litigating council, more than any of the other known categories. So friends, these are the three constructs within which you have to learn the art of advocacy. I have spoken at length and I am now in danger of uh, violating my second brevity issue. <laughs> so I will end shortly. Although lawyers don't have to be consistent and are not barred by a stopper <laughs> about <laughs> preaching what they practice. But let me end by saying that there is also a quality which young minds should cultivate in the profession of law. And that was put very well by the famous writer Sir Walter Scott, who said, quote, a lawyer without history or literature is a mere mechanic. A mere working mason, if he possesses some knowledge of these two and others, he may venture to call himself an architect. So let us try and encroach on another profession, that of architecture, within our legal profession. Thank you very much. What we plan to do this morning or yes, afternoon already, is this afternoon is to just go over a few ideas after you know my briefs introduction to the panel or to the thematic area and we'll go over some sort of conversations discussions pertaining to this uh, thematic session technology and access to justice we'll keep our comments brief to about three to five minutes so that we leave some time at the end for uh, q a so before i start with the first question I'll, let me if i may introduce the, the audience and the panelists to the, the to this thematic session. So the as the theme of the panel is information technology and access to justice, I tend to believe that there has been a major change and sometimes we do say that this major change has happened and fastened because of the unfortunate COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but uh, has got also ensured that we act upon certain changes quickly. So in the quest of, for justice, information technology and different technical tools have created an alternative imagination to the age-old methods, the methods that we follow in the quest of justice. It has the potential of reaffirming the rule of law in the Indian democracy. 
prima facie, when we think of technology, we think of technology as a viable option for the citizens. And what are the advantages that we have? Well, it has got certain specific attributes, like speed, of course. The potential for technology to replace human agency and intervention is not just limited to geographical boundaries. So, you know, people may very well connect from being at different places. <coughs> the cheaper transaction costs. Now, the question is, with all those attributes, how technology would help us in the quest for access to justice? And of course, there are multiple challenges we know we can think of. You know, there have been times when we have talked about the digital divide, we have talked about the gaps, we have talked about access, we have talked about the, the pitfalls, we have talked about the weaker sections of society and access to justice, we have talked about the division between rural and, and urban India, um, we have talked about you know, learning technology from an early age, um, and so on and so forth. Yet, there are many aspects that we need to discuss today. And it relates to the use of new technology, it relates to the use of new technology and the challenges that, that, there are, uh, that there exist with the use of new technology. We also need to look at how the, the new technology would evolve and how the systems that we are having in the country at this time should also evolve with them. So with that brief introduction to uh, this session, let me first start with the question that we all have is that how technology per se would help us in bridging multiple gaps? Now that's a very, very general question, but it has been there for a while now. I mean, if we think of say, right from 2005 onwards to, it's been like 15, 16 years, number of projects, e-courts and other things. That's not something that sort of relate to uh, COVID-19 pandemic. We tend to believe that, but it's not that, right? It probably has a fast in the pace of changes that happen, that's happening in India right now. So my question is that, uh, what kind of changes technology actually have brought about in the recent years? And how the experiences have been of different stakeholders, be it um, judiciary, be it other citizens, be it other uh, stakeholders, including court practices, and so on and so forth. So what are the changes that the panelists have observed? Of course, you can bring on your expertise uh, from the kind of work that you do, um, and and how it has sort of helped us in many manner and many, in different ways. So if I may start with, uh, I go from left to right, uh, sorry, right to left, or maybe it's left to right, Maybe I'll start with Navneet, and that's easier than I, you know, um, move. So start with Navneet, and then move to uh, uh, Krishna Men and and the 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 so uh, I think uh, for the question that you just asked, I think a lot of, a lot of us, uh, be it practitioners, uh, professors, and also law students, I think uh, technology always has been a great enabler. And uh, like you very rightly said that, uh, of course, uh, the pandemic actually fast-tracked us in many ways into believing that uh, you know, this is the future. But the reality is that uh, a lot of us, and I, I uh, work for a law firm, so uh, I come, I'll give you that perspective. So uh, for a lot of things, uh, we actually have been involving technology in our work for quite some time. Just that uh, now uh, a lot of people who uh, maybe were hesitant in some ways uh, have actually realized that this is the future and this is the way forward. So there are no two thoughts about it. Now in terms of, uh, so of course I'm, I'm sure we'll come to that uh, during the course of this session. But one thing I can definitely tell you is uh, there's a lot of, uh, because it, initially there were there was some hesitation in terms of, uh, because I remember I was, I was speaking in a panel and there was uh, a former Supreme Court judge, he actually happened to ask me that, uh, because there was a lot of discussion with respect to how, uh, you know, this whole uh, virtual hearings have created the lives of lawyers, have, have made the lives of lawyers uh, difficult. 
And one of the things he actually asked me was, uh, so the brief you were for law firm and uh, how has your experience been? Because and I, it was kind of odd for me because everyone was kind of uh, highlighting the challenges of this whole virtual hearing. And I, uh, of course, uh, I said that, uh, so I think it's very convenient because, uh, you know, the Mondays and Fridays and, and I practice environment. So, uh, you know, when I used to have these uh, hearings on Mondays and Fridays, even getting into the courtroom, the Supreme Court was a task. And uh, now when any practitioner actually argues a matter, you have the complete attention of the judge. You don't have any distractions. You have, you can actually very well put across the, the arguments that you've always wanted to kind of, you know, convey. So, so I think uh, when it comes to uh, courtroom hearings, I think it's much more convenient. Uh, uh, for and because we're talking about uh, you know dispensation of justice, I would also I also consider uh, teaching uh, you know the whole uh, law schools and law teaching uh, major component of that. And I think uh, so. Of course, there are challenges with respect to uh, internet connectivity and stuff like that. But I think uh, it's also uh, helped uh, you know people. So, for example. A professor in Open Jindal Global University can actually take a class in, say, clinical education or something like that in some uh, not so privileged, uh, you know, law school in Tamil Nadu or somewhere else. And I think I think that actually, uh, and, and so not that it wasn't there ever, but now people have actually kind of realized that you know this is a possibility. It's cost effective, and 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 and, and, and simple things. I mean, I was just telling before this session that you know, uh, in the last two years. Uh, I've never really attended any event in person. It's the first time I've actually stepped out, dressed up, and come for an event, you know. So, so I think, and, 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 and believe you me, I think, I always say this because uh, it actually saves a lot of your time and energy because if I have to actually drive for one and a half hours and then go back wherever I stay, and you know, and I think, you know, that, that's time which you can actually utilize for a lot of productive things. So, so uh, I mean, long story short, I think uh, this is the future. And uh, uh, thankfully, the pandemic has actually fast tracked us into it. Be it in terms of dispensation of justice, teaching, or generally the way we conduct our lives, and uh, this is the way forward. So I'm glad we realized. I'm glad we are having this conversation because it's only going to get better. The only challenge, of course, is accessibility and making it cost effective. And I believe, uh, of course, we'll discuss that again. But uh, be it the Supreme Court, and you know, now they have actually uh, their constitution and authority and stuff like that. So it's only going to improve. And uh, so, yeah, uh, I think that's pretty much. It. Thank you. Thank you, Navneet, uh, for your initial thoughts. And maybe, you know, when we come back, we also need to think how to drop a balance. Because while this is the way forward, how to drop a balance between how much we should rely on technology and how much we should actually be in person. But I'll, let's first hear what uh, uh, Ms. Lakshminan has to say. Please. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gupta. And uh, absolutely privileged to be here before this August audience. Uh, I would answer this particular question in two parts. Uh, firstly, I would focus on th the way technology has impacted the, the judiciary. And uh, the second part is uh, how I, as a consumer of uh, you know, judicial services, has benefited from the use of technology. So clearly, uh, you know, harnessing technology uh, has been, I think, clearly one of the key prerogatives as well as priorities of the judiciary. And we're seeing clearly some benefits. Uh, I think Navneet mentioned it very briefly. Uh, the footfall in the courts have reduced, especially given the fact that there was a pandemic and there were social distancing re related requirements. Uh, this clearly helped. So having video conferencing facilities in courts uh, tremendously helped. But I think the other part of having this technology available was, it, I think there was a disparity also that was noticed in the way courts function. Because some courts were apparently more modern and were, had embraced some level of technology and therefore they were able to quickly transition or seamlessly transition to having these sort of hearings without too many glitches, uh, without there being any problems when it comes to reducing of evidence or examining witnesses. And that has been, I think, a clear positive. From the perspective of, I think, a litigant, clearly, um, wherever, you know, I, I'm an in-house counsel, and one of the things that I'm often challenged by is uh, time, uh, because I, I need to be everywhere at the same time. And having virtual hearings has helped tremendously because, uh, 
you know, as pointed out by Navi, Navi, it, it has reduced travel time, so I can attend virtual hearings from from the comfort of my home office or from the comfort of just my office alone. Uh, give, it gives me a greater level of connectedness to the cases that I am overseeing as an in-house counsel. It helps me understand whether the strategy I've discussed with my outside counsel has been properly implemented in court. A lot of times we're not able to, you know, send our juniors to court to monitor the proceedings that are happening in the court because more and more in-house teams are becoming agile, nimble. Uh, we work with a smaller uh, headcount with, with a limited footprint in the company. We are expected to do a lot more than we used to. So therefore, these virtual hearings have been, to some extent, a boon. Uh, but that said, from I think the judiciary's perspective, I uh, you know I feel one of the biggest challenges clearly has been the way the uh, the requirements itself have been a, a little skewed in terms of the caseload or the workload. Because during the pandemic, one of the clear things that emerged was that there were some areas uh, within the judiciary that experienced a very heavy caseload especially in the criminal cases, uh, where there were uh, requests for additional remand hearings, bail hearings, because clearly the prisons wanted to see whether they, they, they could have people uh, you know, let out on bail. Uh, there were also more hearings, especially on family court-related matters or family law-related issues that seemed to take the center stage as well. And uh, at the same time, from a caseload perspective, I think what reduced was a lot of the commercial activities um, and also, uh, you know, the, the normal mergers and acquisitions and those sort of transactions typically which would come up very often, uh, th those reduce significantly. So there was a skewed workload also that courts observed during this period. I, I think clearly from the judiciary's perspective, uh, just like any large organization that deals with vast loads of data, uh, the judiciary is also confronted and challenged with it. They are looking at ways to effectively manage that vast volumes of data, and we're going to talk about AI in a bit. So th that that's going to be like a great segue actually into that uh, you know second part of the question. Uh, and uh, I, I think the other important uh, aspect also is the fact that um, the, uh, the the courts itself, I think realizing that there is a, a dire need to have uh, a better and a more efficient system has been looking at other technologies, emerging technologies like blockchain. They've been looking at uh, you know s speech related uh, tr translation sort of uh, t tools and technologies. All of this clearly has led to, I think, a huge opportunity for tech companies to start making inroads into the judiciary. Right? Um, I, I, I think one of the most laudable efforts or initiatives of the Supreme Court was, um, you know, approving the e-court, uh, you know, uh, portal or app, which in turn has led to, you know, almost uh, 58 million litigants signing up on it, right? And that's a fantastic number. That speaks volumes of how now justice is now uh, more accessible, affordable, transparent, uh, and, and clearly, it also uh, signifies that you know that the digital divide, which you spoke of very briefly, Dr. Gupta, that is fast diminishing, right? So, so it's very. I think it's um, there are some very interesting trends which are unfolding as a result of technologies, uh, you know, slowly making uh, a, a larger space for itself within the judiciary. Um, I, I think it's fantastic that the Supreme Court has even identified that AI and ML, you know, just, just understanding that it's a force, force multiplier, it can have, uh, you know, it ha there are innumerable possibilities uh, that, that uh, you can explore with it. Uh, setting up a separate committee to just explore uh, what is possible with that technology itself is a, is a very laudable measure on the part of the Supreme Court. So in terms of benefits, and just to summarize my, my response, I think for the judiciary, the, the key uh, benefit from adopting, I would say, uh, a higher level of technology has been, you know, reducing footfalls in courts, uh, ensuring that they are able to uh, expeditiously try and dispose of at least some of the low risk sort of cases. And uh, the other uh, aspect would be, uh, I, I would say, also ensuring that, the, the, you know, cases are being heard despite the fact that there were lockdowns. Right, uh, but on, on that's on the one hand. But I think on the flip side, what what I also hear from some of my outside counsels uh, have been that a lot of judges, especially senior judges, are not very amenable to having 
virtual hearings because they find it, uh, you know, very uh, inhibitive. They find that there are also, also sometimes glitches when there are hearings taking place, internet connectivities, other issues. Sometimes uh, documents which are uploaded electronically are not accessible. So all of these act as inhibiting factors. So to that extent, I think the judiciary also has, uh, I think there's an opportunity for the judiciary to catch up to that extent uh, and have perhaps, you know, uh, more, more sessions to educate, uh, especially judges as, as well as court, court officials. A lot of the paralegals are the ones who are handling documents. They are not very well trained. So when the government or the judiciary is looking at investing in emerging technologies, perhaps that's an area that they also want to focus on, which is training. And uh, in terms of, I think, lawyers and the benefit to lawyers, uh, one of the key benefits clearly is the reduced travel time. They're able to provide qualitative advice to their counsels. A lot of the routine matters which typically they need to seek adjournments, they don't need to go to court. They just need to sit in the comfort of their offices and take it. So I think those have been some of the key benefits. And for a consumer of these services, I would say that you know it has given me a greater level of visibility to the litigation matters that I'm overseeing. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Helen. Uh, you, you, you did reflect uh, upon uh, many benefits, you know. While you were speaking, you were thinking in my head that what is it that we're trying to replace? Are we trying to replace anything using technology, right? Existing. We may come back to this point you know, later on. Uh, you said about the, the connectivity problem, right? You said about that uh, maybe things have not been uploaded. So are we thinking of questions like, like tech companies, right? Are we thinking of standardization? What forms of standardization? Uh, what are the, uh, the difficult parts um, you know, that we probably have faced in the last two years, other than just in the problems of loading and you know, uh, microphone not working and so on and so forth, right? So what forms of standardization required in the long run to make things even much better. Maybe you can come back, you know, to this question and you want to reflect upon it. Thank you. But thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Luther, thank you. <coughs> Technology makes access to justice easy. But I want to add four colors. Four colors in the landscape. First color, the golden age of cybercrime has already begun. With the coming of COVID-19. Number two, Indians specifically and globally, people are undergoing a new revolution. I call it the great vomiting revolution. People are vomiting information about their personal, professional, social life on the internet without thinking about the ramifications. So all that has effectively resulted is a huge growth of electronic use. They are all become data entities. They're generating data on a 24 by 7 basis. So this data gets to be used against you in court proceedings by state non-state actors. How do you deal with that data in the during COVID and post-COVID times? How do you now deal with the challenges of Arjun Pandit Rao Khurka versus Kalash Gurantia of July 21? Where uh, they have clearly laid down the law as far as the Supreme Court is concerned on electronic evidence, but not a lot of gaps remain. With the result, Go to litigation today. Try proving this printout as electronic evidence or computer output in the code of law. It's going to take you months, if not years. So we are at a juncture where the system will have to be turbo sped so that there's enough speed. Uh, we, of course, need to simplify the electronic evidence issues. But then that's a huge problem, which is directly central to this debate of technology and justice. That's one. Number two, we were good with virtual hearings. We are all been doing fantastic. Let's go beyond in there. China hangs up a good internet court. They have started using artificial intelligence algorithms for deciding matters. Let's go to Estonia. Estonia already has an artificial intelligence algorithm as a judge. All commercial matters up to ten thousand dollars get to be heard by that artificial intelligence algorithm and not a human judge. You're not happy with the judgment, you go and appeal to a human judge. But clearly they're beginning to see this is going to help them in reducing their pregnancies. So artificial intelligence is the next big buzzword. 
But if you expect a magic wand from artificial intelligence, that's not going to happen. The bias of artificial intelligence is now beginning to start getting emerged because your bias as an algorithm is dependent on the big data sets that are going to be fed. In. And if your big data sets are biased, no wonder your vision, your judgment, your decision as an AI algorithm will stand in that. Further, judiciary, judicial officers need to stand for ethical principles. Does AI know anything about ethics? Much that 150 organizations across the world have come up with ethical principles and standards for AI. The important issue is how do we actually inculcate those ethical principles within AI in the context of dispensation of justice? That's the second big color of the landscape that I see. Third, blockchain has emerged, is matured, but blockchain is not bitcoins. Blockchain is not an ecosystem of cryptos. It's much beyond. Judiciaries and agencies can extensively use blockchain for storing huge and humongous volumes of digital networks. That's only begun. Let's take the case of what's happening in Andhra Pradesh. Andhra Pradesh has now started using blockchain for saving or for retaining the land records on a blockchain ledger. Fantastic. It works wonderfully well. Fourth color. I see new doors opening. And give yourself a couple of weeks, months, or years. I'm expecting that a court is likely to open up its presence on the metaverse. Metaverse is no longer just a, as a fuzzy word; it's a huge ground reality. And two, two days before we did the international conference on metaverse and law, and I, I can tell you, even everybody is putting in so many mega bucks on the metaverse. Judicial and access to justice cannot be left behind. So somewhere down the line, as we go forward, I would expect metaverse courts to start dispensing justice to metaverse legal entities to digital archives. It may look very futuristic. It may think it may never happen. Look at the statement of the UK minister yesterday. He says, well, technology would be fully integrated into the US and the UK justice system by 2040. He's already given you an 18-year window frame. Without even realizing in 18 years, technology goes from where to where. So I think the time to act is now. There are immense pressures. Let's not just uh, you know, laud ourselves on our achievements. We've done great. But they are, these are just the tipping, word, tipping edge of the iceberg. I think a lot of work needs to be done. We need to understand the disruptive power of technology and its huge challenges that it will have in terms of uh, dispensation of justice, in terms of access of justice. It will be interesting to see how the judiciary how the courts and how the stakeholders in the access to justice ecosystem are able to adopt these. Because whether we like it or not, people are moving ahead, technology is moving ahead. So the quicker we start inculcating these elements as part of our holistic approach on access to justice, I think we are going to do fantastically well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dougal. A couple of points that um, sort of struck me from the opening remarks. Number one, and maybe we want to talk about that later, the Information Technology Act, right? We talk about electronic evidence, talk about cyber crimes. India was, you know, at least starting 2000 and even slightly before that, we started talking about uh, potential cyber crimes, which is, of course, there was not so much advancement in technology at that time, right? There was not so much e commerce or transaction of data, the volumes of data that you talked about, or to transfer from one part of the world to another. But have we in some way failed you know, in implementing and understanding and extending uh, the good framework that we thought that we might have through Information Technology Act? So that's something that we may want to reflect upon a later point. You said about disruption. I tend to believe that uh, technology also has a size of positive disruption. It replaces um, multiple things that we probably couldn't think of earlier. So for instance, uh, many may not have uh, a laptop or, a bit, or access to a desktop computer, but many uh, would have, and even when I say many, I must say that there is a caveat that many would not have access to such uh, information and devices. So the point is that while 
India or many did not have desktops or laptops, but what we saw in the last two and a half years or so, many had access to a smartphone. Um, we also saw that smartphones have become a lot cheaper. We also see that they have the potential or they have the potential to replace kind of you know computer uh, in true sense. They have become computer. I do not know, do not want to get into the definition of a computer under Information Technology, Technology Act. I think it's fairly obvious that they, they have replaced uh, the computer in the true sense, or you know the, the computer of 1990s or the computer of 2000. But so there is a positive disruption as we see as well. So replacing desktop computer with a, with a mobile phone, right? And therefore, they, which ensures that the app what uh, Ms. Menon was talking about, right, can be downloaded and be used, right? Uh, we talked about metaverse, right? We also need that there's something a phone can provide us with that opportunity to actually be connected. We talk about, and something that we must give it to the, the technology giants is the way we have traversed from 2G, 3G to 4G to 5G. Now talk about 6G, of course. Of course, we are yet to have 5G here, but you know, uh, my understanding is that we are we are progressing well ahead. Of, uh, ahead of time. So really the the, the, tech, the interventions that we have seen uh, through different at different times ensure that whatever little we have, right, uh, it's sort of happening for the good. But maybe we can talk about a little about of these you know aspects uh, later on as well. Uh, if I may now request uh, Dr. Sue. Hi, good afternoon everyone. I actually feel honored and a bit overwhelmed by the heavy technological opening remarks by my uh, co-panelists. Uh, I, I would rather use a very, very simple example uh, to touch upon a few points uh, regarding accessibility, regarding costs, and a delicate interplay between profession and business, uh, something which Mr. Singh alluded to in his opening remarks. Uh, a friend of mine who had worked with me in my previous company, Metro Cash and Carry, who was heading government affairs, started with a platform wherein he's uh, developed, and I will not quote him because I don't want to give him free marketing, but they've created a platform which takes legal services to all the consumers. Thus, the point of accessibility, how the technology is being used in they are providing access to consumers at a very, very reasonable cost. And you see, we should not confuse ourselves or limit ourselves only to metros and uh, you know, very, very uh, high level sophisticated judicial services or arbitrations, but simple matters like advice on how to draft a bill, how to you know, probably deal with a family matter issue or uh, you know, succession matter. <clears throat> or just a simple contract. So these things have been made easy. These things have been made accessible to a lot of consumers who probably one did not have access or do not have access to good uh, lawyers or legal systems or firms. But through this platform, uh, because he keeps sharing with me the success, the growth rate and the way at which they are expanding, I think uh, this platform technology is helping people at least uh, bringing legal fraternity because a lot of lawyers during pandemic who did not have access to courts or who did not have means to earn by providing legal services also capitalized on this opportunity by extending their legal services to people who probably had simple matters. Maybe the fees is in the range of 500 to 1000 rupees but that is I think uh, what is needed at the grassroot level still in India. So uh, I think it, technology is playing really a very, very big, important, significant role in so far as uh, creating awareness and bringing consumers of legal services and profession together. So this is one part of it. Why this is also important is because this platform has been provided by a guy who had no background on legal side, who, who's a, you know, just a corporate affairs person who's always done advocate on other sides, not on, uh, not on the legal side, but came up with this brilliant idea and probably he was no tech savvy and introduced this platform. And uh, therefore, I think it's, it's very important uh, for us also to realize that as consumers, uh, because you mentioned that in-house councils are consumers of legal services. 
as consumers i want to make sure that experience is easy experience is enjoyable and uh, of course costs always remain at the center of the core so not only that we as in house councils consume legal services there is lot of interface with government departments uh, today when we talk of dealing with administration whether it is land records whether it is your uh, government uh, you know corporations whether going and getting uh, some other kind of information which is important for our transaction i think mca is the only agency which has done a tremendous job you just have to type in what you want pay a fees and you get a, a information i would love to see similar kind of activism also extending to other administrative bureaucratic departments where access to information not only to legal information but information also becomes easy which will greatly help cause of our uh, you know at least in house councils because uh, we are heavily dependent and reliable on accessing information authentic cogent information from these departments as well so i think these are a couple of uh, points that come to my mind one on how it has made uh, you know uh, legal services accessible and cost effective and what should be the next step forward uh, for uh, extending these electronic platforms to more and more of institutions and departments so that there is a good integration and easy access of information availability of information on various aspects legal norm thank you thank you dr sud i think you know three things that come to mind one is awareness um second would be credible information you said something very very important credible information for a person who may not have the 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 legal background may not have the legal awareness right so credible in, uh, information and also uh to what extent we are able to uh participate right, in a holistic manner all stakeholders participating towards a greater cause i think that's very important as well right it's not about just creating an application it's also about bringing in those legal ex experts the bringing in those uh a tech, uh, the technocrats bringing in those citizens as well under one roof through the application i think that is where i mean i mean i can think of during covid times we have had access to doctors through different applications right uh so we may want to sort of involve as many as stakeholders as possible uh, just to ensure that you know we are all in good hands and of course you know if i may also quote from what uh, uh mr venkat ramani has said of course he couldn't be here he said something very important that i quote access to justice is a common good technology must subserve this common good so it's a very important point and which brings me to the to the second question we talk about uh use of technology how technology has changed us um you know the benefits that we have we can see we can we can perceive but there are several limitations to use of technology as well and one some of them you have already said talk the bill talked about uh cyber crimes uh over excessive uh use of data and so on and so forth so no one knows really what happens to those data um but let us also look at a fundamental aspect of uh, the awareness about digital means and digital tools and overall accessibility and this has this has been talked about time and time again about uh the great digital divide right whether the question the foundation the basic question is if we haven't have been able to give a mobile phone in the hands of those who couldn't afford a desktop computer does it reduce digital divide or does it pose more challenges um so get the other point that uh mr men talked about the the internet connectivity right uh is a concern i was trying to connect my phone to download a document and i i i stay in delhi right and i i must say that with all due respect i was struggling right i do not know what whether it's my handset or is the connection um so whether the effective internet connectivity is a constraint that can hold back the effective implementation of technological developments whether through technology we divide you know uh we can reduce and reconcile and mitigate some of the problems that we have with the digital divide so one hand we are saying that 
technology is the next thing, right? We talk about AI, right? We talk about machine learning, we talk about blockchain, and then we struggle to send the message out. I think where do we stand on that front? So, please. So, uh, thanks for the question. So, uh, so in fact, uh, I thought one thing which just struck me uh, a few months back, there was this uh, video clip on WhatsApp where uh, I think it was one of the high courts, I don't know if you call it Lahabad High Court or whatever, and there were some lawyers maybe trying to create a statement. They were moving around this goals, a uh, banking goals and stuff like that. And uh, I found it, uh, I mean, it sounded very amusing to a lot of people, but I found it very, uh, I mean, embarrassing. So I actually happened to call up a lawyer who practices for Lahabad High Court. And this is a lawyer who actually has been educated at Oxford. And I happened to ask him that what's going on, what are you guys up to? And uh, he says that, uh, you know, because you are, uh, so of course, he had a good laugh and then he says that, uh, you know, uh, because you are a privileged lawyer working in a top tier firm, you didn't uh, understand what it's all about. So I said, uh, why do you say so? And he says that, uh, you know, it's so difficult for a lot of lawyers, like was mentioned by the co-panelists and also you, that uh, even there's a, a cost attached to buying a 40 or 50,000 rupees laptop. And, you know, for, for the lawyers who forget high court, the ones who are actually practicing for the law courts and and even the cost of internet connectivity. So we take it for granted this whatever high speed internet that we have in our houses and you know, uh, uh, you stream things and uh, whatever. So but the point is that uh, the only thing I'm trying to say is that you know, a lot of things that we take for granted and in fact it just struck me that a lot of us who are actually sitting here actually belong to the category of uh, what someone would actually call privileged lawyers. So you know, we have always had access to very high quality infrastructure which is why you know, we are always thinking a step ahead. So uh, it would have been great if we had someone from a trial court or a district court also sitting and you know who actually uh, doesn't use the so-called uh, Zoom or whatever uh, 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 um, MS and you know, uh, uh, the other uh, Cisco stuff and all that that we use and we take it for granted. We've always been doing that. So, so see, uh, my, uh, you're very right that you know, I think uh, now that we have uh, a proposed authority uh, you know, for creating this, uh, for you know all of that, so I think that these things should be addressed. But before I came for this session, I was just trying to look up as to what's going on, and I saw some statistics which basically said that uh, I think 27% uh, of the judges, including the lower court judges, actually have a desktop uh, in their courtrooms. So, so uh, which means that the remaining ones don't really have it. And there was this other data which basically said that I think 10% uh, don't even have uh, access to internet. And of course, we're talking about the remote uh, parts of the country and stuff like that. So, having, and so, so we're talking about, uh, you know, these uh, court premises where they don't even have internet connectivity yet. Clearly, I mean, the numbers are clearly low. But even where you have such uh, access to technology or resources, you know, and like you just mentioned, that uh, it may not be working in the most seamless manner. So I think uh, uh, clearly we have, uh, you know, we've, we've achieved, achieved a lot in the last couple of years. We're really working towards that. But there are a lot of uh, fundamental things which need to be addressed. And that involves a lot of resources, a lot of effort, a lot of education, awareness. Because like you very rightly said, that, you know, uh, we're all resistant to change. And, uh, and, and, and with due respect, I think, you know, if you're trying to educate the judges. So for example, uh, I think a great way to do that is, of course, you, know, you have these judicial academies. And that is where you can have these sessions where you can have someone like maybe Dr. Dugal go and lecture the uh, honorable justices and you know, teaching them about how it is to be done and then why this makes a lot of sense. Because because the idea is that, uh, you know, uh, it has to start from there. And and like I said uh, when I was uh, giving my initial remarks, that uh, a Supreme Court judge once, uh, you know, it was very skeptical about it and he actually asked me, what, what have you got to say? And he was quite surprised, taken aback by the fact that I said, that's a life is so much better and I don't have to. Uh, uh, you know, run to the Supreme Court looking for a parking. Of course, now it's approved to park my car before this whatever <laughs> hearing on Mondays or Fridays. So I would have uh, uh, very much preferred this than that. And you know, pushing my way through the courtroom and being impolite to my colleagues because reaching uh, you know uh, on a Monday or whatever or on a Friday uh, to uh, actually uh, present your arguments itself is a task. So, so having said that, I think uh, we are clearly we have achieved a lot. We have a long way to go. But uh, there are a lot of uh, fundamental things which need to be addressed, and these include resources, access to technology, and most importantly, education. Not just in terms of the courtroom work, but also in terms of education, because uh, you know we've had these uh, challenges for also a lot of law professors. Like you know, so of course, see, Open General University is one university where you have the best faculty members from across the world. But there are law schools where you know, when for the first time when you ask these professors, 
to actually uh, take classes on, uh, you know, say an MS Teams or a Zoom. It was so difficult for them to even share the slides because they didn't know. And, and so, so the idea is that, you know, so you have to have the infrastructure, you have to create this infrastructure, and this is going to be a time taking process. Once we, so like I always say, that, you know, one step at a time. So let's just ensure that we have the fundamentals right. And then, like uh, Dr. Dukha very rightly said, that, you know, we talked about metaverse and a lot of things, we talked about, you know, blockchain. It makes a lot of sense. You know, and AI, for example, of course, there are, there are challenges to AI also because, you know, uh, I think I read somewhere that uh, people who actually uh, uh, use or sort of like, you know, uh, use technology also manipulate many ways. Like, we've had examples in the US where, you know, they've manipulated in certain ways to uh, ensure that uh, certain people of color or, you know, certain, they are actually kind of, uh, uh, you know, discriminated against. So, we've had such challenges also, but having said that, that doesn't mean that you completely do away with that. I mean, it serves a very, very large purpose, very important purpose, and probably makes our lives easier. But then having said that, uh, of course, we can come on to that later, but uh, you cannot completely rely on technology for dispensation of justice, and that's my question. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, sir. I have a very uh, contrasting incident to share as uh, you know, compared to what Namneet mentioned. Uh, while, you know, there's a popular misnotion that uh, those who are working in large tech companies enjoy, uh, you know, high connectivity uh, or uh, the best connectivity in terms of internet. Uh, just a week back, I was in the office and, you know, I was struggling to send a bunch of emails. And it took me two hours to figure out what the problem was. And though I had tech support, we have high internet uh, speed connectivity. Uh, we have some of the best Wi-Fi solutions. Uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise has, uh, you know, a solution called the uh, HP Aruba solution, which basically we where we sell, uh, you know, uh, wireless wireless devices uh, and other connected devices. Uh, and despite having Aruba routers uh, positioned in all in all our offices, I was struggling to send emails. And the irony was that. Uh, I, I thought that my home internet connectivity was bad, but the minute I got back home, all my mails went out immediately. So, uh, you know, internet connectivity is something that I think plays everybody, and uh, you know, the, I, I would say that it's, it's, it's something that uh, no one can escape from. But that said, uh, you know, there are a few points that I wanted to glean on. Firstly, uh, when you speak about the digital divide, I know uh, Dr. Dugan spoke about uh, hacking and cyber crimes, and I wanted to share something, uh, especially on that point. Uh, I had, uh, you know, I had this unique opportunity to work on a case where uh, the the um, the person involved, uh, that, you know, there was there was an employee uh, who was part of a larger function, and the employee came forward and complained that uh, the person was constantly receiving anonymous emails. The emails were very perturbing because it contained information relating to other members of the same team. It had a lot of personal details, and uh, that was, uh, you know, causing a lot of distress to this individual. After a couple of weeks, the entire team started receiving those anonymous mails, right? And we immediately got our internal cyber security team on the job, and they, they sat down to decipher you know, the IP address. They wanted to see where these emails were coming from. And very soon they concluded that this was from some ghost server and that somebody had purchased perhaps some bitcoins and had used that in order to gain access to this ghost server. And uh, you know, uh, that made the uh, entire investigation so complex because they were not able to deduce who was responsible for this, this uh, you know, for the, the mischief or the nuisance that was being caused to a specific people. And uh, the, the messages also started getting more objectionable. So the, the difficulties or the challenges with, I think, cybercrime remains that, you know, there, there is a huge level of anonymity. And uh, even with the best ethical hackers, we have some of the best, uh, you know, internal cybercrime specialists, people who have worked with the Department of Justice, people who have worked with, you know, other uh, investigation, you know, Fed, Fed, Federal Bureau of Investigation. And even those professionals sometimes are constrained when it comes to these, these sort of crimes. Uh, and, and that's the level of sophistication to which these crimes have evolved, right? And uh, I remember even, uh, you know, Justice Sundresh mentioned it in his speech that the future crime, the set of crimes that we are constantly going to be battling with would be the cyber crimes. And I completely agree with it because the, even white collar crimes these days 
uh, you know, are now turning into crimes which are being done, uh, you know, in, in a cyber format. And that makes, I think, uh, be, makes it very, very difficult to sometimes try and trace who's responsible. The other part of the question that you asked, uh, especially about the digital divide, it's not just internet connectivity, right? We spoke about digital literacy, we spoke about digital penetration. Those are, I think, more uh, systemic issues which need addressing. And when you speak especially about things like digital literacy, uh, of course the government has introduced some very laudable measures. You have Digital India, which is a fantastic initiative which has been the focus of the current government. Uh, they've introduced a slew of measures. A lot of the RFPs or the tenders that, are, that were introduced up until 2019 uh, were all towards or targeted towards having public Wi-Fi, you know, uh, rural areas being connected with Wi-Fi. Uh, some, some tremendous, I think, progress was made as well in that direction. However, that said, uh, I, I guess digital literacy will still be a challenge uh, and, and until and unless there are more organizations stepping forward and perhaps even looking at digital literacy from the perspective of corporate social responsibility, right? So uh, I, I can talk a little bit about what uh, the, my organization does because they do some uh, pretty interesting work in that space. So we've set up uh, uh, close to around 800 or digi digital uh, villages uh, or they're called digital classrooms where there, there is basic infrastructure set up so that students in remote areas can connect to uh, professors or faculty in tier two cities or tier one cities where they have access to uh, you know, vocational trainings or other specialized courses. Uh, it, it also offers them an opportunity to connect with faculty or people who they otherwise would not have connected to. So th I think that sort of connectivity and that sort of uh, you know initiative that's being taken both from the corporates as well as even from the government, I think will definitely make an imprint. Uh, and, and, and I think that will make some, uh, it'll bridge this digital divide that we speak of. And in terms of penetration, uh, you know, we all know that more and more people are using connected devices, right? And everything is connected. So uh, according to a report which I read, it said that as on 2021, there are more than 200 billion connected devices in India alone, which just means that there's so much of data that's out there, right, which anybody can misuse. So I, I, I suppose uh, with that, there is definitely a, a set of, it, it, it becomes imperative to have a set of laws, it has, becomes imperative to have some policies and measures which control it. But at the same time, I think uh, this was inevitable. Uh, and, and uh, there's, a, there's a huge, again, a huge, huge opportunity for a lot of uh, tech giants to step in and see how they can tap into these uh, these areas and see how they can, they can come up with more effective solutions, more more policies, uh, and, that, and that in turn can help perhaps the judiciary, the, the legislature, you know, even from a public policy uh, perspective. A lot of times, uh, companies like ours, we provide proposals on these areas through NASCOM. Uh, they often get discussed extensively. So that, that's also a way to bridge this digital divide. And I, the last point I wanted to specifically talk about was cost, right? Because we're talking about uh, you know expenses that are associated with technology. See, more and more companies, if you look at Amazon, you look at IBM uh, or Accenture, uh, these are companies that are now looking at solutions which are based on consumption-based models. So you know, you, when you buy a particular product, uh, like the server, uh, you don't have to pay for the entire product. You have to just pay for the services. You lease it. You take it on a leasing model, right? And then uh, when you do it on a lease model, of course there are some challenges with that. But at the same time, then you only consume what you need. And that tremendously helps. I think that will help the judiciary as well because long term, I do understand that there could be privacy concerns. I'm sure Dr. Dugal must be raising his eyebrows and wondering you know, whether this will even work practically. But, but a lot of what, what is amazing actually is that there are so many public sector customers who now buy into this model, primarily because it meets their tech requirements. Technology, as we all know, keeps changing every few years. So when you buy technology, you know it's going to become redundant in another couple of years. So it makes a lot of sense to adopt consumption-based models. Of course, privacy-related issues have to be addressed, but that's the way forward. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Menon. I think, um, you know, in, in all humility, you must say that you know, I was reading newspapers and, and you know, I was following NDTV news some, some other day. And uh, we generally talk about primary education in the country and how, uh, you know, students.
students who were once part of the primary education and how they have dropped out and how nothing sort of has happened in the last two, two and a half years. So while these are laudable steps taken by the different stakeholders, we need to do a lot more in coming years just to ensure that this this bridge is slightly, uh, <coughs> you know, in, in, on a progressive mode than the higher education. Yes. Thank you, Bas. Uh, Dr. Duke. Thanks, sir. So, I think I would again want to highlight four elements. First, infrastructure. And we are crying for better infrastructure at national, regional, local, state levels. Uh, if we have good infrastructure, then dissemination of uh, justice, access of justice, automatically becomes the next priority. Second priority. I think in this entire ecosystem, we are forgetting one fundamental issue, which on which the entire pyramid is based, which is the issue of cyber security. We are all presuming we are in a virtual world, we are in a utopian world, our data will be all fine, there will be no attacks, there will be nothing. Come you bring in board and given the stand taken by India. We now see in the last 30 days the quantum of attacks that have been targeted on Indian critical information infrastructure have been phenomenal. And this is so because some portion of the hacking community believes that maybe India has not done what it ought to have done. And very quickly, I see the scenario where somewhere down the line, there will be attacks on the judicial infrastructure. So what's the best way? Attacking a judicial infrastructure is the best way for creating doubts and suspicion in the minds of the citizens of the country, vis-a-vis -vis the ability of their systems to dispense justice. So I expect these, uh, right now, attacks are only really limited to, say, critical information infrastructure like power, like uh, energy, and like uh, banking. Very quickly, it's going to now spread over to other critical information infrastructure like judicial, like judicial networks, judicial grids. Why? Because if you are able to put the judicial grid down, Years of effort comes to an automatic knot at the top of hand. But for that, are we prepared? Are we doing anything on cyber security? I think we're doing nothing. And that's one huge problem area of concern if we really want to address this fundamental issue of digital divide. Because uh, the idea of, uh, you know, in India, we have this fantastic approach of the Indian Jugaad School of Management. We'd love to do Jugaad. And we believe we can always do Jugaad. Little do we realize in technology, we can never do Jugaad. And law has made it even more difficult. The moment you create a false electronic record today, it actually becomes an offense punishable with seven years imprisonment and fine under Section 468 of the Indian Penal Code. So that's a complete no, no time to do Jugaad. So what's the best way forward? Let's try to harness, increase, and enhance our cyber capacity buildings on uh, cyber security first. The third element has got to do with capacity building. We have to create more warriors. Uh, to be able to take hold of this ecosystem, to be take hold of the emerging challenges. And for that, the more capacity building that needs to be done, that's better. Professor Vith Kumar is here. She at an NLU Odisha, along with Cyber Law University, are offering a diploma, 16-hour uh, credit course on uh, cyber law and cyber security. And I think when you get students from across the country, it's only a growing reflection of the fact that there is a need for more capacity building. So if we can allocate resources, passion, time, effort, and energy towards capacity building, that could be fantastic. And finally, at the end of the day, uh, you just have to be prepared for a uh, culture of cyber resilience, which is non-existence in the country. Today, we are having a unique policy that in the country. India does not have a dedicated law on cyber security. We don't have a law on data protection. We also don't have a dedicated law on privacy. So this unique uh, vacuum of this trinity of laws has created a very fertile atmosphere for almost everywhere, uh, all cyber criminals and all state and non-state actors to target India, Indian critical information infrastructure, Indian data. So much so as, as a nation, we have not even made up our mind. Do we want our data to be outside India or do we want to copy in within India? Because the RBI says, backing data within India. The PDT bill says, my data outside India, no problem, just give me a copy. I mean, there are fundamental uh, divergences of opinions. And those will have to be hammered out so that we can have a holistic, uh, long-term and also futuristic approach. If we deal with these issues, then to a large extent, we could contribute towards lessening the digital divide. Otherwise, I believe with utmost respect, 
this digital divide is continuing to keep on growing and will be an immense problem in the current times. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Again, as a consumer, I would probably want to focus on a different uh, viewpoint and would like to place that for consideration. We, uh, you know, of course, there is no denying that there is going to be increase in cybercrime. There are going to be challenges, issues that almost every business, every whether and every functionality of uh, administration is going to face, including judiciary. Uh, but taking a bottom-up approach, if the objective of discussion is also to see how do we make this experience more enjoyable, more comfortable for the consumers, uh, then only blaming the judiciary for lack of infrastructure, for lack of manpower, for lack of you know so many other things. Infrastructure may not be the right thing to do because I really do not recollect uh, occasions where reforms in the procedural laws have been discussed and have also been identified as a area which requires significant consideration and probably uh, it needs to now map up to the uh, you know growing uh, technological uh, needs and uh, the way we are looking at integrating it with the traditional workings uh, all across for us so uh, you know we always say that there is a huge pendency of cases there is a huge uh, legacy that is being carried out, there is lack, I mean, the amount of time that is being taken in uh, actually justice getting delivered. Uh, of course, that's all true because we are also facing with this dilemma of how do we cut down the time. And one of the ways of cutting down time is about to, uh, you know, uh, look into the manner in which our procedural laws have been uh, you know, defined. Of course, they were right in doing so about a century back. But now I, I strongly believe that uh, it, uh, we need to have a very, very objective view in ensuring that uh, systems get integrated and mapped so that justice is uh, actually uh, seen to be delivered to and So I would just want to do this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sood. Uh, welcome to Professor Tandon as well. Uh, Professor Tandon, um, do you think that the digital divide is affecting a particular section of the society. This is obvious, but how bad the situation is, in your opinion, um, how it is affecting the marginalized section of the society? Uh, thank you, <clears throat> First of all, my apologies for uh, joining this conclave so late. Uh, uh, my colleagues, uh, Professor Vajpayee, uh, Professor Luzer, Professor Vedi, will agree with me when I say that the teachers teach our students by our conduct. And punctuality is the first thing we teach to our students. So my joining this conference so late, I believe, uh, may be inexcusable. But then there were certain critical issues at my own university which had to be tackled in the morning. And, uh, uh, that is how uh, this has happened, but I was in constant touch with the, uh, can it be better? And I'm using, yeah, I think it's better now, yeah. Uh, but I was in constant touch with Professor Shiriji the, about the happenings which are happening. I thank you the board that ultimately I could make it happen, but because at 11 o'clock I gave the message that I will be losing it. But uh, then ultimately uh, the things improved and I'm happy for you. Uh, at the outset, my greetings to Srana and Surana. Uh, if I could recognize Mr. Pritam correctly, here and the others, for uh, celebrating the uh, Silver Jubilee of their 25th more achievements. I'm grateful to the organizers for uh, making me a part of uh, this conclave and also accommodating Professor uh, um, Gupta, Professor Raj, I couldn't see so far here, Professor Siriji and all that for accommodating me and uh, be considerate uh, here. Uh, please allow me, Professor uh, Gupta, to say a few words before I directly uh, answer your question. When I got the first call 
uh, from uh, the university, Okujin Global University. Uh, even though all these four themes were uh, tough to me, but I could gather that uh, perhaps I'm needed at this session, which is on technology and uh, access to justice. Where those who know me, they must be knowing that uh, I want to talk about techno savvy. I'm too far away from social media, I'm too far away from using uh, that much technology. Only the useful technology. I could have been a mismatch here, but then I was just thinking over this particular uh, theme which was given to me in my mind. And then I realized that technology, it's not technology and the justice. Justice has certain word which qualifies this justice, and that is access to justice. That means it may be different than technology and administration of justice, or technology and simply justice, which may include many things. So I caught up the word access, access to justice. And as academia, in our uh, uh, academic discussions, whenever the word comes, access to justice, Immediately, the marginalized section of the society, the poor and the needy persons come before us and our discussion revolves around that. So when I could uh, have that particular kind of uh, connect, I was feeling inside myself comfortable that perhaps I could contribute something on that. Uh, but then I was, uh, but then in the session note, when I read the details in the session note, I found, oh, all this is regarding the accessibility to the courts. How can uh, we can make really our courts more functioning, efficient, with the use of technology? Maybe it is e-courts or it is uh, 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 other kind of the digital courts, etc. Then my worry again uh, came on the front, and then I had a word with Professor Gupta that it's fine. The judges and the lawyers on the panel might be discussing much about why because they have been going to court. I, as a professor, am not used to go to the court. But then I have to contribute theory. Please add these things also about the marginalized sections and theirs. So maybe we'll be talking about their uh, uh, nature on. Now coming directly uh, to your question. Uh, yes, I missed a lot uh, the initial discussion. But uh, I had the privilege of hearing some of my uh, uh, panelists when I joined here before this uh, occasion and there also I could find there was some talk on the divide. I would like to take up one of the issues in uh, digital divide and that is uh, it also results in what we can say gendered digital divide. That is also one of the issues and uh, uh, Again, the search has become very easy these days, thanks to again the technology. Uh, maybe some of you are already aware of this thing, but I was really surprised to know that the last year only, in 2020, if we talk about the total adult female population of India, then only 25% of the adult female population owned a smartphone. <coughs> Whereas this percentage is 41 in case of adult men. Okay? This was regarding smartphone. Let me take you to simple phone. As well as mobile phone is concerned, therein also the data is that the Indian woman are 15% less likely to own it in comparison to the men. Now let us come to internet use. As far as internet services are concerned, we all know without any study that women are less users of technology, but this is how, how much less. So I'm just telling you the extent. So if we come to internet services, the data says that the women are 33% less likely than the men. Yes, digital divide is there. There are many aspects to see it. But I am highlighting this aspect that uh, uh, the absence of digital access 
is leaving the woman uh, behind. We can also discuss the things, the causes, so that we can come to the solutions to this also. We all know that as far as uh, access to technology is concerned, it is because of this divide of rural and uh, uh, urban areas. Um, again, it is quite visible. Uh, rural areas are not having that, uh, what we say, broadband uh, connectivity as much as the urban areas having one thing. But then when it comes to the rural areas, that means less in comparison to the urban area, then when we come talk about the women of the rural area, then it is lesser of the less. <coughs> That's the thing. Then of course, it also depends, the divide also takes us, whether it is a household in urban or in the rural, uh, the disparity which is there in the income of the households. They are very interesting data that uh, how much uh, low income group are spending on this. Uh, it costs almost 3% of them. And how much uh, middle income group, uh, it's hardly 0.1% of their income that they are spending on it. Then third, but I will say the most important problem when we are talking about gender digital devices, that even those areas and those fear where the woman is allowed to use the internet services and the devices, their activities are monitored by the male members of their family. Again, there are studies that uh, whatever they are searching on the internet, uh, because there is a monitoring, because of which they have not been able to uh, avail the maximum of the essential services. In Corona period, even though it was a schooling, um, if we take uh, the comparison of how many girls, girls students have been able to take online classes and how many boys students have been able to take it, then also we will find uh, the huge uh, difference therein. And this is not only to here, this also applies to any kind of training which they want to take as well as this particular thing, access to justice. So it, uh, somewhere or the other, being a woman, just in such gender based discrimination as we say, they are not able to uh, access to that much. Uh, as far as the question is concerned, how to bridge the district device, some of the solutions have been given. There are technical solutions to this also. Some of the solutions are very obvious that First of all, it requires an investment. The government has to invest heavily on that. But again, the thing is, uh, if we look the uh, population of India, then um, uh, we say that uh, uh, whatever development is uh, made at the national level, the uh, pie may seem to be bigger and better. But when it comes the individual slice, how much each one of the persons in India is having, it becomes uh, thinner and thinner. But yes, uh, still, despite that, uh, heavy investment uh, is needed there in the infrastructure. But uh, uh, taking back to my point, there is a need that there's uh, the social norms which are there, uh, that if the uh, female are uh, using the internet, there will be problem for their marriage. Oh, it will result in the divorce. There are cases. <laughs> Uh, the use of the mobile, particularly the initial years, have taken the couple to the courts. So that disbelief uh, when the woman is using uh, is also one of the hindrances which we have to take care in this. So first, my apologies uh, for being a bit late. But I suppose uh, you excuse me for that. We have got an excellent panel here. And uh, I had the privilege of having a chat with them in advance. Uh, so some of the things which I may be saying, I hope they don't accuse me of uh, stinging their thoughts. I'm, I'll try not to uh, touch anything which they are going to say. I'm trying to look at the entire future of legal profession from outside the prism of Outside the prism of technology, though I happen to be the vice chairperson of the IT committee of the Supreme Court of India. See, the future of legal profession is very bright. 
very bright because uh, if the state or the courts try to solve problems by making new laws, giving new judgments to resolve issues, to settle things, we lawyers have the uh, propensity and ability to turn that order into disorder soon. And then more laws and more judgments have to come. In fact, every new law or every new judgment creates more problems than it solves. This is usual. And uh, the legal profession has thrived on avalanches of law, which uh, the state brought in right from the agrarian reforms, which ultimately led to that uh, Keshavananda Bharati. So, apart from this uh, lawmaking, which is uh, mostly a knee-jerk response from the legislators as well as uh, judges, now people say that there is a threat from the technology. The technology is possibly going to make disputes, reduce the disputes and make lawyering redundant because people will know in advance what is going to be the judgment or uh, sort of uh, what they call in mediation is early neutral evaluation. So the litigant knows that this is going to be the fate of his problem, he will not rush to the court. That is not likely to happen. Because for technology to work or for AI to work, AI which is touted as a tool, there have to be some ground rules. Without any ground rules, AI cannot work. See, when you type something on your uh, mobile screen, it adds the correct sentence or correct word, next word. Because the machine has learned the grammar and therefore it knows that what is to be stated next. But as far as uh, lawyering is concerned or justicing is concerned, nothing is certain. Had everything been certain, there would have been no need for any new laws in the last hundred years. Everything changes and that is what Supreme Court has been repeatedly saying. Constitution is also a live document, dynamic document. Things go on changing. And that change is brought about by lawyers, by us, who argue cases before the courts, who show a new dimension of every problem. And this is going to be the strength of legal profession. Because we can throw new light we can do a lot. All the same, technology would have its own impact. Technology does have its own impact. As the vice chairman of the committee, I have uh, no compunctions or no, uh, say, apology in saying that, well, we have been trying to push technology for the last 16, 17 years not with much of success. All that we have been able to do is possibly digitizing how cases are listed before the courts, how court time is efficiently managed. That also, uh, there is a great doubt whether we have done anything concrete to ensure that the court time is efficiently managed. As far as resources are concerned, we always cry about inadequacy of judges, inadequacy of infrastructure. But I request all of you, particularly uh, heads of educational institutions, to send your students to courts and to find out how court time is actually utilized <coughs> at the ground level. You will find that half of it is wasted. Mr. Dadao is IIT and IIM grad. So, uh, possibly he and he was talking with me about uh, responses in nanoseconds or recording transactions in nanoseconds. We have uh, no issue about even calendar changing the year. Seconds are nothing for us. Seconds, minutes, days, months. The usual ordering in any court, 
why we agree with this is that SO2 weeks, as if two weeks don't, don't matter. After two weeks, the matter doesn't come up before the court. Then the lawyer again rises and says that please paste it before us, before the court. So this is one aspect. But technology has definitely been imbibed by law firms, has been utilized by law firms, lawyers' offices. They are using, they are making use of technology in a big way. And I suppose at least the work in their offices is now better organized. The client contact is better. Clients are informed well in advance of what is happening. There are automated uh, processes in many, law, many good law firms like uh, this one. So that the clients have a sense of confidence in what is happening in the courts. But then this is not all, this is not enough. The biggest litigant is government. And how are government law offices organized? Are they using any technology? No. If there are any government leaders in this uh, congregation, please forgive me. <laughs> because uh, the instructions are received over a long period of time and courts have also accepted that when it is government law, you have to give some time. So it's necessary for us to ensure that technology is also pushed in government public sector undertakings which are a bulk of litigants in the courts. Now, as far as lawyering is concerned, basically in trial courts, we have got five questions to answer. Because events are examined in the courts. What exactly happened? Something which has happened in the past has to be examined. What happened? How did it happen? Who did it? And why? And the last question is, which is the applicable legal principle? Which legal principle has to be applied? Now, CCTV cameras or uh, other technology tools which are available, like getting uh, your call records, may help you in some measure in finding out what happened. But that's also not accurate. These things can be tweaked. Once uh, all American senators, a group photograph was to be organized. They have that usual practice after new elections. And one of the senators, Zadar, was absent. But then his photograph had to be put in that group photograph now. It was done. <laughs> so, <laughs> anything can be done. I am standing here. Somebody can show me standing at some, some other place. Somebody can definitely prove that my, I am at some other place. My mobile record will show some different tower. So, all this again requires lawyering. A lawyer has to apply his mind. Check the veracity of the source. And that checking the veracity of the source cannot be done only with the help of technology. It requires our brain, which is greater than uh, even the best of computers, supercomputers. A DNA fingerprinting is used. Now the question whether the body fluids which were found on the body of on the uh, clothes of the offender were actually attracted in the course of the transaction or were smeared in course of investigation. Uh, I am sorry if there are police officers, <laughs> please forgive me. But uh, police officers see that, well, what to do? You have to create some evidence, no? So therefore, uh, since we are convinced that the person is an offender, there is nothing immoral about doing that. But then the lawyer said in finding out the truth. Uh, many of you must have read the case of Ankush Maruti Shinde. You remember that? Anybody has read Ankush Maruti Shinde? Okay. Please, uh, when you go back, no? Open the Supreme Court judgments and find out Ankush Maruti Shinde. In 2005, some gang rapes and murders took place in Nasik district. Six persons were sent for trial. 
they were all convicted, ordered to be hanged by the session judge. As you know, death sentences come up for confirmation before the High Court, and death references are heard by a division bench of the High Court, not a single judge. The division bench heard the references, found that conviction was proper, but death sentence was justified for three, and for other three, they reduced it to life. Both sides appealed to the Supreme Court. In the Supreme Court, again, a bench, Supreme Court never sits singly, you know. I don't know whether it has started now. Yeah, yeah. No, no. So, a bench of the Supreme Court accepted the state's appeal, dismissed the appeal of the convicts, and ordered all six to be hanged. This took place sometime in 2009. They were on death row but mercifully not hanged. In 2018, a review was admitted by the Supreme Court, and in 2019, end or 2020 beginning, see the date of the judgment, I don't remember that. The bench found, the court found, that these persons were not just not proved, offense not, offense not proved, they were not guilty, no. Yes. They were innocent. They had been wrongfully sent for trial. All of this with scrutiny of evidence at all stages, including the Supreme Court of India. So therefore, whenever such ghastly crimes occur, no, the temptation of the officer, because of political pressure, to smear some body fluid from one place to another cannot be ruled out. And it is here that lawyers play a very pivotal role, very important role. Now, see, as far as uh, finding the applicable rule is concerned, that's all the more difficult. Gone are the days when we looked at everything, say, in IPC for uh, uh, criminal <coughs> trials, the Contract Act for breach of contracts, now there are myriad of laws, you can't mention, count the numbers, though the government has recently some uh, annulled several old laws, finding them to be useless. I don't know how, how far that step was wise because uh, the Tamil Nadu government recently found that an old law, 150 years old law, was useful for curbing the pandemic. They possibly made a, such a statement before the court. So therefore, there are laws and laws on various subjects. It's very difficult to find out which law governs or which legal rule governs the situation. What happens is, whenever there is a problem, the legislature's first response because of public pressure is that pass a law. Sometimes courts also say, where is the law? We can add a fundamental right when it is necessary. But when there is no law, we can't do anything. Forgive me, I'm committing contempt. We say that government, parliament, it's parliament's duty to frame a law. And then parliament enacts a law. Public pressure after all. So, just one example of an estranged wife. How many options does she have? Our old, good old section 125 CRPC is there. The Domestic Violence Act is also there. The personal law is of course there. So for solving one problem, we have got so many solutions. It becomes difficult for a lawyer to find out which solution should be applied. And it is possibly here that technology may help. Again, this is not a very uh, a, a thing to be complimented about. But then you can find out which court is fast, which court is slow, whether going to family court will help or whether going to a magistrate will help. Depending on the speed of work in various courts, which you can find out from the databases available, you decide which remedy to pursue. Should we go for, say, a 
person is missing a young cop young boy and girl eloped and the wife was ultimately picked up by parents and uh, kept in isolation then whether the husband should file an application for warrant before the magistrate or going for habeas corpus depends on who may approaches if he approaches Mr. Kripal, he will have to come to high court. Rate of habeas corpus. If he goes to a magistrate out, practicing in a trial court, a simple application for warrant will do. So there are many, many options available, and it is here that lawyering counts. Apart from this, in the name of classification, because we cannot treat unequals equally, no. In the name of classification, so many classes are created. And all of you know that there can be a class comprising of single person also. Look, that is the law. A class need not have many persons. A single person is good enough if he can. If that classification is justified. So, at one end of the spectrum, we are trying to erase even the gender differences, which are physically visible. Because they are very irrelevant, no? Appearance, whether somebody is a woman or a man or something else, doesn't really matter, no? How does it matter? So we are trying to erase those differences at one end, and at the other end, we are creating all sorts of artificial differences: caste, creed, religion, domicile, and what not. And there are laws. specifically for these persons various classes so when there is a problem when you have found out what happened for applying or identifying applicable law you have to find out what is the person i am no longer an indian i am either a maharashtrian or this or that so then you find out that law and then that law applies so this is what is Likely to create a lot of problem, and this is what the lawyering is all about. Lawyering will be all about. Apart from this, with apologies to all lawmakers, there is a big shift going on, fundamental shift in our thinking about economic activities. Gone are the days when promises were made to be kept. प्राण जाए पर वचन न जाए प्रभु रामचंद्र नाउ द न्यू नॉर्म इज प्रोमिस आर मेड टू बी ब्रोकन यू टेक लोन डोंट रिपीट डजेंट मैटर यू प्रोमिस समबडी दैट विल बी फ्लैट फॉर यू डोंट बिल्ड इट डजेंट मैटर you don't pay taxes doesn't matter we have got all sorts of waivers rescheduling one time settlements and bankruptcy courts i be you just throw your hands off and say that well i can't pay what do i do <laughs> matter is over as far as you are concerned the signal that is going to common man is this that don't pay it doesn't matter make promises it doesn't matter sometime ago there was a question whether promises made in political writings uh, can be enforced now when contracts which are made in writing which are registered need not be followed what are those promises made in political writings <coughs> so this is another area which disturbs me and where i suppose uh lawyering will have a lot of activity to do all of you possibly have heard michael sandel professor michael sandel must have seen his videos and also book what is the right thing to do long ago a sage apastamba possibly 
13th or 14th century from somewhere in Telangana or Andhra. He said that the righteous dharma and unrighteous adharma do not go aground saying, here we are. Nor do gods, Gandharvas or ancestors declare that this is righteous and this is unrighteous. Righteous, unrighteous. Forget, forgive my pronunciations. I am after all a rustic religion. Not Oxbridge product. So, righteous and unrighteous cannot be determined. In some circumstances, even cannibalism may be justified. And in another circumstance, plucking a leaf from a tree may not be justified. So, between these two ends of the spectrum lie all human activity. And therefore, law is never likely to be able to govern these activities because every time something happens, it will be happening in a new dimension of time, at a new place, with new actors, new circumstances, and to which what rule applies will have to be decided by us after examining those circumstances. It is where ingenuity of lawyering lies. And therefore, I earnestly request you that don't just limit your uh, vision by technology. Technology is just a small part of lawyering. There is a lot beyond technology in lawyering. I thank uh, Surana and Surana for giving me this opportunity of sharing a few thoughts with you. And I thank them all the more for putting me in, panel, in the company of these, these great panelists. When I had discussions with them now, and when they shared some ideas, I think I felt enriched. And at the end of the day, after I go from here, after hearing your questions, after hearing their answers, I think I'll go not exactly enlightened man, but a bit enriched man. Thank you. Maybe what we can do is that I'll give my thoughts on something and then it will be nice if the panel can all join and give their views on what I have just said. Of course, after what Justice Chavan has said, there's not much left to be said for anybody in any case. Uh, he may go back an enriched man, I shall, I'm here and I'm already an enlightened man. Uh, and thank you Justice Chavan for that. Uh, so the topic was, uh, is today, the future of the legal profession. And this is something I feel very strongly about because when we say the future of the legal profession, I don't think we can focus just on how technology will imp improve the functioning of the courts or the law firms. If the idea is to be, have justice, a better sense of justice, we cannot ignore the most important component of what a judicial system is, be it law firms or lawyers or the courts. And to my mind, the most important component of the legal profession are the legal professionals. Uh, now, of course, we are a means to an end. Right? A lawyer is not there for him or herself. The idea is to get justice. But as long as the lawyers themselves are not of this top quality, they're subpar, unhappy and underpaid, then we will find ourselves with a system that no matter what it is, it will not function well. So for me, the future of the legal profession in requires the working conditions of lawyers and the kind of lawyers who come into the profession to improve. So that is something we really have to focus on and it's good that today's discussion is also in conjunction with the OPG in the school where you are. Uh, so it's very, very important. I remember my time when I was studying law, uh, you know, uh, many, many years ago, longer than I care to remember. Uh, if you didn't get anywhere else, you did law. It was really the last thing. I mean, but now I find young lawyers actually seeking out and trying to do law uh, because the profession has become better paying. But I think that's true only for law firms. Uh, 
and that's, I don't know how, I'm sure Surana and Surana pays very well, and, and good for you, I'm sure you still want to hike it and speak to your bosses later. But unfortunately, this is not really true for the bar. I think how the courts function and how we treat the personnel there, interns, juniors, is extremely appalling. They are underpaid and overworked and certainly not appreciated to the extent. So when we talk of the future of the legal profession, I think we will have to devise mechanisms as to how to a, attract the best talent, train the best talent, and once they're there, to ensure that they get a survival mechanism where they can stay in the profession. Not everyone comes to the profession with rich parents. Uh, you say you're from a uh, village boy, not an Oxbridge. I maybe am at Oxbridge, but not everyone is born with privilege. So how do we ensure that the people who join the profession after spending money, effort and time stay in that profession? I've seen so many people join, but the attrition level is so high, they drop out because you can't sustain yourself. So the future of the legal profession for me will require the best talent to come in and the best talent to be retained. And for me, the most important suggestion that I have on that front, and I would love to hear your ideas on this, is to have some kind of institutional mechanism where interns are maybe randomly allotted to a certain set of lawyers. So everybody gets a chance to do an internship. There should be a mandatory minimum payment to interns so that they are not really exploited. It happens in every other profession. I don't see why we as lawyers can get away without paying people. Uh, and uh, for first generation lawyers, there should be also some form of mentoring uh, where senior counsel, other senior lawyers, even if not designated, take people under the wings and uh, encourage people. And finally, minimum wages for a lawyer, really. I think uh, decent working conditions. See, this sounds like an obvious thing and uh, this is more a talk for a labor conference than perhaps for... Can I, can I just stop you here? Yes. Something is, you're talking about the future. I'm sure you know the current situation which you mentioned. But do you think the future also same thing can continue for a few years? So that's what I'm suggesting is that the, the, my suggestion is that we need a system in well, place. That system, because I work in the general economic area. I also head legal for VAC. What I see, every year we have approximately one population of Australia into the labor pool. The Indian people most of the people who look for any jobs, and I'm telling you, we get bright people at the lowest uh, level of class or lowest class of society as well as the highest class. What happens is, these people are searching for some way of survival. If you look at GDP growth, if the GDP grows by say 1 lakh crore every year, I'm just giving you a number, and if there are 1 lakh people who come, which means approximately 1 crore extra is going to go into someone's pocket. If you look at those numbers calculations, and I write a report in some journal now seen uh, some time later, the average amount of salary a person is likely to get if he passes out in this year is approximately 15,000 rupees to 20,000 rupees. Which means that the young people who are going to come, they are going to look at that. Now we as a part of the society at a little elevated level in terms of the amount of money that we make or the positions that we have, everyone aspires to. But since it's a pyramid, they can't go. So when we give them a focus saying you will go up, they don't, they can't go. It's a very difficult task. So what happens is, everyone is expert. What you are talking of lawyers. If you ask anyone, just ask them what do you want to do. They'll say I like say painting, but I'm never going to get money in painting. So I'll become a lawyer, architect, engineer, etc. And engineering is tough, medical is tough, the fees are very high. So most of the people find law as a cheaper substitute for learning. And let me tell you, the cheaper is only economic sense, but study-wise, it's one of the toughest things. Because I've also gone through it, I know. But the point of being paid and all, if the supply is very high, if the number of lawyers is very high, and the professionals like us, there is a problem. There's no entry barrier to someone starting a law practice. So what happens is, the professional at the top thinks that if I teach this person, and if it becomes better than me, he'll take away my clients, he'll take away my business. Whereas that's the way Dronacharya has done to Eklavya also. So I don't say that it's only now. So they, it's their own next of kin. You'll see lawyers, advocates, sons and daughters being advocates, the family members are advocates. Same thing with doctors, actors, MBAs and engineers, everyone. But it's the low fees, 
the brighter students come in, the pool very high, people don't want to go, that's one reason. Second, the disputes, as the, uh, this is Chawan rightly pointed out, the disputes were done, because no one can watch, you know, you can't have a CCTV camera watching everyone everywhere, so there's no proof. With technology, what will happen is, these frivolous things, you know, he hit me or he banged my car, will go away. So, there will be a higher level of lawyering as everyone talks about the thinking, etc. There will be AI and ML. AI is artificial intelligence, ML is machine learning. It will be used to take away these frivolous things. And uh, like we, today earlier we used to remember the phone numbers and all. Today we outsource our brain remembering to the phones. Like we remember the birthdays on Facebook, we don't remember the birthday, actual birthday. Those kind of outsourcing will happen in the legal profession. But I leave here because I would like to go out on the next no, 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 I think there's so much to discuss that if I keep on speaking, others won't have a chance to say something. So let's get a law formal perspective and, and not just a law formal perspective, but open general. Thank you so much. So, uh, you know, it's such a pleasure to be here as part of this very diverse and very experienced panel. and. First of all, a big thank you to Honorable Justice Chavan for such uh, interesting points that not all of us would have thought of. And, uh, you know, the idea of thinking about technology as something that will affect the future of the legal profession on one hand, and on the other, the requirements of society as a whole, the, the human context of it. Uh, very importantly, uh, I think these two are equally important and, and really I thought it was uh, excellent the way our opening remarks picked on both because I feel technology is a very glamorous and very catchy aspect to the future of the legal profession. It is also, like death and taxes, inescapable. None of us can look away from technology. So I will look at technology. Uh, just, uh, you know, to give you a brief background of my perspective, I have been in legal practice for many, many years. Uh, you know, I was with a law firm, uh, I worked with AZP and partners, uh, you know, for, for well over a decade. Uh, so we saw technology and back when I started, uh, you know, when I joined the workforce, and I'm going to let the other panelists speak and then when, I, when we come back, I want to share with you some anecdotes of how quickly technology has actually completely changed the landscape. Uh, I'm giving away my vintage here, but how we used to do things uh, when I was a first year associate at a law firm and how we do it now is unrecognizable. And probably in the next few years, how we are doing things today may also be unrecognizable. So as a profession, we have to take note of it do we go into the full dystopian side of it that it will be uh, legal bots and it will be e-courts and there will be no more lawyers or do we look at it as technology enhancing the abilities of lawyers? This, these are very interesting questions and I want to go into that. The other aspect, I mean, so that was technology okay, and, and that is important. We must, as lawyers, not look away from it. We are a very tradition bound very labor intensive profession but technology has is already here to stay and it is changing a lot of paradigms which we need to be aware of so that's why but technology while very glamorous uh, i don't think is the only aspect of the future of the legal profession so taking off my corporate lawyer hat here uh, let me speak as an academician as somebody who has uh, you know, I, I moved on from my law firm job to start teaching uh, at Jindal Global Law School and I've been teaching there for many years now. It has been an absolutely phenomenal experience to interact with young minds, uh, you know, on a daily basis and I learn as much as from them as probably they, they learn from me. Now, the human aspect of law, I believe, is very, very important. What is the future of law? So. And you know, as Mr. Yadav also mentioned, that there can be a very exploitative and exclusionary route to being successful in law. While there is no entry barrier to anybody getting a law degree, we, we have so many law schools across this country, anybody can get a law degree and technically you can even start practicing. 
but will you make a living wage from it will you be successful if you look exactly so i have been in one of the sort of rarefied echelons of indian corporate law practice uh, you know with one of the biggest law firms and yes a well paying law firm as well but to get to that law firm is that something that is possible for the vast majority of our law graduates i would say no uh, it is not and why is that so this these are questions very well worth asking now um, you know while this was not a, a problem at my law firm but in many other law firms the firm will not look at you unless you are from one of the national law schools or oxbridge or harvard you know but that automatically makes the future of the legal profession and the present of the legal profession the, the really successful part of it quote and quote or the the part of it that is enjoying their profession or enjoying the success of the profession a very small minority of affluence and there there would be you know various community uh, identities caste identities and so on which is also important to think about when we think about the future of the legal profession so for me and i'm going to pass the, the mic on now i want to talk about both these from the perspective of somebody who has practiced long years in a big corporate law firm and as somebody who is teaching law students as practitioners and as as teachers what should we be thinking and what should students be thinking you know you, you are about to step into it what should young lawyers junior lawyers you know whether it is at surana and surana or any other firm or any litigation chambers what should you be thinking when you think about your own future and the future of the profession i want to tackle it from the perspective of technology we cannot get away from technology no matter how traditional mom we are and the, from the perspective of perhaps changing the profile of who gets to be in the room who gets to be a senior counsel who gets to be a partner at a law firm right who gets to be in those positions to then present a certain legal principle even more important to formulate legal principles right who is advising our lawmakers on how the laws and policies are being drafted so should that be an inclusive profile of of our entire society should it be bots and artificial intelligence who should it be who is it likely to be so i am looking forward to coming back to that uh, question but i won't take any more time and i'll pass on to my fellow panelists to introduce uh thank you so uh first of all thank you for inviting me uh, being the youngest one and non practitioner so it's just the uh you know obviously i will get to learn a lot uh my perspective being one of the founder of a legal tech company is that technology is going to stay here like you know you like you rightly pointed out that you know we cannot even imagine finishing a day without using technology in any form be it like speaking to someone over the phone a call video calling or even just researching on google whatever we want to we can just do it with a you know with a single click and this is something i feel was no one actually imagined just 20 years back and uh, things are changing in such a manner and if you are not going to adopt to it it becomes a challenge and in legal profession i feel that you know for some reason be like it not being taught in the college level or people are receptive to the change because they've done a particular thing over the course of time it becomes very difficult for them to suddenly adopt a new way of working so because of the multiple reasons you know people stop using that and they feel that okay they instead of looking at it as an investment or instead of looking at it as an enabler they start treating it as a competitor because they feel that you know whoever is using the technology it is taking away their job or it is uh, sort of disabling them so as to speak but in reality technology like you know like everyone pointed out that uh, having a like having bots uh, you know putting the judge judgments or whatever like this this right now it's it's not the case it's all about enabling you to enabling you with the data points that are otherwise very difficult for you to get i remember like you know in 2000 one anecdote that i want to share like when i was interning in 2013 which is like 9 years back and i was doing a basic trademark research i still remember the website is exactly the same there was one feature which said which said coming soon which has been like that since last 9 years 
I have graduated. I have now created a tool which sort of this part that like that surpasses that entire thing. So it's it's all about like you know moving forward with the technology, how you can use it to your like use it as your strength rather than you know using it as your like be keeping it as a dis disadvantage. And that is where a lot changes. And you know after like we are creating tools since last four years. We have spoken to a lot of our clients, and they have felt that you know where they were spending around five hours, six hours on a particular activity, they were able to cut short it to an hour. And lawyers, I think everyone struggles with the work-life balance. And <laughs> if there is anything that you know can enable us to cut short the time that we otherwise are spending, which can be automated or which can actually be implemented in a manner where you know it sort of supports us in the cause that we are doing, that is something we should be willing to adopt to. And I'm sure I'm sure what others have to say. Thank you, uh, Jessie Sohan and Surana and Surana for giving this opportunity. Uh, I'm a practicing lawyer, educating lawyer basically. Uh, of course, I had the offers uh, from the law firms earlier. I could not join because you know everybody has got uh, their own taste basically. The law firm culture and litigating people, non litigating we know the general classification like earlier we talked about civil lawyer and criminal lawyer now we talk about litigating lawyers and non litigating lawyers different different classifications and so far as this technology issue is concerned nobody can say no to technology that's a fact we have to accept it but what is the level of technology we are going to use but uh, first of all we need to understand what we are discussing about because basically the uh, we like people we are talking about ai machine learning etc and these are all meant for only one percentage of our lawyers. Entire strength of Indian, I mean, an entire India, we are talking about only one percentage. 95 or 99 percentage of lawyers in India, they are just hands to mouth existence, most of them. And, and for them, simple Microsoft Word operation, typing something, I am taking a printout and filing, that's technology. There is the matter. I'll tell you one interesting, we are in Delhi, we are living in Delhi. So one gentleman who passed out from Bihar, he came to Delhi, he was really struggling. Uh, and of course I had a share, I, uh, I, of course I have gone through the similar state. Uh, and this gentleman uh, came, he can't speak English fluently, and asked him, what about your practice? I, uh, he said, uh, I'm into standing practice now. He says, I am standing practice. Karte. So I asked him, what is the standing practice? Uh, we get about 100 rupees, 150 rupees, 200 rupees. So, thus, clients will get those are banned. So, this is the level of lawyering in this country. And we are and we are talking about technology. In fact, of course, technology, these are all neat. Technology, because law, law firms, it has become a business. It's a fact. We talk about service, justice, all kinds of things. But we have to understand the core of it is basically humanity and human beings. And ultimately, are we delivering justice or not? And, and so far as law firms are concerned, that will work on a demand and supply basis. That will definitely work. Whoever, and there is no limit. Because I've seen so many people, uh, those big lawyers or law firms are not indispensable. If you have more money, there are plenty of them, similar law firms, you can have access to such law firms are big lawyers. But a person who is practicing with accountability and transparency, you won't find many people. How many people I've seen, a senior Supreme Court lawyers, uh, making lakhs per day, discussing in canteen, I need a junior, but I can pay only maximum 20,000 rupees per month. So I heard it. So this is the situation in our country. I know youngsters, uh, sort of talked about youngsters, I know so many lawyers, senior lawyers, they are treating the junior colleagues as slaves. And they are making them to, you know, carry their bags or uh, do other administrative work. Or they just want to show numbers whenever he's visiting them. They have to show five juniors interning with me and put it on Facebook or LinkedIn to improve. I know lawyers who are paying peanuts and telling them to incur all expenditures. Suppose a person is taking a junior, paying only 20,000 rupees, and about that person will have to incur seven or 8,000 rupees for traveling. He won't pay extra to that person. I've seen so many lawyers in our country. So unless we have a system, so what we are lacking is, we are talking about technology. 
bureaucracy about ourselves, etc. But according to me, we need a regulatory system in this country. Lawyering should be regulatory and there should be a strong regulatory body within ourselves. How, how, how much we are transparent, how we are doing our billings. I know people when the matter is posted in registrar's court in Supreme Court, I know one gentleman, now the matter is uh, listed before the court. Senior ko engage karna hai, tumne 5.5 lakh page I know the person pocketed. This are all, these, these sort of things are happening in our country. So, we, unless we address these sort of, because we lost credibility, completely lost credibility. Lawyers lost completely credibility. Who are the reasons for that? Not the judges, not the system, we ourselves. Because we so want the, we want the politics, we want to make all judges corrupt. Then only you can make money. Then only the lawyers can make money. Because if the judges is corrupt, see, the, I know that certain people may be corrupt, they are also from our society. But I can tell you out of my 28 years of experience, out of, if you take 30 persons, maybe one or two, max. Maybe the polit personal relationship would be there, somebody might have done something, some favor, etc. But I have I not seen much of the people who are collecting money perhaps my entire life but people i've seen people who are going to judges house in delhi keeping the clients outside I've, I've heard about the stories in one story i heard about that the client came from and that client was taken to the judge's house but that lawyer went to judge to invite him for some function and he came back from judge's house the packet was carried to the judge's house and he came up without packet i don't know what he might have had some sort of deal with the uh, driver or somebody who's inside the campus. I know this story. So, so, and we are not talking about all those things. We are, we are hesitant to talk about these sort of things. Unless we have very open talk about these sort of issues, which are really affecting legal profession, particularly those lawyers who are entering the profession. And unless we point out, unless tell them, look, you should not lose your soul for this. This is not a madly money-making business or enterprise. There should be some sort of human value with you all the time with you progress and don't expect to make too much of money don't compare yourself as a businessman if you are interested to make a money like a businessman please join business don't join this profession and pol don't pollute this so we need that sort of an atmosphere we need to create in this country thank you It's very hard to sort of uh, contribute anything of value after <coughs> so many speakers have spoken. I think uh, very important points on making the profession more humane. Uh, there is a future, and there is a future for legal professionals, and it's a it's a future in which everyone's included in that sense. But let me be very clear: I'm not holding my breath for it. It's a very important conversation. It's a conversation that's been happening for a number of years. Uh, but what was said today at the panel, let me tell you, and I'm not going to tell you comforting words, I'm going to tell you what I think is the reality. Because you're poised to enter or you're just there. What has been said on the panel and the sentiments of the seniors here, it's an exception. But I'm not holding my breath as I said, for any changes in the near future. And most of it also is directed to people who are in power who may be heading chambers, who may be policy makers, who may be the regulators of the profession. And if something happens, of course, that's for the good. But what if it doesn't? Because it hasn't for the longest time. I mean, there are entry barriers. I've personally been somebody who would fail to secure a single internship that would uh, you know, make my resume worthy, or even something after law school. Because I, I, I'm, I'm a graduate from Jamia Milia Islamia. Back in the day in 2011, very few people uh, even knew in that sense that Jamia offered law, of course, we've come a long way ever since. Uh, so it was difficult. I started off my career as an independent counsel, second generation lawyer, but inherited not even a single brief from the family in that sense. So I used technology at that point, and this is where I'll segue to the second part of what I'm going to speak about. Technology, what it means to you, how can it help you succeed, how can it help you uh, be a better lawyer or be a successful lawyer in that sense. I started off my career, obviously no briefs, uh, couldn't get into a law firm, couldn't get into a chamber, uh, turned down from everywhere in that sense, started off as an independent lawyer, was also preparing for being a judge alongside. So when I, when I started off, how do you get matters, I started answering questions of people on the internet. There used to be something called Lawyers Club India back in the day, Yahoo Answers. 
people would post their legal queries there i'll go there research a question and give try to give the best answer that the litigant can get and i created a practice around it in the first one and a half years of my profession as a 21 year old lawyer and by the time i cleared the delhi judicial services i had a stream of clients why because i used technology at that point or i could to make inroads into this profession because everyone's also a client so also looking for somebody a lawyer who's accessible a lawyer who knows his job a lawyer who's there and that is where you come and fill in that vacuum and provide the solution that the client is looking for and make your space in the profession so that's technology and that's how you leverage it the second quick point and I'll come to it a little later when we are discussing it is that we as lawyers and Shruti made that point we as lawyers are taught to look behind a new question comes to you what do you do first you look at precedent you look at custom you look at how it's been done and in all of this looking backwards we fail to sort of see what's right in front of us right as they say the best players are not the players who who know where the ball is they know where the ball is going to be and they reach there and score a goal right so you have to be there and and i'll just leave you with a few examples of the kind of questions and the kind of legal problems that we are opining on helping clients already in 2022 and look at how you know law has changed when we used to be in law school we we would be we treat a lot of subjects such as the british constitution for instance or the zamindari abolition act of a particular state things which did not in a lot of ways prepare us for where we are today we are talking about advising clients on what is the criminal liability in case of a self driving car committing any incident or accident how do you regulate autonomous vehicles do you look for liability in tort do you look for liability in an 1860 lord macaulay statute who in his wildest dreams did not imagine that we'll be talking about autonomous vehicles do you look at if you're deciding liability or advising your clients if droning is okay or you can use use a drone to deliver something would that be covered under the ipc would data theft be covered under the ipc under the definition of theft is it movable property or is it not movable property when you talk about constitution how many law students by the way just a quick show of hands that would help us fantastic and how many how many lawyers in the initial few years or lawyers in general fantastic so you you all read and i i just close this with one <laughs> example you read the indian constitution right and you read article 14 we've had this debate of affirmative action protective discrimination reservation for the longest time but how you would be advising clients or the next few generations would be advising clients on article 14 is going to be very very different let me throw this example at you from one of my favorite authors yuval noah harari who's who's built a you know a reputation and a career on looking into the future and helping us navigate it better now for example you have somebody who's gene edited somebody who's more resilient to disease for example you we talk about designer babies right but the future is closer it's not too far out in the future too so would you or would i as as a let me let me say an ordinary human being would be able to compete with somebody who's gene edited like a trans human like a super human so somebody who can talk like oprah who can look like rithik roshan or who has the knowledge of bill gates can i compete with that individual so you will be advising on article 14 on whether we have a level playing field or do we have the right to equality this will be not human beings versus human beings you may be advising that or at least looking at it from the standpoint of a super human being versus a human being so the goal posts are going to shift and they are already shifting in a lot of ways you are talking about nft you are talking about cryptocurrency you are talking about uh, a google oh, i was i was fascinated before i came here i was searching for something and i uh, i chanced upon a website where a google assistant allows you to make a reservation at a restaurant it allows you to make a contract on your behalf so google would take, act as your assistant or as your agent and call up a restaurant or call up somebody and make a reservation on your behalf the other person is not going to know that it's an ai system doing it now how do you from an indian contract law perspective again say is this a person who's your agent because indian contract would only tell you that an agent has to be a human being who represents you and you are the principal that person is the agent you are liable for the acts of your agent right how would that indian contract law principle apply to a situation where you've got an ai system to do a contract on your behalf what i'm saying to you today is that things are going to change it's important for you to stay ahead of the curve in that sense of course making the profession a more humane 
profession is a conversation that is the most important at the moment. But let's talk about what you can do, what we can do in order to stay relevant. Because it's, it's uh, you know, even, even a revolution of the exploited has an audience, right? If you look at the history of Marxism. But a revolution of the irrelevant would not possibly have an audience. And I'm not going to be a, the, 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 the prophet of doom any further. Uh, but let me tell you, and I keep saying this to my younger uh, colleagues in the chamber, that you know that AI system is coming for you. And it is in a lot of ways. Things which are repetitive in the legal profession. Research, doing a draft which is something that can be replicated. All of these things would end up being taken over by systems and they are already being taken over. Watson is one example. But again, what you do in the court, you know, we are one of the best senior counsels at Delhi High Court here on the panel. What you do in the court, your court craft, the way you respond to, to a query, the way you use humor and wit in order to get out of a difficult situation, the way you expound law, the way you come up with an interpretation which wasn't thought of before, the way you do strategy, the way you do intensive, difficult opinion work on which there is no precedent. On that, nobody can replace you, or not in the near future at least. But in repetitive works where you feel like a minor cog in a giant wheel, there we are going to be replaced very, very soon. So focus on quality work, and focus on skills that would have a market so that you stay relevant. And that's where I'll stop my comments in the affirmative. In fact, what Chuk said, I'll also add on, whenever the economy develops more and more, there will be more contracts, more disputes, and more lawyers required. So I don't see lawyers will go anywhere. What will happen is new laws will change, the old laws will go away. There is more requirement of human brains. Are we ready for it? That's the first question. Second, they have been pointing out that if we don't pass on the learning, to new lawyers, that learning will go with us. But with technology, the learning stays. Today, the share market is completely online. There's no paper. Today, the lawyers and clients are confidential. So when Justice Chavan and I were discussing, we will have custodians, will, clients will give the papers there, you will keep the papers there, so you are not responsible for the papers. You are going to give your inputs, the courts will take the papers from the custodian and will use it. These kind of systems are already being envisaged. India is going for great localization of data. Most of the commercial disputes will have trails. Like we have Aadhaar today, or annual information report of each person. Uh, there will be a time, and as he mentioned, I am also one of the pioneers. We started the mobile system when I used to have thousands of people in front of me, and I used to tell them, you will call each other on mobile phone, video, and in fact, you can send roses to your girlfriends or boyfriends. People didn't believe me. Let me tell you, in few years time, you will see our children embedded with chips. You don't require a physical other card. If they are ill, the doctors will know they will give you medicine and you will not even know. People will like each other, the chips will talk to each other, oh hey, I like you. And you get marriages with chips. So human beings will only be thinking brains, doing things that they want, but AI and ML and robots will take over. Like he talked about, he didn't go to metaverse, but let me tell you, if I don't like my looks, I'll create an avatar which will look better. And we will not interact with each other. We will not have a conversation like this. My avatar will be sitting here along with your avatar that we will be discussing. So, this technological changes are not far off. Let me warn you, we are still living in a dream world. We don't know what's happening. We see technology day in, day out. We can check every person what is doing and what is not. So, technology is going to give great opportunity to lawyers. Lawyers will be required because there will be disputes. You will solve the disputes with help of AI and technology. Take a session of Jindal Zoran for Clay on legal education, legal profession, and hosting. Now, this element on the MOOC board was added much later after the, after the planning of this conversation because uh, when Dr. Sudana mentioned that it would be appropriate to have something different apart from uh, discussing, uh, apart, apart from having the conversations about the future of both legal profession and also the legal education. Hence, we have envisaged this session and our idea is that we will investigate a little bit deeper into the very theory and practice of MOOC codes. So today, uh, we have a distinguished panel here. It is a fine balance of academics and practitioners. So we have uh, Professor Dr. Shashikala Gurpur, Director of Symbiosis Law School, uh, Professor Dr. Komal Aldich, uh, Officiating Dean and Head of the Department of Faculty of Law, SRM University, Mr. Aman Bekhi, Senior Advocate, Supreme Court of India, and Mr. Bhavingara, Partner, Strategic Law Partners. Uh, we have uh, titled this particular session as the idea of Moot Court that opens us 
possibilities to go a little deeper into the history, into the present, and into the future, of course, with no reference to technology here. We have given the subtitle, Pedagogy, Practice of Pride. We want to focus on three elements here. Pedagogy, the legal education part of Moot Court. Profession, the practice part, sorry, uh, the practice, the professional part of Moot Court. And the third one, Pride, the competition part of it. So in order to have an effective, uh, in order to set stage for an effective dialogue among the participants uh, or among the distinguished uh, panelists, I would prefer to forge a divide in the perceptions about the moot courts. That is, moot court as an underutilized pedagogy, which has huge constitutive potential, and moot court as an overutilized simulation of real court, which less adequately informs students about the legal profession, about the realities of the legal profession. But I claim no correctness to these propositions. And the debate I end in is mutative only. They are meant to generate critical and useful insights for both legal education and legal profession. The first perspective is that Moot Court is an essential pedagogy in legal education. This is due to the reason that mooting as an activity helps to develop argumentation, which is a necessary legal skill for building legal imagination. But argumentation is not just oratory. Although uh, that's the commonly held perception which prompts many to hold that mooting is a training in speaking about law before a court of law. It is this wrong perception, or probably it is this perception, which is caricatured by Lewis Carroll in Alice in Wonderland. In my youth, I took to law and argued each case with my wife. The muscular strength which, which it gave to my jaw has lasted the rest of my life. However, argumentation sensulato is a way to think through law building a discursive and an argumentative structure. It is the art of making truth out of facts using the elements of law, theories, doctrines, jurisprudence, and semantics. On the skill side, Moot Court teaches research, analysis, logic, refutation, discovery, approximation, and speech. It is the set art and skill in their totality which Moot Courts aim to teach. It is hence that Moot Court is deemed as an integral part of legal education. However, on the flip side, despite the regulatory and standard setting bodies, for example, the Bar Council of India and the American Bar Association, emphasizing the need for imparting legal education through mooting, uh, mooting has become an extended, if not an isolated activity within legal education, which John T. Gavas uh, observes as uh, either steals time from the courses or a game lacking real stuff. This approach has pushed mooting to a co-curricular activity in law schools. However, such a perception is an ab abject neglect of the fact that mooting is uh, an effective pedagogy as much as Socratic method and simulations. But how much law school classrooms are prepared to adopt mooting in their routines? How much of mandate le uh, clinical legal education has for adopting mood codes into its ambit? It is this neglect of mood court uh, by the epistemology and pedagogy of law which leads to the formation of my second perception. That is, mooting is an excellent uh, co-curricular activity which can teach students the art of courtroom advocacy. To assess how far students have grown as lawyers, moot court competitions are held all over the world. But does mooting in fact stage a court? Perhaps it does not, as it has no ambience of the trial, no witness examinations, and no depositions. Then, does it teach the lawyer-client relationships? Does it teach professional spirit? Or is it not the case that moot court status a test of knowledge of law and skills of law students pretty much as law school examinations do? Further, is it, imp uh, is it important for uh, one of the set perceptions to climb over the other? Do we really need a battle of these two perceptions which I've submitted before you? Is there a need to dispel any one of them? Or could they coexist? Whatsoever, the importance of moot court in legal education cannot be underplayed. But understanding moot court better, either as pedagogy or as a mock court or as both, would help legal education and legal profession yield better results. This distinguished panel today, comprising of academics and leading practitioners, would reflect on such and similar questions. Let me now go back and we'll start an initial, uh, we'll, we'll start an informal conversation uh, by me. <coughs> Posing a few questions to each one of them. So let me also relax here and uh, uh, run the panel now after that formal introduction. So, 
Sure. Uh, Professor, uh, Professor Paranjit Jaswal was supposed to be one of our panelists, unfortunately could not come, and uh, his officiating dean is here as uh, a distinguished panelist, so she would like to read a message from Professor Jaswal for us. So I am here on behalf of uh, Professor Paranjit Jaswal, Vice Chancellor, SRM University, Sonipat, Haryana. It is indeed a great pleasure to know that Sulana and Sulana International Attorneys are organizing our conclave in Delhi on 26th March to commemorate 25 years of contribution in conceptualizing, hosting, administering and sponsoring the world's largest food court project in association with leading law schools of India. I have been associated with Surana and Surana International Attorneys for more than a decade. However, my first close interaction with them was in the year 2009 when I was serving as the Chairman, Department of Laws, Punjab University, Chandigarh, and holding the additional charge as Director, University Institute of Legal Studies, Punjab University, Chandigarh. We jointly organized a moot court competition. In the final round, the bench consisted of then four sitting judges of the Supreme Court, one sitting Chief Justice of the High Court, one retired Chief Justice of the High Court, and one professor as subject expert. Thereafter, my association with them continued for a decade when I was serving as the Vice Chancellor of Rajiv Gandhi National Law University, Punjab. There we organized several moot court competitions. In every moot court competition, either Mr. Vinod Surana or Mr. Ravi Chandran used to be present to supervise the moot. I can say that the name of Surana and Surana International Attorneys is synonymous with the mood culture in the country. I am also happy to say that I got opportunity to serve on their mood advisory board. The contribution of Surana and Surana international attorneys in creating the culture of mooting in law institution of the country is unparalleled. Surana and Surana international attorneys have brought a mutation in the culture of law teaching. This has improved research, writing, and argument skills of the students studying law and participating in such events. As a part of their social responsibility, they have done a great service in promoting legal education in the country. Even the Bar Council of India, realizing the importance of mooting, has made moot court exercise as one of the compulsory clinical courses in the curriculum of law courses. Many students have been benefited from different moot court competitions. I take this opportunity to convey my best wishes to Surana and Surana International Attorneys. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Aldich. Well, that message uh, squarely falls within the ambit of our panel. Thank you for reading it out. So let me start uh, by asking a question uh, to Professor Goodwood, which in a sense would be in defense of the pedagogic correctness or pedagogic appropriateness of the Moot Court. We all know that Moot Courts uh, had its modern beginnings in American classrooms. It, uh, it, it actually got split from the Socratic method, which American professors used to religiously follow, and then it got institutionalized in the form of moot courts. It was even before that, even in well, English, in modern course. history. I mentioned modern history, uh, of course. Uh, it can even be traced back to Cicero's days if you if you do a thorough historical search into the antecedents of the moot court. So. Yeah, uh, the, the, it got institutionalized in American uh, American law schools as 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 a, as, as a, a much more you know formal and institutionalized means of Socratic method, and it took almost a century for the competition culture to develop in the moot court. Now, thenceforth, there was a major concern expressed by many scholars that the competition literally takes away the true pedagogic utility of the moot court. Is it in fact the case, Professor? Good evening, Professor Shijit. Panelists and all the esteemed audience. First of all, uh, it's, a, it's a great privilege to talk about mooting, which is a DNA of today's function and uh, today's whole celebration, and also a strong culture in Jinder as well as symbiosis that I represent. Um, Srijit, uh, you have focused on three P's, all right, when you raised all those questions. One is on pedagogy, the other is on practice, and the third is on pride. I, and you were asking if uh, uh, as a practice or as a pedagogy, um, uh, you were telling, based on these American scholars, that it's more of a, more of a, um, I mean, it's uh, underutilized or overemphasized. These kind of, uh, you gave those uh, binary perceptions. 
My response is that I would add one more dimension, assessment. So what I experimented in Symbiosis Law School in 2007 when I took over was based on my previous experience. One was I myself was a mutual in a three-year law course student, being a three-year law course student and being a lady in a mockusy town, it wasn't easy to be a mutual. So not many competitions were there in those days. And Turanas conveniently excluded three-year uh, <laughs> students because they thought they were uh, seniors, you know, like senior citizens. So, so, I mean, obviously, so I had uh, PhDs also in my class. That's a different issue. So, coming from there, when I entered National Law School in uh, 1995 at the invitation of Dr. Menon, I was asked to draft a mood, mood problem. And, uh, you know, burning midnight oil, I drafted the problem. And then it was meant to be for the first year students. And these first year students in national law schools, especially in Bangalore law school, how belligerent they are and competitive they are, you can imagine. And I found it very sick. I was also meant to sit as a panelist and judge them. So I was swallowing my own medicine, you know. So uh, they were fighting, fighting, mixing the names and things like that. But what I found was that these brilliant students would uh, work day and night and master those concepts, master those arguments. What they call as cracking the moving problem, which is about which is the most contentious issue. So it 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 was a culture which was passed down by their seniors. So in your sense of pedagogy, I agree that it's a pedagogy not just in terms of uh, conducting it through external fora. You can do it with the internal fora. So they had this novice mood elimination, and I, as a taught law teacher, was supposed to draft this international thought problem. So this is one thing. Uh, this was one experience I had. So when I took over Symbiosis Law School, first thing I studied was, how is the bar culture here? Within the law school, you have to have a bar culture, professional culture. And the bar culture was terrible. So organizing a non-competitive, not competition-based, but culture, within the culture, institutional culture, a mooting culture, is very, very important. Not only as pedagogy, but as the whole learning experience, because 25% of the learning is through peers. And today with the technology, the peer is not within your college alone. The peer is trans college and trans university. Okay, so we, we, we had to do the ethical training first because senior from Kerala would always select a junior from Kerala to be the moot court vice president. So I had to put that down, putting parameters that they have to have earlier mooting track record, etc. So it's not just an exercise in pedagogy alone. It's about pedagogy in a larger sense. It's about assessment. So what we did, I had a lot of coincidence by God's grace. Uh, this Fulbright scholar visited us in that year, Riven Method, a uh, uh, very, very well-trained Cornell University product who was an uh, environmental law attorney. So I put her in front and I started executing my ideas. The idea number one was like this, that they would learn how to think like lawyers. So a mooting problem was developed by three teachers who were teaching the first year class. I went one step ahead of Dr. Menon. Instead of simply putting the problem in one curriculum, we combined three, thought law, contract law, and constitutional law, developed the problem so that three teachers involved. We have numbers like India's population, you know, 300 numbers, how to pay personal attention. So making a pair of two lawyers, and then, when they are preparing the problem, an average student is unhappy to sit with a bright student and develop this. So we had to do a lot of counseling. So it's a personality building exercise, you know. It's not just preparing for appellate lawyering kind of simulation exercise. It's preparing a lawyer who is a public servant, who is constitution defender, thereby crossing the limits of their mind. So there are a number of soft skills which these American authors have never taken into consideration because lawyering is seen as a as, a, as an exercise which is in shrewdness, which is in that, what you call, crookedness, or a kind of belligerent approach. For me, a lawyer is a social pillar, a social engineer. If you are looking at social engineering as well, it is possible. Let me give you another example. To quickly I'll tell you, one is how I utilized it as I was designing this whole culture and whole approach, and of course, vitalized by Surana's engagement. Uh, in terms of their competition, but that competition in what he said in the morning, capability building. And what uh, uh, Dr. Raj also mentioned in terms of creating that collaborative environment, cutting this national law school kind of thing which I was exposed to, the competitive thing to collaboration. So when it comes to collaboration, 
you have to be a good listener you have to facilitate senior who has won the uh, just of national level has to come and coach the junior and mentor the junior so developing the mentoring culture which is the essence in our profession in our profession we didn't have law schools to begin with. lawyers who were training lawyers as who mentioned uh, in the morning it was mentioned it's a profession of uh, i mean any profession who was for the abhishek manu singh sir so Uh, the solidarity which was there had to be developed in the law school then our role as teachers is more like coaches and mentors you know and we are just there unleashing the potential which is already hidden in the law school in terms of the experience which passes down from the seniors to the juniors and from peers from other law schools now what i want to tell the two experiments one is when they participated in surana or other kind of competitions the research was brought and that was converted into a publication the literature which was brought in a different form raising a hypothesis or research question and developing it we got published in oxford kind of journals that was one second follow up that we had was using this moot in the side but developing the life story behind the moot into law theater so for me moot was a crucible which yielded many other pedagogies aside from uh, using moot as an assessment exercise so first year students Uh, had 100 marks one course let us say law of torts if i am reserving 20 marks for the moot students get very disappointed because the moot is for them there uh, it's like medical doctors looking at the cadaver or the patient you know so i had to teach them that thinking like lawyers so what i did across three courses 60 marks were reserved for the moot so within that i brought all these criteria that you told Dra drafting uh, debating or uh, communication and then how the team is behaving I, I have counted the soft skills because 85 percent of succession, success in profession is about soft skills, which no article mentions there. This is my critical point. This could be understood only by those who understand human resource development and capability building, as uh, Dr. Vinod was saying. So, with those, I would like to tell you that how the mooting, if you observe very closely, with the with the experience I have had in Chennai or in uh, Bombay with the high courts of original jurisdiction as well. where it is not necessarily american model which need to be looked at i would say that moot is the mother of so many other skills other well, that, approaches that, that that's interesting thank you professor gurpur in fact you have without even me asking you have fantastically responded to that question uh, is mooting only a simulation of appellate advocacy does it really simulate a trial court does it really simulate the temperature in the courtroom also i'm very fascinated by this efforts which were taken actually to break that meta reality which moot court at times reinforces in our mind the ideal court well behaved opposition lawyer well behaved uh, i mean well behaved petitioners lawyer i mean you you create a, a sense of an ideal through the moot which i've mentioned as a meta reality i really like the effort you have taken actually to uh, to create an ecosystem whereby the temperature of the courtroom would be felt the emotions would be felt the response to certain emotions would be would be felt in the court uh, before i come to the other panelists uh, i would like to ask uh, uh, professor adich uh, adich Uh, what exactly has been your experiments as far as this is concerned yeah. uh, is do you do you also believe that in your school uh, you have been able to overcome the problem of under utilization of uh, the, the mooting as a pedagogy i would like to tell everyone here in fact i did my graduation uh, from punjab university chandigarh we never had mooting at that time there were just few bar council moot court competitions and we were not at all familiar with that when i had to pursue my phd under professor v s mani late professor v s mani a renowned professor of international law very passionate about mooting i started my research under him and i did not write a single word because i got so involved in it and to all the people sitting here you know we have mostly students sitting here from english media i am from jaipur just now i am working in sonipat again a small town mooting becomes so important to the students who come from vernacular backgrounds we know most of the moot court competitions are held in english so for them to pick up the language it's very very important because when you go for international moot court competitions also you have to be fluent in the language now how mooting helps a lot there because i always tell my students that when you know i got it attached with subject moot because if you just have a moot court committee in the college uh, which holds just one intra moot court competition certain students come forward 
and they are selected and then they are sent to the different mood pole competition. That means many students who are from vernacular background, many students who are even from English medium, but they have certain uh, hesitation to be on the public platform. The mooting there becomes very, very important. And, you know, I attached mooting with the subject right from the first year. I said, let's give the chance to every student. And once that interest is aroused, once that confidence is there, you will definitely go ahead in life and take part in different mood for competitions. And I'm telling you why mooting is so important. You know, we have trial advocacy, which is more regarding the procedure. But mooting is about substantive law. It gives you the experiential learning in that. I have been a mood convener for 11 years. I know how important it becomes for the student to take part in this mood code competition. Because even if your teacher is bad in CPC, if your teacher is bad in CRPC, you can't expect every teacher to be the best one. Mooting gives you in-depth knowledge of the subject. Because unless you have not attained the comprehensive knowledge, unless you have not understood the problem, the facts, you just can't prepare the memories. So somewhere, it is the very significant experiential learning where you have in-depth knowledge of the subject on which the mood problem is based. And it's not that only when I become the, as she mentioned, the coach, even if I'm teaching international criminal law, but the moment I give a mood problem, I draft it, somehow it enhances my knowledge also. And the moment I have to select a team, you know, it is not uh, like that, that three people have been selected. We have to see that they have the compatibility because they are going to work for two months sometimes. If there is some space law problem, they might have to go to Bangalore. So the interpersonal skills you learn through this movie, it's oral advocacy. You know, it gives you the confidence to be there. Even if you are from Hindi medium background, one, once, twice, thrice, you will have all sort of inhibitions while speaking in English. But if it is attached with subject mode, that means you are sitting with your classmates and slowly you shed off the inhibitions. So, not only oral advocacy, it's your research, the legal research. Because when you have to prepare the memorials, the legal issues, it's very, very important that you have the research thoroughly. So it's legal research, legal reasoning, legal writing, critical thinking, all that goes in this. It's not that just the problem. I remember Professor V. S. Mani had drafted a problem of 40 pages. And when we had invited foreign universities for our competition, some of them, they said, it's a difficult problem. We felt very proud. <laughs> that an Indian someone who has drafted the problem and they are finding it difficult. Because you, you can't prepare the memorials if you have not thoroughly understood the subject. And it's the interpersonal skills which you learn, which I can't teach you in the class. The, I, the traditional class does not teach you that. How the team has to collaborate, how the team has to go collectively to achieve that goal. And the, to win that, you know, to win that trophy, how much you know, legal issues, how they have to be divided. It's not just that you mug up the thing and present before the judges. It is the interaction there. And you have to prepare a roadmap that how each of the issues will be dealt by whom and how it will be presented to the judge. So if that roadmap is not there, you just can't go ahead with that. So mooting is so important. It's not just your oratory skills it also improves your research. And people think that we are going for judicial exam, we are going for UTSC, we don't need to participate. But I tell you, there also the interview is there. So once you have that confidence to come on a public platform and speak and put up your points, it helps you in your career. You get lots of opportunities for that. And for <laughs> students who are coming from Hindi medium background, I'm telling you, for them, mooting is very, very important. Because that is how slowly they get the confidence. And one of my students, I remember, he came from Hindi medium, 
by the time he came to fourth year, he started taking part in uh, international motor competition just because he was always taking part. The motors get the best employability opportunities. You know, all the law, law firms, they go for either general or national law. They are not bothered about non-law, uh, national. But somewhere, if your CV has very good participation in modes, of course, Surana and Surana are one of them, you get the call. So it's, it, it gives you that kind of employability also in the market. Because once you have that kind of passion in you, you will go on taking part in national, international mood court competitions. And the law firms, the corporate, they recognize that talent when they employ the students. So it's so many things you learn through mooting, you know. And of course, you meet new people when you participate. You come to know where you stand when you go, uh, you know, somewhere out of station or abroad. You realize where do you stand. So as a moot convener, it has given me immense joy. I could not finish my PhD in three years. I don't mind. Because what I could give to my students, and especially those who were coming from Hindi medium background, it, it, it really made me proud as a teacher that I could contribute something. Well, that's, that's heartening to hear. And of course, law schools indeed do a tremendous job in terms of reimagining the board or exploring the possibilities of the board. Probably the statement that uh, mood court is an underutilized pedagogy is an overstatement. Uh, law schools make phenomenal effort. Now, let me try to get the profession's perspective from Mr. Uh, Lakey here. Uh, do you think uh, mood court is too much mood and less of a court? There is so much of theory in the efforts taken by the law school that it all ultimately becomes academic sophistries and less of practical. It's a devil's advocate question, but just to get the best out of you. No, it's not a devil advocate question at all. Uh, moods simulate life, and so they imitate real world processes. Because they simulate real world processes, the attitudes, capacities, behaviors are supposed to, in some way, endow you to deal with real life situations. Uh, moods train you to, in some way, imbibe those attitudes to distinguish yourself in performance. Uh, I would regard MOOC to be part of liberal education. I mean, I, I don't think there is any dispute about that. Uh, law is not to be teacher's vocation, because law is not teacher's vocation. And it is very closely aligned to life and all issues which make life meaningful. Uh, a lawyer to be useful has to be a complete being. And so the learning space can't only be the classroom. Because the learning space cannot be only, only can only be the classroom. That's the reason why you have an extended space of learning, and that's where the mood courts actually come in. So the learning is no longer passive in the sense a uh, teacher-student one-way relationship. It is uh, not traditionally didactic. It is in some way dialectic. I would not touch the speech to dialectic because there is no dialogue as such. However, the process involves activity in which there is analysis. And once the process involves activity and there's analysis, your mind opens up. And the only way you can succeed as a lawyer is to have an open mind. Because the situations you confront as a lawyer, many times they are not things with which, for which you prepare. Uh, they are issues, they are situations which confront you suddenly and you have to think on your feet. And because you have to think on your feet, your training has to be complete and has to be conceptually sound. So what moods do is students prepare and by reason of the question, which actually comes from the bench at that point of time, they are scrutinized for the understanding of the subject. And law is premised on understanding. And as long as the understanding is there, I think you can uh, sail through this profession with a fair amount of ease. So I don't regard there to be much controversy about the significance of the move. I personally think it's an integral and a very important part of the entire legal education. And it should be, it should be encouraged. But that said, a caveat. Normally, I've seen students who've been good voters come to court extremely confident. And not just confident, almost verging on arrogant. Uh, what, what they must actually remember is that this is still a simulated reality. And the actual reality can be harsher and different. And while you are prepared for it, that doesn't necessarily mean that because you distinguish yourself from the MOOC, you are ready, ready for it. Because you have to actually train yourself further when you actually come to the profession. I think the Professor Gurpur's uh, experiments are uh, phenomenal in that sense that she actually tries to uh, reproduce all the biases in a court. Uh, 
uh, within the simulation she actually created. Uh, would you like to respond to that from Southeach? Otherwise, I have a question uh, from Mr. Absolutely Dada. correct. You know, when you have taken part in voting and all, and if you join litigation, the very first day, you do not feel any sort of uh, hesitation there. You feel very confident. But I don't think voters become arrogant because we are very, very much concerned about their humility, especially participating in an international vote call. Because if someone is not humble in submission, we do not let the student take the part. The question from the other side is that is that is that not an ideal image that everybody is well behaved? You are are you are we not creating? No, no. It, he is correct that it is away from the reality. You know, what scene we have, no, no, actually we have what in uh, Indian courts. No, let me, let me, I will be coming between the two of you because I agree with this view to some degree and uh, I would say that there are exceptions to the Like for example, I have had students who uh, I have always done this analytics and uh, there is a direct correlation in professional success uh, of those students who have moved here. Whether it is in the form of getting a good placement or being identified by a judge to be a clerk or by a very, very reputed lawyer to be a junior. They have, people have been invited and given places, I tell you. My uh, Philip Jessup uh, national finalist through Suranas, she was identified and she was offered clerkship when she finished her everything. So they open up hundreds of avenues of development. And the students who are here, please understand, in Symbiosis Law School, we, for us, I kept that key result there. See, I came from a corporate training background as well. So I kept my uh, area as this. How my product looks, Malcolm Baldwin model of quality. I don't go by only what you have in India in the National Law Commission report and also uh, we have this uh, Matt Bride report and many other reports, especially the Carnegie report. I went into the industrial model, which is Malcolm Baldwin which talks about how my product looks, they should project symbiosis. How do they project? So I created certain parameters. And one parameter is minimum five moods in their life cycle. Bar Council in its rule mandates three moods to be done. But most of the time students write a report in their journal and they submit, either in the final year or in the year when that curriculum comes, because it's a mandate with clinical education. I don't think many have connected as teachers and as deans to the reality of course, we have campus law centers experience where they would have run clinics and things like that, where students, what you say, stretching the mind, it would have happened. But many law schools do, uh, uh, I mean, they think that if I fulfill that norm, that is enough. But some of us, because we are in the market of uh, legal education, we are setting standards very high and competing with the global peers, whether it is Bindal or Symbiosis, our product should be defined with that outlook. So my students who have done five modes, clearly had an edge over others, whether it is judicial exam, whether it is bar council license exam, or whether it is the question of appearing before a law firm for the limited places which are available. So mooting percolated through their personality in terms of those, what I already told, I don't have any hands. I'll give you the example of one particular case study. The boy who got admission to Symbiosis Law School and many national law schools, and rejected those and came to symbiosis. First year, first time when he got top fifth rank, he was not allowed. Because in his house, with his dad's salary, they couldn't afford to send their other child to the school and this guy to an expensive law school like symbiosis. So this boy had to sit at home and wait for some stars to shine. So he did all online courses, possibly every other law university from the world. And what he did, when it came to certificate, he didn't click because he had to pay money online. So this boy, when he came to our college next year through some borrowing, he came. We identified him and then we started getting supports for him. Quickly, if I tell you his story, you'll be surprised. This boy had such a clarity on legal concepts and he had developed his speaking ability so much that by the time he was in the fourth year, he drafted our trial advocacy book from him. And that problem when we sent for peer reference to New Zealand and Oxford, they said, who has drafted this problem? Such is the human capacity in kids, you know. We cannot, we cannot ever undermine anybody right. that. And then, by the time he was in fifth year, he was uh, taken by a law firm. It was, it was a, a personal firm of somebody which was handling international infrastructure projects. He became a project expert, project law expert. Oh, this is actually a classic case of how whole courts can uh, Yes, and he was an academic kind of boy. Yeah. When, when he was sent to research in his second year, Dr. Kiran Bedi's NGO, 
She sent me a personal note that he is a genius in reception. Yeah. So we tapped that to Moot and in the Moot also he was winning Moots of the Moot but he took a back seat. He said there are others who need it. I have spent my one year in studying. They haven't let them study. So he took over the role of a mentor voluntarily. Look at the personality, the way it is. No, no doubt these are very interesting so case studies actually. I don't think we can be. generalize on anything because human beings have the capacity to reach any possible level. No, no, these are the I, I do agree with her. Generally, the motors get a uh, very good placement. No, indeed, indeed. Uh, let, me, let me have a question to Mr. Gada. Uh, so, uh, here, uh, I would like to pick up from uh, where Professor uh, Aldich left about the problem. We all understand that it's a humongous effort actually to draft the problem. Most of the time, the problems are drafted by professors with their own academic biases and with their own academic neutrality. But when they come to draft a mood code problem, they always uh, try to strike a balance, uh, what I would call as a neutral narrative. Because this neutrality is important because both the parties, the respondent or the, the students representing the respondent and the students representing the petitioner, they are supposed to present from both sides. Now the students very clearly know that I have to write from both sides. So when they prepare for the petitioner's side, they are conscious that, well, I have to think from the other side as well. The sense of others, you know, don't you think it completely robes the students of the sensibility of the client? Or in other words, let me ask, don't you think the client is absolutely silent in the mood court? Don't you think they need a representation? That's a fantastic question, uh, Dr. Shijit. So first of all, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for getting me in. Uh, I would like to thank Sorana and Sorana, and specifically Dr. Sorana, and uh, OP Jindal Global University and Jindal Global Law School for arranging this thing, which is very informative. And first and foremost, Dr. Shijit, I would like to react to say that having moot courts in the syllabus or in the curriculum is not a bad idea. It's a good idea. But having said that, uh, I personally believe that mooting is far from reality. Because essentially what we are asking the students to do is prepare their briefs or memorials as you call it right now. Basis a problem statement. So essentially the student doesn't have a feel of the client. The client will talk very differently as against looking at a paper and preparing for a mooting thing. So that's absent. So it is far from reality. And as uh, Mr. Lakey said, it's, it, there is no human touch. The kid would want to prepare, but the way he would prepare for and against in a particular brief, he would lose the sense of reality. Having said that, the problem statement is prepared in a manner which essentially is result oriented. The idea is or idea should be to develop the skill set. The students essentially are driving towards getting a favorable outcome rather than developing a skill set. The way the students prepare themselves, rightly so as mentioned by my fellow panelists, is that they get to create or develop public speaking skills. But the public speaking skills, I don't think so that they develop the way a senior lawyer or a senior advocate as Mr. Lakey would rightly or wrongly agree about it. Public speaking skills are very different. The way the students will address a mood court is different than what really happens or transpires in the courtroom. That is absent. And that essentially results into a lot of overconfidence. Like we as partners of law firms, when we identify a talent, basis a CV which talks about achieving a particular award or winning a particular moot court, that kid, when we ask him that what did you do about this, then he is bang on on the fact pattern and the relevant case law or the relevant law point. But you quiz him about a peripheral answer or question around that particular moot problem, he is lost. And that's a fact. Having said that, uh, there is absence of reality. That's first. Second, as a lawyer, as uh, Mr. Lecky also mentioned, the guy needs to understand commerce as well. So when a student is preparing moot court for the purpose of achieving result, he is not developing the concept of commerce. I'm not against mooting at all. All that I'm trying to put across to this forum is that do we need to go back, reimagine, reinvent the way mooting is happening today? 
the strange accurate formula of uh, two orals one researcher 20 page of memorial when you get a 40 page of problem how do you expect a kid to write a 20 page of memorial is it possible do we need to go back and reimagine and rework around the way the norms the rules that are presently governing the moot courts third problem the way the students are looking at moot courts is purely competition basis i want to win this that's about it and let us talk about the difficulties let us talk about the difficulties around the resources if you see the way the international moot courts are fought or participated by students these are all students coming from fancy law schools national law schools jindal's nirma uh, srm all these fancy law schools now are we trying to put across a point to the next generation that unless you are from a fancy law school which has the resources to participate in moot court your doors to being a litigating lawyer is closed so when there is a lawyer or student or there is a student who is coming from a university from maybe a tier 2 city sir in a tier 2 city he might not be having that kind of fluency in english but at the same time he has the skill set how do we help him develop that skill set because being from a second year law uh, second year city law school he would not have the resources to prep or participate forget international competitions even local competitions do we need to think about it how do we empower students coming from tier 2 cities tier 3 cities and we have a level playing field just before this particular session we were talking about article 14 are we doing justice should we rethink about it should we reimagine should we reinvent no that, that, that is exactly the critical insights which we require actually i'll i'll come to both the academics uh, as no, with the rest i agree with you that moot right. has you know uh, what he says is that it has become stereotype you know like we have legal issues prepare memorials and all that no no that's exactly but, this is a much needed critical perspective and let's continue in this critical vein but i would like to ask mr uh, uh, lekhi here uh, do you uh, agree with this absence of the clients from the moot what can we do actually to bring the client back to the moot court rooms <laughs> no I, i i don't agree with that uh, you see uh, first of all just to clarify when i said that this uh, imitate for simulation i didn't mean it's any way unreal so moots are real it's not as if we are divorced from reality that is the reality is like the socratic allegory of the cave that's the reality the shadow is the reality the person sees it so that is not an issue uh, one moots uh, whatever babar has Uh, marks are very critical, important thing, but I I still feel moots are extremely important. I I do not think that we can ever underestimate the importance of moot court. Number two, every system will have its failings. That doesn't necessarily mean it's not a system. You may improve it. Uh, that said, uh, the presence of the client, now the presence of the client, as 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 a lawyer is concerned, a client has only to present a problem. A client is never in charge of litigation because of the emotive attachment. A client will have the outcome. If the lawyer listens too much, the client or does the client is getting unthinkingly. In that event, the lawyer lawyer will be in some way diverted from his job. So the point is that uh, a moot problem, because it's a simulated reality, confronts a student with the issue the student has to deal with without the involvement of the client. Now you have you need maturity to in some way extricate the client from the equation. So I don't think by by bringing the client in, unless of course you have a very elaborate moot court competition in which you bring in the client, which I don't see that working. So of course, Bhavan and Mark are very important issues. So I, I'll deal with that. So I don't think the client is uh, a client at all necessary. And as far as whatever uh, Bhavan rightly said, there is a bias in favour of English. Now, unfortunately, that's a reality, and because there is a that's a reality, and because we are training students to be lawyers, uh, those who Join this profession have necessary to upgrade the skill set. So mooting helps us improve whatever uh, way in which we express ourselves is important. And finally, when like when I uh, assess mooters, that point of time you are watching them, keeping the court environment in mind. That you you see uh, as a judge, you, have, you imagine yourself as a judge, and you just put yourself in that situation and you visualize the courtroom. 
to see the response of the uh, student concerned, how closely it fits with what an ideal lawyer should be. So, uh, as far as the assessment is concerned, the assessment also judges a person for the person's legal worth. So, all these things put together, I, I think, uh, and the MOOC courts which are being held today are very high quality, and I think they really prepare uh, a person for, for the profession. I mentioned arrogance. The question of arrogance was not, as it was subsequently pointed out, that you don't get jobs. The point is, uh, you are not in this profession only to get jobs. Uh, you Getting jobs is very important, but getting jobs should make you humbler. And the fact that you have certain skill set should actually keep you grounded, so that once you have that state of mind which is in some way balanced, then I think you have got a very long way you can go rather successfully in the profession. I but what I could, what I, what I, could I, gather I would, from I would just like to take a minute and add to Lakey Sir's point here. So, when we are talking about mooting, all the moot quotes are happening in English, rightly so, maybe wrongly so, whatever way. And we need to reinvent. Maybe there seems to be some consensus around it. I am from Mumbai. In Bombay High Court, we have two sides, original side and appellate side. So, the senior counsels or arguing counsels from the appellate side essentially have a great grip on regional language, sir. Because they have a great grip on regional language, uh, at that point in time, I'm talking about seniors, super seniors, who would have been into practice for 30, 40 years. At that point in time, there was never a moot, moot court, competition moots, nothing. Now, in today's situation, the gloss around this moot only in English, while the regional language understanding is required, today also when we have uh, appellate rates, essentially the proceedings are coming from the other courts, the lower courts, where the proceedings are in Marathi. Having said that, the understanding of Marathi, the reading of Marathi, the fluency of Marathi is very relevant. So, when we are talking about reinvention, when we are talking about reimagination, should we also try to bring around moot courts in regional languages? I don't know whether it holds true for other states, but it holds true for my state. Every district court, the work is done in The work is done in vernacular language. And it's very difficult for English medium students to, you know, and law is very difficult in Hindi. If we say, uh, you know, acceptance, it is not just Swikriti, it is Pratikrani. So to understand those terms somewhere, I totally agree with her. We have to ponder over this thing. Because when those files go to high court, they're also going to have a problem. So, uh, in fact, uh, as an academy mission, you sometimes do not understand. My son is a lawyer and he was from English medium. Now he's having lots of problems in Rajasthan. Although he was a good motor, <laughs> because all the fights come in Hindi and Hindi is pretty difficult. I've understood better than anybody because I didn't understand the two terms which uh, <laughs> Professor uh, Daric mentioned. <laughs> So I am from Rajasthan. The takeaway, in fact, from this conversation, uh, especially the points Mr. Leki mentioned, is that law schools can play a big role in exploding the myths about the moot court. That you are not real, you are getting a real feel of the court, but actually there is certain element of artificiality even in a moot court. And of course, the philosophy could be better conveyed uh, by the law schools. Now, you know, I will come back to the two professors in this panel now. By way of a defense to the point that there is too much of absence of the client, moot court doesn't fulfill the real purpose of providing the essential practical experience to the students. Well, uh, from the law school's perspective, you know, we have a modular approach because I also belong to the law school community that they have moot courts, we have trial advocacy, we have client counseling, we have ADR competitions. So we have moot courts through which we teach the art of argumentation. We have client counseling to teach the client lawyer relationship and interaction. We have trial advocacy to teach actually the ambience of the trial court. And we have ADR competitions to teach skills in negotiation and mediation. So perhaps from a law school perspective, moot court is not a Christmas tree to hang every good cause. How would you like to react uh, to this? Uh, uh, Christmas tree is uh, only seasonal. So uh, let me tell you. And uh, unless you create the artificial Christmas tree, you know. So uh, what I would like to say is that uh, I was telling you the story about how I had to intervene in the student bar association. At that time, it was called moot court association. We changed it to bar association. There was one reason, because mooters were becoming demigods and they were becoming a kind of hegemonic influence on the students. So we had to uh, create uh, 
Another thing is, I mean, litigious approach vis-a-vis non-litigious approach to dispute resolution. Also, we have to drill into the minds of students. So with that innovation, we started subcommittees within the Student Bar Association, and they would cater to these specific competitions which were happening. And also, we created a skill matrix for students based on Baltimore and other uh, listings in Australia and other National Skill Council, Canadian. So we created this skill matrix for a particular advocate. We don't have a competency matrix uh, identified scientifically for advocates. So we did a lot of survey, and then based on that, we started synergizing these trainings. So mandatory moot, mandatory client counseling, mandatory mediation, etc. So I must tell you to the earlier uh, responses uh, regarding vernacularization or decentralization of mooting. Uh, Malik Arjun is sitting here. He is uh, conducting national client counseling competition. I have had, uh, uh, when uh, Ravi Chandran was leading Sugana uh, competitions, he started this uh, small town initiatives. So, so Mysore became the hub for mooting. Mangalore students could travel to Mysore and participate in mooting. I am talking about my own state because I have better networking there. And in Maharashtra also we had these uh, networkings through which we saw that local minimum, so many colleges would come. So speaking English and uh, not speaking English, I had the, I mean, I began my career in a small town as a law teacher in a small uh, law school run by a temple. And Dr. Menon came there and he invited me to join National Law School. So talent spotting can happen anywhere. I had a student who came from a very, very rural background, had merit medical seat engineering seat rejected and came to law. You know, at the age of 31, he was a bar council president in Karnataka. And he, family-based legal practitioners, everybody was sidelined by him within five years of joining the profession. I still remember when I presented him for the first moot court competition, he was humiliated by an elite lawyer who was on the panel. And this boy, seven days, he was inconsolably crying. So this can create this attitude and this uh, bias, you know, that can have negative impact also on young minds. Yes. Therefore, we need to manage it as teachers, as organizers, and we need to have focus. I mean, my approach is future centric, student centric. They are our assets, and how we form, in, form them, how we mentor them, is going to be a cumulative responsibility of all stakeholders, including lawyers, judges, and others. So, practitioners, uh, what you call reinvention, the idea of practitioners that uh, this needs to be reinvented, I totally agree. But in that reinvention, can we professors and law school stakeholders alone can do that? No. We need practitioners to be engaged in this. Therefore, when I draft a problem, when I design these skill metrics, my alumni who are in various levels of profession are helping me. I am not able to do that sitting in the cosseted environment as the dean or the director or the law teacher. So I have had this experience That's of exceptions to the rule. I always, you see my GP in my WhatsApp also, I talk about road not taken. So, what is that road not taken? Why do we always see the beaten track and conclude? How do we innovate for this huge uh, young demography of this country? So, this, from this point of view, I would suggest that we need to have the analysis of how our uh, activities are functioning within the college. Let me tell you, Professor Srijit, I was doing an analysis. More than 60% of my moot winners, including global five moots we have won, you know, <coughs> were question on prestige. I agree, it's not prestige but it gives credibility to the student and to the law school and to the teacher because Moot Premier League was always having three national law schools on top. When Symbiosis occupied that position, Symbiosis Law School Pune occupied that position, it was no easy work. Three years of effort went into that, research went into that, strategizing went into that. So when we occupied Moot Premier League, till then we were seen as what Dr. Rajkumar said, the, uh, the kind of caste system. We were seen as other caste. First time they started looking at Simbas Law School Pune when it came Moot Premier League topper. Now that was possible because of consistent work, consistent work. I personally don't believe in any of this. I go with my lawyer friends, but we had to do it to be thriving, to cut this kind of uh, uh, cemented notion you know, that these law schools. Probably are the term pride closely relates to the confidence you talked about. The confidence, credibility, and then giving that uh, sense of. Uh, that as a student, I am prepared for this uh, uh, profession because for me in the profession it's not just being, uh, it's a more of being in public service, a defender of the rights and standing up and talking, that is important for me.
Tomorrow my student for five years may work in a firm because he has to pay for the bank loan or she has to pay for the bank loan. I was coming to the gender dimension. 60% of my moot winners are girls. And there was this notion that if there is a girl in the team, we will win. Students also have their own conclusions, you know. So they will somehow strategically bring girls to the team and they would see that the girl is very uh, presentable and fluent, etc. But then uh, when I saw these girls translating it into judiciary or legal profession, the, in the five years, the outcome wasn't there. So there is a larger so social stereotype also which we have to tackle. Now I applied the analysis to another level. Now I am spending for 190 moots, my representatives go. I had 6 lakh reservation for my moot budget when I took over. Today it is 20, uh, uh, 60 lakhs. You know why I reserved that? And I reduced my library investment from uh, paper-based one into IT uh, so that it could widely reach them anytime, 24 by 7 with the new technology. And I shifted it here. I could send them. Then when I saw the competitors, if you go by a disadvantaged section, Northeastern students and others, they could speak fabulous English, but they are shy. They don't come into this mooting or client counseling exercise. So this kind of uh, analysis of the data and seeing whether it is really percolating across the law school and creating everyone to be capable of standing up for rights. That's my the gender dimension you brought in is very interesting. I would actually uh, uh, request the audience to go through the Surana Coffee Table book where two of my colleagues from Jital Global Law School has written Moot Court's fact sheet. They have talked about how Moot Court's reproduce masculine identities. So I would request you to go through that rather than utilizing this space at the moment because I have another question actually. I would like uh, Professor, uh, 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 Professor Audit also to respond to the Christmas tree analogy. Yes. I'm keen to hear you. In fact, what uh, we have done, wherever I have worked, you know, I introduced mooting in every semester. Because let every student participate. Because sometimes a student has a hidden problem. And when we just hold intra moot and then few students come forward and participate, few students never come to know about their, you know, talent. So we have put moot in every semester. So it's not some synopsis or anything. In that particular subject only, the problem is given and the students have to prepare the moot, uh, memorials from both the sides. And on every Saturday, then we have that mood code, not, not just for inspection only, uh, we have the vibrating mood code hall. Another thing is uh, that what we are talking, I think we must engage industry when it comes to mooting. I remember when uh, I was in Punjab University, all my procedural laws were taught by the lawyers. And they, I, I tell you, just now also, many students here are sitting, when you have to teach CPC in four months, I think it's lawyer is the best person to teach CPC in four months, not an academician. Because that person doesn't know the fine nuances of the, you know, how to finish the syllabus at that. I was taught by Justice Jagdish Kher, uh, Supreme uh, Court Chief Justice retired. He taught evidence and transfer and fabulous, uh, you know, teachers they were, brilliant teachers they were. Now similarly as when we have these uh, mood court competitions also, there are many rounds, you know. There, are, there is prelim round, there is uh, that qualifying round and we are always, you know, the organizers, are at very, you know, difficult is how to call the judges, you know. Now, sometimes you call the people just for the namesake of judges and they are not very well versed in that uh, area. So, if right from the beginning we are getting the lawyers engaged, we have moved now subject also as per the curriculum also. So, we must get the people from industry to be engaged. So that when we are teaching the mooting also, and it's not, mooting is not just, you know, the problem preparing memorials, there should be uh, uh, readings also. How one chief justice, uh, how he had given, and what was the fine points, because you easily come to know what he called about the court craft also. But one thing is there that we are, we have become very stereotyped in our presentation. If we talk about writ petition, in Indian courts what we have, we do not do the same way in the memorials. So somewhere, yeah, somewhere it should be related so that 
what we are teaching through mooting to the student and it should be related with the uh, reality what's happening in the course. Thank you, Professor Saudi. I think let me take that point to pose my last question to all the panelists because we have many eminent uh, lawyers and also academics uh, among the audience will hear their observations. Definitely, Mr. Gara. After that, I'll have my last question after that, but please limit your response to my last question to two minutes per panel. So, uh, just a reaction. I would like to say that as lawyers, practicing lawyers, we will never shy away from coming to a university and training people. So, you would see Mr. Lakey, in spite of his busy schedule, being a super senior, he's here. So, <laughs> All said and done, we can discuss about uh, jurisdictions and venues later point in time. But yes, the bar will always support to go to a university, train the students. And it is in our interest to train the students because these students who will participate into MOOC uh, have reasonable confidence, become lawyers, and essentially practicing lawyers become good judges. Except for practicing judges, uh, you get uh, practicing lawyers who would become good judges, yes, I am not shying away from the fact that yes, people who clear judicials and they become good judges, rightly so. But a practicing lawyer who has been into practice, has run trials, has done rates, has understands original, civil, criminal, admiralty, tax, all these kind of jurisdiction, that kind of a practicing lawyer becomes an amazing judge in my limited experience, I would, I would like to say. I think this can also be a combined effort that the practice which the lawyer will teach in the classroom could also be theorized by the lawyer. So thereby we can create that uh, essential cliche theory of practice GCDs symbiosis. GCA is also suggested. Yes, yes. So my last question actually, uh, which also brings back uh, that, that gender element which I found, uh, which I found uh, before the previous question. So here, uh, we know that there is so much of formalism attached to the moot court, as Mr. Gada has rightly mentioned, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, uh, rebuttals, responses. So we, we know that there's so much of formalism attached to the moot court. Moreover, moot court is, is too positivistic that we witness the reproduction of orthodoxy every time in the moot court. Now we live in a time when, you know, there has been a grand collapse. And after the grand fall, it's time of reinvention every, re everywhere. And uh, we have understood that the center and the periphery were just images. So heterodoxy has began to make sense in a never before manner in today's world. And it's, it's looking forward for a representation. Do you agree that mood codes uh, reproduce, uh, reproduce uh, orthodoxy? If so, how can we create a space in the mood code by reimagination so that heterodoxy finds its place there? By heterodoxy, I mean all the marginalized voices. Uh, let me go from Mr. Uh, there is some degree of stereotyping. I agree to that. Uh, I'm not trying away from that. But essentially, our job in today's society, holding the fort or being the front runners, we have an opportunity to correct it, right? So ideally, it begins at home. All the corrections begin at home. So I don't know how to do it, but this can be done. How to address the stereotyping and all the social problems and all the inequality that we are talking about whatever the female male problems that we are talking about all these things can be corrected with such huge budgets can't we bring in some specific rules and norms to say that a team of three will comprise of at least one girl who is going to be the speaker why can't we say that why are we shying away from that there are super senior female councils at supreme court at delhi high court at bombay high court we can train the female students around it. The only concept is that right now, the focus of the university with due respect is to win trophies. The idea is to win trophies, put it on the prospectus on the website, we have won so and so, we have done so and so, we have participated here, three teams went there. But what is the underlying concept that is missing? So uh, I would like to read out a statement, uh, or rather this German philosopher, Frederick Nights. He had written, along the journey we commonly forget its goal. Almost every vocation is chosen and entered upon as a means to a purpose, but is ultimately continued as a final purpose in itself. Forgetting our objective is the most frequent stupidity which we indulge ourselves. 
Actually, Mr. Gada, there could also be another perspective that winning is not right. Winning is also the best learner. It's the award for the one who has learned the process, has 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 maximized the learning. And as a student, uh, as a student, you really look forward to that. Losing, uh, me losing means you need to improve your learning. I would take thirty seconds to relate to that. As a practicing lawyer, are you going to tell the kids that as a practicing lawyer you need to have a hundred percent score? I don't think so. You're pushing that student into depression. Day zero. Day zero. So this brings us back to that first argument, you know, the pedagogic element within the moot court. That somewhere we forget. Anyway, uh, Professor, uh, I, I just have a slightly addition to this question. Definitely the question stacks. Just an addition that the problem is not just with the form, but also with the substance. That there are certain materials, I will use a term by Professor Perry Schlag here, legally cognizable material. Some knowledge, or rather some knowledge, if I may be permitted to use the plural, are not acceptable in moot court. And that knowledge may be the knowledge from the periphery, from the heterodoxy. Could you please respond yeah, to this question? First thing is, you know, most of the moot problems are in international law. So I think somewhere we have to, yeah, many. Many are, uh, if you just go through the different competitions, generally they are in international law. And that is where when I was talking earlier also, because most of the lawyers are not very well versed in international law. So sometimes you call the judges, they are just sitting silently there, they do not even ask questions. So the teams are very unsatisfied, you know. So on the basis of memorial only, they judge. Now, another thing is what, uh, you know, we were talking about uh, masculinity. It, it's, it's there. You know, I remember once I had called a female lawyer to be a judge in my moot court competition. So when it came to ranking, uh, all the female students got the first turn, 10 ranking. So that biasedness somewhere, I think, but now it is slightly getting outdated now because when the girls have become so assertive, so and uh, they really believe in equality and they have come forward. I mean, earlier most of the females were confined. I remember when I really wanted to join litigation when I uh, was in Jaipur, but I was dissuaded by everyone that there the people do not have much faith in female uh, lawyers. So I had to join teaching. Of course, I enjoy teaching also now. Uh, but the thing is that that uh, we have come out of that now. There, the equality, wherever now we go, I, but you know, in Supreme Court also, when we see very few female judges are there. So somewhere, the through mooting also, we can, I remember when once I had called Rajasthan, I coached Justice Sabina. In the semi-final, all the girls were there. And naturally the final was won by, uh, there is one uh, near Jaipur, Banasthali, you know, which is away from the city. There is no court, there are nothing. The girls had immense knowledge in the subject, their oratory skills, their dexterity, their cleverness, everything was excellent. So we have come out of that. But somewhere, of course, the uh, typical which we have form of uh, voting, we have to change that. Social problems, yeah, somewhere. Well, and one of the fantastic experiments here is the moot by uh, McGill University, the Shakespeare moot. Yes. Whereby you have to apply hard, Dorkin and Bentham in the light of the Shakespearean uh, yes. sociality and morality. Yes. That's a great experiment. Yes. So somewhere in India also, and moreover what I said that uh, when we come to the memorials also, it's very stereotyped. So once we have the repetition in the court, how it is prepared. So somewhere if we get that also in the voting, you know, that will be really beneficial. Thank you. Mr. Uh, so Lekhi, let me slightly rephrase that question to you. Is there a space for critique in the courtrooms? If so, certainly there is a space for critique in the moot rooms as well. Please so there is definitely shape uh, place for critique in the uh, courtroom, but critique requires character, and uh, there is not much place for character, unfortunately, because it won't stand up to be counted. What is actually important is that as far as moves are concerned, they should in some way embellish this particular quality. Uh, I do not think, as one of, uh, as Bhavan also said, that we have to limit it to have quotas or reserve particular posts for girls or boys in this diversity thing. Merit has to be some criteria. As far as dealing with the issues which engage us, should engage us, but uh, push the periphery because they don't have adequate voice, I think the method to deal with it is crafting the problems 
in a particular way so as to bring them to focus. And while doing that, I think we should also move away from the manner of the choice we make in bringing judges. So if you want to make a point and in fact give voice to a particular view or give voice to a particular ideology or give preference to a particular, a particular part of society, you can bring as a judge a person belonging to that particular uh, ideology or section because uh, uh, a mindset would be then challenged because the judgment would be rendered by those who would not necessarily be in the forefront in the public imagination. So that will reinvent our thought process in which we we'll submit ourselves to the jurisdiction of those who are otherwise uh, relegated to the periphery. That will be a, a way to go about it and moot is not the only crucible in which we will put all, to find solution to all the problems and I firstly feel the very important issue to raise, this is a larger societal issue. Uh, but which the moot court would be actually reflecting it, but to consider moot as a method to solve it uh, is not accepted, of course, by drafting problems or uh, or having uh, having judges of that niche. Certainly, there has to be an incremental approach to that. Uh, Professor Pukul, let me try to be a little bit more specific with that question. What if I demonstrated a doctrinal inconsistency before the judge in a moot court using the methods and materials of critical legal studies? Do you think there will be acceptability for that? Judge will have to come uh, reading it. So, Purana has always provided reading list to the judge and they keep the but That comes to Mr. Lakey's point that we need yeah. a larger reorientation. Yeah. Right? There should yeah. be an empathy on the part And also, the panel also. should be representative of women as well, mandatorily, or in the classes that we talk That's about. That's exactly what I'm saying. If a female lawyer is willing to re narrate the story from, a, from the lived experience of a woman, yeah. would it receive a good reception from the, uh, from the bench or not? So we have to pick the bench also with that, I mean, even if the bench may have bias, we, there is nothing wrong in providing them the reading list. That's what we do. Uh, a, a very well-organized mood will have its reference uh, and uh, judge orientation, etc. done, right? Pritam, you are organizing those competitions and we do that. I mean, we are very strict on that. We conduct our own mood, which is, which is having different terms of representation. So what, what I'm uh, trying to highlight here in response to your reimagining, two responses. One is that I would say that when an expert committee drafts the problem, whether it was client counsel in which I was having the opportunity to be a panelist when Malik was in hell, it was on love jihad, not an easy topic. And I had a very radical uh, team member who was atheist and who came from a, a former experience of being in the Marxist movement. It wasn't easy to uh, judge in that case and the kind of questions which are asked to young students. You know, we, I had to moderate those as another judge. So many times you have to play these uh, things as a teacher and as a panelist, what we call as unlearning. It's very important for the judging people also. And another thing is relearning. What uh, Dr. Menon, uh, he, was, he was always talking about this unlearning and relearning. Let me put before you in reimagining sense or reimagining sense one point. That now in 2019, some of us, Lord, Lord Ains came to Vinod, who is also part of that uh, conclave in Ori Search, the last achievement of Dr. Menon before he expired. We bring, brought out a uh, skill matrix, and in that, we had uh, different kind of skills uh, to be aligned with the curriculum as separate courses. So within that, we could have activities like moods, mocks, client counseling, simulation of different types bringing live clients to the class, etc. of course, with all ethical compliances. So this is believed to be decreasing the gap between profession and classroom. So this profession readiness, he used to say practice readiness. I wouldn't use the word practice all the time because court is a stage to 10% of the issues, 90% are hanging out in the society to be prevented or handled in a different way, in a non-court-centric way with the population and evolution that we are having as a nation. So with that, uh, another point I would like to tell this uh, panel uh, through you, the moderator, is that, uh, you know, when we are looking at uh, reform and transformative uh, experience here, it only begins with mooting. Mooting needs to be, or our student bar association needs to be synergizing with our other activities. Therefore, co-curricular is not just a kind of uh, cosmetic measure. Co-curricular means how well, for example, uh, Advocate Lakey or Advocate Gada would come to my college and they would try to tell what are good advocacy skills. Attending that lecture also should be an assessment. Asking a good question should be part of the assessment. So co-curricular is not simply. Then we would have said extracurricular. If we say co-curricular, then it has to be correlated with the curriculum. No? 
Uh, that needs innovation and seriousness on the part of academic leadership in the institute and the collaboration and the cooperation of the faculty and innovation in how we are going to yes. see it as transferable, uh, transformative experience in the student who is the future and who is the main stakeholder. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gurpur. Uh, I wish I was not a moderator to this discussion <laughs> because here as a moderator, my adrenaline level goes high because I have to look at the time every time ensure that there's brevity in what I speak and what I get from this brilliant minds. But my apologies to all of them because they have absolutely amazing, fantastic ideas, which unfortunately I could not get uh, get out within this limited time. That's why Professor Raj had agreed, but I just have this wish that I was not a moderator for this session. But that said, they, they played a great role. Uh, the questions which I asked out of my student-like enthusiasm, they have given a certain profundity to, to, to my questions through their responses. So thank you very much to all of you, Professor Gurpur, Mr. Lehi, Professor Avdich, and Professor, and Mr. Uh, uh. Congratulations to Surana and Surana for completion of uh, 25 years of glorious journey in contributing to capacity building in the field of uh, legal education and for uh, all their successful acti activities uh, in the field of food court competitions. So my name is uh, Shridhar Patnaik Dabiru. I am uh, uh, the professor and also the registrar of uh, OP Jinder Global University. And uh, I will be moderating the session on uh, legal education, which I'm sure is going to garner a lot of uh, attention, interest, and uh, debates uh, as well. Uh, I am joined by a distinguished panel uh, comprising of uh, Honorable Justice uh, Gita Mittal, uh, who was uh, formerly uh, the Chief Justice of Jammu and uh, Kashmir uh, High Court and former Judge uh, Delhi High Court. Uh, we also have with us uh, Mr. Manish uh, Singhvi, uh, who is Senior Advocate, Supreme Court of India. And we are also joined by uh, two uh, educators, uh, uh, Professor D.K. Bandhopadhyay, uh, who is from the uh, Amity Law School, and uh, Professor uh, Nusrat Parveen Khan, uh, Dean of Law, uh, Bennett University School of Law. So uh, this particular session is going to be uh, focusing on legal education, as I had mentioned. And I could see uh, eminent educators uh, here uh, in the room and also uh, practitioners of law and students of law and as uh, we all would uh, know and degree uh, there are uh, so many uh, exogenous factors and uh, endogenous factors uh, that affected uh, and continue to affect the field of uh, uh, legal education in India uh, when we talk about certain inter internal factors uh, there are as many as over uh, 1,000 law colleges uh, in the country and uh, it's not to uh, say that all the law schools enjoy uh, similar kind of facilities uh, be it infrastructure or be it faculty or uh, be it any other curricular support uh, that is required and also there are uh, external factors uh, that are impacting legal education in the current day uh, due to uh, the globalized world uh, that we live in. So it's so very important to understand uh, how legal education uh, should be sort of conducted and how do we even understand uh, legal education per se, whether we treat it as a discipline or whether we treat it as uh, a sort of a trade. And uh, these questions are certainly very important uh, because these questions are going to give us uh, a method or a process uh, to approach law and the study of law and uh, to add to all the existing challenges uh, that we have uh, in the country uh, the pandemic again uh, brought in a new set of uh, challenges erstwhile what we were thinking as uh, something which is uh, complementary or uh, a sort of a, a supporting mechanism uh, be it invoking uh, the uh, virtual learning or even invoking any sort of uh, technology based uh, uh, platforms for uh, asynchronous learning so on and so forth uh, it has now become uh, the primary site of activity and also it made us sort of uh, revisit uh, the origins of the foundations of law as well as uh, even the functioning of uh, uh, law schools so on this uh, 
uh, parameters or the set of parameters, uh, it's important for all, us, uh, all of us uh, to examine uh, how legal education uh, could be and ought to be and how we need to sort of revisit our curriculum, uh, train our students and even what kind of faculty members or law teachers uh, that uh, we might require and uh, this panel will examine some of these uh, uh, fundamental yet uh, very important uh, questions uh, uh, starting from uh, the education point of view and then transitioning towards the uh, future in a way uh, what kind of law graduates uh, law schools ought to produce and what those law grad uh, graduates are going to do uh, in terms of their uh, uh, vocation or profession or the career choices that uh, they might uh, take up. Uh, since we have a distinguished panel and the uh, time we have uh, is very limited, uh, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to raise uh, a set of questions and then I would request our panelists to uh, respond uh, to those questions uh, in a quick time. And to uh, start off, uh, uh, the first question that I would like to ask our panelists is, uh, when we return to this very idea of the law school in a pandemic driven uh, situation and all the functions which uh, law school ought to take up, uh, be it teaching, learning, uh, writing, thinking and speaking, uh, what type of the discoveries uh, uh, do you think that would be essential uh, for rebuilding legal education uh, in the post pandemic world? And uh, I will start off by asking this question to uh, Professor uh, Nusrat Parveen Khan and then we are going to uh, uh, go to the other, other panelists. Uh, over to you, uh, Professor Khan. Thank you. Yeah, so talking about uh, pandemic and then the education, actually, uh, when we talking about pandemic, uh, basically the major shift was with regard to uh, uh, online teaching and uh, the challenges. Uh, but what I understand since uh, one pandemic occurred, I was in a government university and uh, many of the students uh, who were stuck in their homes and uh, in their villages, they were not having accessibility to the, you know, net connectivity. And there was lots of health with regard to their education. But on the other hand, if we talk of, uh, you know, uh, access to education, uh, especially in the context of the development which are happening globally, even before the pandemic, uh, the switch over to different type of modules for education, MOOCs we were talking about. We were talking about lots of e-learning. In fact, uh, if uh, Professor Bajpayee is there much before pandemic, we were developing e-course content for the UGC e Shala. So there was a type of, uh, you know, uh, and the new education policy, which we have, which I think uh, probably was conceived uh, much before the pandemic, uh, 2019, and we call it NEP 2020. But NEP 2020 is talking about internationalization of education, globalization of education. It is talking about students, uh, you know, to, to, to be prepared, uh, not only in the context of their own nation, the education should be such that they can, so for that, what is required is employability skills, which I feel generally is missing in our curricula. And the more focus should be industry focused employability skills from the school level itself, uh, which requires lots of, uh, you know, revamping of the curriculums, revamping of their uh, course structures. And when we come to it, uh, I have noticed since right now, as you see, I've been working with the Venice University, which is a Times of India private university. And when we look at the bridges and the gaps which are there between you know, a government university and a private university in the context of facilitation, in the context of openness, in the context of you know uh, uh, the teachers, the hiring of the teachers, type of teachers, the students, and the facilitation. So there are gaps actually. There are larger gaps. And also with regard to the regulators of the legal education. Uh, in our country, there is lots of, uh, I mean, on the one hand, we talk of globalization uh, and the flexibility in the learning. But on the other hand, 
we are regulated at multiple levels, Bar Council of India, UGC, high courts, and at times if a school is a university, I mean a school is recognized by a particular university, the rules of that university, so all that hampers. So what I feel is that uh, uh, the education is not same for all. The education is varying for different groups. And this is a very negative picture. This is what I say. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Khan, for uh, focusing on the asymmetries uh, that are involved. And as we proceed further and we discuss, uh, we will also try to sort of uh, reflect on some of the points that you had raised. Uh, but now I would request uh, Professor D.K. Bandopadhyay uh, to uh, sort of uh, focus on the question that I had raised as to what kind of discoveries are needed in a post-pandemic world. Of course, uh, post-pandemic, it sounds good when we say that, although it is still not the situation, but the way pandemic has affected all of us, and even education and legal education per se, uh, what measures one should take up uh, to ensure that uh, legal education continues to be important and uh, is fundamental for organizing the society. I have totally a different uh, perspective of legal education. Uh, let me first introduce myself. I am a management professional, spending 25 years uh, reaching to the level of director at IIM Lucknow, becoming the vice chancellor of Indatrust University, and did my PhD in such an area where law and management were binded together and submitted my thesis from the grand recall, uh, one of the grand recall of the banks. Having said so, I feel that the legal education, whether it is pandemic or non pandemic, it demands a paradigm, paradigm shift, totally paradigm shift. It must get out of the clutches of the Bar Council of India. Bar Council of India, if you just look at it, hardly any academicians are involved with the Bar Council of India. No academicians are being over there. What are the syllabuses? What are the curriculum they are gui guiding and suggesting? I do not know. Now, second point that I would like to mention over there, when there is a technological disruption, the first generation of technological disruption of the boiler engine was discovered in the 17th, 18th century, then a whole lot of education came up in terms of you know, changing the muscles power to the engine power. The second generation, uh, you know, when it came, the disruptions came, when there is a production technology, X-ray, antibiotics, and then it created a plethora of opportunity for every bit of education. If you just look at the education institutions that got established across the world, that was the time they got established too. All the Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, so on, every great education institution got established in that field to provide the manpower to serve the society, to serve the industry, to serve the uh, mankind. And side by side, the legal education became very, very important to those perspectives that how do you provide or how do you give justice uh, to the people. Now, when the third uh, disruption took place, when the computing technology came, and fourth generation when we talk about, that have also created lots of, you know, plethora of opportunity, automation, other things. Fourth generation <coughs> technology disruption when it came, it affected every aspect of life, every aspect of education, including law education, and majorly the law education. But we are not able to keep space with that technological disruptions. The first uh, thing that you know it happened: all computer technology, communication technology, software technology, they got merged together, created a the possibility of virtual reality and augmented reality. That's how we are able to manage the teaching learning processes to some extent during the pandemic period. And most of the law schools are able to shift from their normal uh, classroom type of uh, the situation. It went to uh, the you know, virtual mode of education, including the competition. Client counseling competition, moot court competitions, then ADR competition, every competition they started also doing it, every activity based competition they started doing. And when we see that further the artificial intelligence and the machine learning has come, 
education has become, law education has become very, very difficult way to progress to. And our curriculum does not provide that facility. Curriculum does not give us the facility. And then we are not able to bring different dimensions of those technology into our curriculum so that our future generation, future lawyers, future judges are going to be acquainted with the stuff technology. Many of the jobs are going to be automated. Many of the jobs are going to be automated, which are being taken care of by the lawyers of today. They are going to take care of somebody. But those lawyers are to train how those type of technology needs to be used, how those type of technology interpretation can be made to use. So our curriculum demands lots of paradigm shift. And their liberal arts are to be brought in a much better way. Because NEP 2020 is also talking about multidisciplinarity. Why law education other than, um, uh, you know, Boxiji's and Menon Saab's integrated five years program during, you know, late 80s. After that, we are exactly following the same way. Bar Council is said there are only 24 courses, compulsory courses have to be taught. And nine courses of the other discipline to be taught. But I feel that there is a need for, you know, technology courses to be much more in the law, uh, in law education, liberal arts courses to be put into better law education, and so on and so forth. So at this stage, I stop here. Thank you so much, uh, Professor V.K. Bandhupadhyay. Uh, Mr. Manish. Actually, we are, we basically it was a digital divide. People who have access have not haves and have nots. Though this fight between haves and have nots is as long as I think the civilization. They will be haves, digital haves and digital have nots. But I must tell you one thing. What digital has done is remarkable. We were all talking about access to justice. I think this all ICT as we call them, this convergence of internet and communications, every person who wants and who is diligent enough can have access to knowledge. It is virtually at your palm. There may be digital divide, I do not deny this, but even people living in small towns were not having access to the kind of knowledge we are having today. And we must acknowledge that this pandemic has only accelerated that process. I may tell you if you wanted to research, in, our, in my time, I joined in 92 and Honorable Chief Justice will, I think, concur. she must have joined prior to me, that we had to virtually take out books after having steps in our library of our seniors. Which book? Because book used to be in the top of the ceiling, take out that book and then start research. And now it is on the click of the mouse. So I feel that legal education has come up to the fore. In the click of the mouse, we are having everything. Now the point which arrives is, that how to use, leverage this technological disruption or technological advantage, advantage for legal education. We had this open distance learning in 1980s, open education universities. I think this has given a lot of leverage, lot of leeway. Now we can teach on basis of, through online courses, online modules. I think modules would be better than courses. Suppose I want to know a domain expertise called IPR. There has to be designed in a such a manner that even education doesn't mean that a student and a teacher. I mean education for all, even as a lawyer today, even as a judge today, we want to learn. Whosoever wants to learn must be educated. How do we get education? We can get educated when modules are prepared. Suppose I want to have access to an IPR problem. There must be modules which are available, apps which are available, so that we can have access. It is not that a teacher coming to the college or a a student coming to the college is legal education is all about. And legal education is for every member of the society. And I must tell you one thing, sir. Legal education also means awareness of our legal rights. And tremendous work is being done under our legal aid, NALSA, and I think Jita Madam would be able to tell us better. Tremendous work is being done to educate masses about their rights. This is also legal education. So legal education has to go beyond college, it has to go beyond student and uh, coming to the classroom or the teacher. And one more thing, that is why I believe that this digital disruption which has taken place, 
we can have more access to knowledge, we have more access to legal awareness and more education to legal education for the masses and not only meant for teachers or the students alone. Thank you. Over to you. First of all, my congratulations to Surana and O.P. Jindal for organizing this, con con this mood court and this program today. And uh, my namaskar to very, very learned vice chancellors in the audience. I recognize three of them. All my learnings come from them. So for me to be talking about future of legal audio education, you know, is, is uh, totally embarrassing. And by giving to the young children, you must be so happy to get a chance to sit in a room like this, finally, after two and a half years. So just a brief word, I am not the person to educate on legal education or talk about its future. But I want to tell you about my share, my experience with legal education during the two years of the pandemic. I happened to be in the Jammu and Kashmir there. And I happened also to be invited by friends like Ved, by you know, Professor Vajpayee, I see Shashi Kalaji is here, and uh, Raj, Professor Raj Kumar, provided several programs with him. And my sense of the anxiety in law students because of the pandemic is like anxiety as not known to a student of any other discipline. They were paranoid about what is going to happen to them when the, uh, when, you know, the lockdowns get over, restrictions ease. And where will they stand? What is the chance? See, we were getting stories of, about young lawyers suffering so much. You know, there were so many cases of suicides, apart from COVID deaths, but mostly because of the lack of work and the lack of opportunity. And uh, this made me think as to what we I can do. Internships were closed. Law researcherships were closed. Nobody was permitting access. Judges were not permitting access to law students or lawyers. You know, the courts were run, running remotely. So what, what, what internships could the law students do? Law offices were closed. And that is when I honed in on an idea. Now students in the rest of the country get much more opportunity than children from Jammu and Kashmir do for several reasons, which I don't need to get into here. So I, it, it struck me that I should, should start a program of an internship for the children of Jammu and Kashmir. Now I had to post this online even to tell those children we were doing that. But what came as a response was overwhelming. It was touching beyond words. I got applications from over 300 students. I, we were only seven judges. And up 267 applications from Kashmir to Kanyakumari from you know, Gujarat, from Kutch to the Myanmar border. There was no university you know, we were, they were, whose children, whose students had not applied to us. All the national law universities, Guwahati Law University, Nirma University, Symbiosis, we had children from every sphere wanting, they were so starved of opportunities, you know. And that is when I realized that how important availability of an opportunity, a meaningful opportunity to children is. Now, 267 children, if it, it would have been about 30, 40, 50 from Kashmir, it was easy to handle. You know, I could have enabled them to come back, access to the judges, you know, they would sit in courtrooms and read files. But I can't send court files or make my, uh, you know, soft copies available to a student sitting in Bangalore or Nadia Kumari or in Guwahati. So I had to think of what to do. Then I reached out and we designed a program where we did internships in subject, subjects, you know, specialist, specialities. Now what was important to law students was, what does law practice mean? What does an internship teach them? It's about how a practice in a particular field evolves. What do you do in a law office? You know, what are the questions which arise? How do you look at a court file? So I started speaking to experts and I got wonderful response, resource persons from the best in the country. My practice in corporate affairs, you know, I had Nishit Desai represented, I had Amartan Shroff, senior, senior colleagues from there, lawyers from there appearing, uh, who addressed uh, those panels. I appointed young people who were moderator, young lawyers in the field specialists. The constitutional law panel was uh, done by Mr. Parag Tripathi, Sham Devan, and their wives. Neelima Tripathi was there, and uh, 
um, Sham's wife was there, you know. So and uh, the response was overwhelming. So this yeah, and it was almost a year-long program, but it couldn't end at this. The children, the students had still not seen the courts. That's what internships and law researchships are most about and most precious. Now I was also I'm also Jammu and Kashmir High Court is very start of infrastructure, but they had to see the courts. So then we filmed the courts for them, the trial courts. We did walkthroughs and took children through these walkthroughs. I did interactions with children, all these 267 children from across the country. You know, they still write to me. They want to come and work with me. I don't know what work I can give after I'm retired. But you know, and I, I was engaging with children in Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, and uh, I learned a lot from their experiences. But more, so far as this question is concerned, what is was most disconcerting was that we did not do anything for the children. You know, we let them go through this anxiety without even talking to them, you know, maybe counseling them, provide, telling them what we could help them with, what they could do once the restrictions eased. The, you know, they had to know what kind of opportunities are there. You don't only have a law practice, you don't only have to do a corporate law practice. You know, there's so many other fields where a law degree will, specialization in law enables a job opportunity, a livelihood option to you is. So my first request, you know, the future of law was never, never dim. Uh, it's the sky is the limit if you got a degree of law. I tell everybody, whether you're an engineer, whether you're a doctor, whether you're a chartered accountant, you must do law. You know, they ask me whatever for. I said, you, I don't know, but it will help you certainly sometime in your life, you know. So law is the ultimate, you know. It teaches you, you know, it skills you, it equips you for living. And it certainly provides you a law option. And law practice, certainly we must. So future of the law, of law is not dim. Now, there are law schools mushrooming. We are, you know, we've got law graduates by thousands every year. And, uh, if, uh, you know, yet courts are still needing the room for good lawyers all the time. So, uh, you know, what we must look at is ensuring that, uh, you know, the future of law will be very good if we are able to look at, take an audit of what are the opportunities which a law education can provide and provide these kind of linkages for the law students. The second thing which is of great concern, everybody has spoken about this, digital um, inclusion. You know, this is, uh, to my mind, the most traumatic experience that children from marginalized communities especially went through. In Jammu and Kashmir, there was also lack of access to the internet. You know, we were on 2G for the, the entire period of the lockdown. But digital exclusion is was a catastrophe for children who could not afford the equipment required to access the classes or material or whatever was being put out at law schools. So we must enable digital inclusion and we must also equip children as has been said, which is, uh, you know, said by uh, Professor Bandhapadhyay, I think you said this, that you must equip the children how to use the uh, digital formats. You see, I'm not very techno savvy, so um, I know how difficult it is and ultimately it's going to be the very, very difficult unless you're able to engage with technology. But we must teach our children and uh, the future with law schools like OP Jindal, with Bennett, with National Law Universities. With Anitri. With Anitri. Maybe you're the most popular in law university in Delhi. Respected Dr. Vikas Singh, senior advocate, president of the Supreme Court Bar, learned advocates from the Delhi region senior faculty members, heads of institutions, <coughs> law, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure for me to propose a hearty vote of thanks. I know I am standing between you and dinner. Today is Saturday evening. But I want to take this opportunity to quickly thank 
each one of our partner law schools with whom we have worked in the last 25 years without their contribution without their partnership this journey could not have been possible so a big thank you to each one of our partner institutions jindal global law school was very kind enough to partner with us for this event dr rajkumar said surana and surana and jindal law school have a common thread binding each other and that is the thread of public service very enthusiastically he came forward his entire team there are several people from the jindal side who have worked to make this program a success i have worked with dr srijit mr gaurav shukla aman aman is here there are so many people from the jindal side who worked day and night for the last more than a month to make this happen today is a working day for the jindal law school and in spite of that they have put in extra efforts to make this happen so thank you very much i will take one step back when i mentioned the partner law schools i did not mean just the heads of the institution i also meant the faculty members and more importantly so many student volunteers from each law school who work day and night they would get up at 4 in the morning to go to the station to pick up teams people falling sick people forgetting oh sorry uh, people not being able to download their files get them printed they did all kinds of assistance to the participating teams and that is how the whole momentum built up for 25 years we have had absolute support from the surana and surana academic initiatives advisory board headed by mr pali nariman who is our patron we have stalwarts like mr kps tulsi mr abhishek manu singhvi mr kk venugopal we had late mr ramjet plani on our board we have had more than 18 to 20 vice chancellors of national law schools over the years lawyers from different countries at different points of time we went to them seeking advice seeking help in opening doors to invite guests seeking help to guide teams in different parts of the country and i can tell you without exception the promptness with which they came forward to help is something amazing so a big thank you to the academic advisory board i have colleagues of mine who have come here from chennai i have colleagues who are here from the surana and surana delhi office they have been a pillar of support silently working in the background a big thank you to all my team members from surana and surana thank you i did mention in the morning that without the unflinching support material moral as well as the hundreds and thousands of hours of personal involvement of both our founder partners mr ps surana and mrs dilak surana we could not have dreamt of this
between them, the division of work is very clear. Between them, when I say, it is the founders and all my practice heads. They do all the hard work and I get to spend all the money. <laughs> <laughs> Jokes apart, I mean, a very big thank you. Over the years, I have had great support from various media players who are supporting the legal profession. Like today, our partners are Manupatra and Live Law. Manupatra started working with us in the year 2001 when they started giving prizes in terms of books, in terms of uh, access to the databases free of cost for the participating students. That also went a long way in helping us, helping our students improve the quality of the research and submissions. We have worked with Live Law, we have worked with Manupatra, we have worked over the years with uh, Loptopus, uh, Lawyer, and so many others. So a big thank you to all our partners for supporting us in legal research, in disseminating information about our competitions, etc. Thank you. forwards. <laughs> I know this uh, final, this validity ceremony, this uh, is a little rushed and we got a last minute message that Justice Sikri is stuck, not able to reach here before 8 o'clock and we, in our enthusiasm to fast forward the program, we missed out the most important part of the program which is we wanted, we had on our list a few words of blessings and guidance from Dr. Vikas Singh. So, of the Sorana and Sorana firm, various academic people present here, law students also present here, ladies and gentlemen. My association with Sorana and Sorana is about 15-16 years old. When I went as a chief guest in one of the moot court competitions at ILI Pune, when I was the additional Solicitor General of India in 2006, mooting I have found is a very important way of giving practical experience to budding lawyers before they actually enter into the profession. But before I dwell more on mooting, I must tell you what our experience was, or rather my experience was as a lawyer, because in our time there was no moot. In our time, I passed out in 1983 from Campus Law Center, so, and out of the three years of my legal course, I could not attend classes for, for a very long period of time, because I also had a job, I worked for nine years in Steel Authority. I was marketing steel for nine years, it's nothing to do with law. Joined as a lawyer in the year 1990. And before actually resigning, I came to Supreme Court and I thought, let me just see whether I can fit into this profession or not. Whether, whether I've been too, too far away for a very long time to be able to come back to this profession because I was doing nothing to do with law. I was only selling steel. 
So I took a six months break. I had leave enough leave available with me. I took a six month break, came here during my leave. <laughs> tried to do a lot of research. I really enjoyed that work. I remember the Kashi Vishwanath Temple takeover was being handled by the person with whom I came to join, Mr. L. R. Singh, my first senior. And there was uh, a vacation where I went to Patna to my village. And I carried all the books, all the judgments on Article 25 26, which were dealing with fundamental rights to the religious institutions. Each judgment was maybe 200, 300 pages, all constitution meant judgments. So I came back with the entire volume of research and I told my senior, and then he used to take me to the briefings. I was not a lawyer then. But he gave me the upper hand in the briefing because he said the kind of research he has done. So let him brief the senior. Mr. P. P. Rao was the senior who used to brief. I got a lot of confidence that I can probably get into this profession. So I finally resigned a couple of months later. And it was sometime in June that I got registered in 1990 in Patna. And I came straight away to Supreme Court to start practice. The courts were to reopen after recess, I think first week of July, some date, I don't remember the exact date, maybe 5th or 6th July of that year. So I told my senior that as a child, I tried elocution once in the 4th or the 5th standard. And I remember my legs were shaking. So now that I've already resigned, what do I do? I mean, with the, will, I, will I be able to practice? Will I be able to argue? Will I be able to stand up and, and address a court? So I think the probably the harshest way to teach was taken by my senior. On the very first day of the opening of the Supreme Court, he gave me three briefs to argue. First day of my career as a lawyer, first day in court, and he gave me three briefs to argue. And I remember the first case I argued, it was before Justice Venkat Chaliya. So I was since in an organization working, I was calling him sir, I kept on arguing sir, sir, whatever I had to say, I kept on saying. He did not agree with me. He also said, sorry, sir, and that was fine. <laughs> so I said, sir, I have to say something else. I have to say something more. He said, I'm so sorry, sir. He picked up the file again. He heard me very patiently. Then again, after five, seven minutes, he said, sorry, sir, sorry, sir. And then he threw the file. I mean, he dismissed the matter. My senior was standing at the back. He said, why were you calling him sir? This is not done in our profession. I said, I, I actually, this is my first day. So I still had not got to the, the concept of calling my lords, etc. But that is the kind of mooting I got, uh, the experience of mooting I got as a, <laughs> as a lawyer straight away in court. But I feel that uh, this is a great way to, you know, uh, at least uh, I could have, I could have uh, not been able to speak at all. I was lucky, I would say, I would say God's blessings were with me that I did not falter, my legs did not shake. I could continue with my argument. I argued the next matter and the third matter also, all three I argued that day. But there could be a situation where somebody could have, you know, really sort of broken down. And that is a great opportunity that today's law students get in this moot court competition. It's one way for you to realize how good you are on your legs because I was hearing the other panel discussion a little while ago where uh, Professor Bandhupadhyay said that uh, it should be always the choice of a, of a student to decide whether he would want to go into the legal profession as a lawyer or whether he would like to uh, join a law firm. But I, I have a small, uh, small rider to that. And the rider is that every law institution should try and find out during the curriculum of how good is a person on his feet or whether he is better on his seat. Because the difference between litigation and working in a law firm is 
that in litigation you have to take every call on your feet. There is nobody to tell you when you are going wrong. If you go wrong, your client goes for a six and there is no way you can retrieve unless if there is an, if you are in Supreme Court, obviously there is nobody else. It's only God. If you are in a lower court, then at least you have a right to go and appeal. But even in appeal, if you have not argued something, the appeal court will say, well, you didn't argue it before that, then why should we interfere with the order if you didn't argue it that way? So that's a huge uh, uh, call which you have to take as a law student. And I would, I would say that a student before deciding whether he would like to get into litigation or whether he would like to get into a law firm, there are, there are a lot of people who can calmly think and come up with a beautiful opinion where they have the opportunity to look at all the research papers and see everything and come up with something very, very brilliant. Those people may not succeed as a lawyer. They may not be able to speak up. They may not be able to deliver as a, as a lawyer. Because a lawyer, I, I, would, I would rather also compare uh, litigation versus, uh, versus law firm work would be like something, you know, you want to be an entrepreneur. You become a you become a litigator because you really are you know managing everything yourselves. Your time management has to be a huge uh, uh, factor in, in your day to day life. You have to you have to manage time for your family, for your friends, for the research work, for the drafting, and for the argument. And all this has to come in sync. Your research can't go on beyond when the hearing is to take place. Your research has to be prior to the hearing. So your, your drafting research also has to take place before the matter goes into court for filing. So these timelines are so important in litigation that, uh, that, that really calls for an entrepreneur in many sense. To be able to sell yourself to a client. Ultimately, it's, it's not that you should know law and, and you should be able to deliver. You should be able to sell yourself to the client also. And my my most important and humble advice to all my all budding young lawyers is that the best way to sell your way to, to yourself to the client is to be honest. And when I say honest, I mean two things. Firstly, that when you talk to a client, you have to tell him how good or bad his case is, whether the client likes it or not, whether the client continues with you or not. You have to tell him what according to you is right for him. I have done so many cases in Supreme Court where I have told people that there is no point of spending money coming to Supreme Court and a person who has come from the High Court, he is not satisfied, he goes to some other lawyer and he says, no, no, you got a fantastic case and then he goes and gets it dismissed. Then that client remembers that that lawyer had refused his fees and told me not to litigate. So that's, that's where your value comes in. And second is that when you are, it's, the client will be very money, but if you look at his pocket and not his problem, then there is a problem. You have to look at his problem. You have to solve his problem. You have to, you have to take his problem as your own. And then, and then only, because unfortunately in India, there is no way you can advertise for yourself. Your, your growth in the profession is all word of mouth. And I can tell you, there are a lot of youngsters here, I can see probably uh, some law students also, uh, uh, I'm sure this um, is also partnered by these institutions. So this, 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 I can say with a lot, lot of uh, seriousness that in today, juniors who are coming to the legal profession, I find very few who are ready to work for getting relief for the client. They are more interested in money and that's where they go wrong. This is one profession where money follows you. I'm a first generation lawyer. Nobody in my family was a lawyer. I had no backing, no judge, no senior advocate, nothing. And I can tell you, assure you, that without any backing, without any support, I've come whatever ever I've come. Of course, God's blessing, I can never forget. But I remember when I was the additional solicitor general, I don't know whether you, some of you may be aware or may not be aware, there was a huge issue of uh, uh, when the forest advisory case was going on and, and the forest, uh, forest uh, the environment secretary then, he told me that uh, the Supreme Court is wanting to thrust its members on the committee and I don't want it, that to happen, I have my own list of people, why should the, so I said if you are ready to take a stand, I am ready to take a stand. He said yes, I am ready to take a stand. 
So it was Justice Sabarwal's bench and uh, three judge bench of Supreme Court. I said, you can't tell me whom to make as a member of the Forest Advisory Committee. It's an executive function. The government has to decide. Justice Sabarwal's reaction was that so many solicitor generals, because that was the TN Goda government matter, and it was going on for the last almost uh, uh, more than 10 years by then. So many solicitor generals and attorney generals have come and nobody has told us that we don't have the right. I said they may not have told you, but that's the law. And you have to hear me before you decide that your name should be put. And they had to ultimately agree. And the government put its own names. Because it's, the, it's an executive function. There is a concept of separation of powers. This, this case was on the headlines of every paper of the country where it was put as if the government you know, asserts its rights in Supreme Court for the first time. A judge of the Supreme Court, sitting judge of the Supreme Court told me that as an additional solicitor general, you are taking too much of panga with judges. In a, of course, in a private party. <laughs> he says, when you debit office, you don't know these judges. It's a huge trade union. They'll say that they will ensure that you lose your practice. I said, I've come here without any support of a judge. So I don't intend to continue with the support of any judge. And that is, that's what nothing, I mean, it's all, it's all it's all it's all So, there is, there is, I, I will expect, uh, uh, it has been a long day, I don't want to take uh, too much of uh, time today, but I would only say that uh, Surana and Surana, for 25, tw Surana, Surana, probably, uh, 25 years, I would say, means that probably it was almost the start of mooting in this country. There was I, hardly any mooting happening. Especially there was hardly any institutional mooting of this kind of nature where a law firm was involved in uh, organizing moot courts. Because once the law firm comes in, and especially a large law firm with uh, such a big uh, you know, establishment, uh, I'm told you about all over India now. So when a large law firm uh, takes up this assignment and uh, goes to these institutions and tries to organize moot court, I'm sure it becomes a far more uh, I would say, uh, organized uh, activity and uh, it, it brings in uh, so much of more visibility to the students when they join in these moot courts. So it's a great service that you people are doing and uh, uh, three cheers to you. We must all uh, clap for the great work that Sorana and Sorana have been doing. And uh, I would really like to uh, uh, wish all of you uh, uh, great times ahead and uh, I also wish that uh, Sorana and Sorana is able to do more and more of this kind of activity so that the children of today get a first-hand exposure of uh, how to stand on their feet and think and without their legs shaking. Thank you.